<clears throat> Good morning and welcome to the 161st meeting of vaccines and related biological products advisory committee meeting. I'm Mike Kaczynski from FDA and I will be today's me meeting facilitator. Throughout today's meeting, I'll be reminding our presenters and OPH speakers when they are close to their allotted time and assisting them when needed. This is a live virtual public meeting. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Arnold Monto, the acting chair. Dr. Monto, please turn on your camera and take it away. Thank you, Mike. I'd like to first welcome everybody to this virtual meeting, uh, which is going to discuss in general the development, authorization, and or licensure of vaccines to prevent COVID-19. Uh, this meeting is virtual, and uh, we will be following standard practices of the VRPAC advisory uh, committee. Uh, I'm very pleased to chair this meeting, and uh, it's a return for me because I just rotated off this committee last January, and uh, I'm very pleased to be able to help in providing input on this very important topic to the FDA. Uh, I'd like to turn the meeting introductions and the other uh, material, the administrative details over to uh, Dr. Atreya, who will continue. Dr. Atreya. Audio recording for this meeting has begun. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can all hear me well. Uh, my name is uh, Prabha Atreya, and it is my great pleasure to serve as the designated federal officer for today's 161st Vaccines and uh, Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting. On behalf of the FDA and Research and the committee, I would like to welcome everyone for today's virtual meeting. Before we begin with formal roll call and reading the concept of interstatement, I would like to briefly make a few administrative remarks and how housekeeping items related to today's uh, virtual meeting. For everyone using the public dark view link accessible from FTA meeting page, there is a separate link included for anyone in need of closed captioning. For members, speakers, FTA staff, anyone joining us in the Adobe room, please, um, to minimize the feedback, please keep yourself on mute unless you are speaking. Also, please turn on your video if you are presenting, commenting, or asking a question to maintain the bandwidth levels throughout the meeting. Uh, lastly, if you raise your hand and are called upon to speak by Dr. Manto, please state your first name, last name, and speak slowly and clearly so your comments are accurately recorded for transcription. Please do not log out of the meeting or disconnect your phones during the breaks. Otherwise, you will have to be re-approved to join back in. Let's begin today's meeting by taking a formal roll call for the standing committee members followed by temporary voting members. When it is your turn, please turn on your camera, then state your first name and last name, your organization, and your expertise for the benefit of the public. And when finished, please, you can turn off your camera so we can proceed to the next person. Uh, let's start the roll call. Let's see, uh, Dr. Manto, can you start, please? Right. I'm Arnold Manto. I'm professor of public health and epidemiology at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Uh, besides infectious disease epidemiology, I've worked extensively in uh, clinical trials of uh, influenza vaccines and other vaccines and antivirals. Uh, I've also had experience working in observational studies, uh, which tell us how well vaccines work when they're applied to the public. But the real reason I'm here at this meeting is because I've been working on and off for about uh, 30 years with coronaviruses, and I actually was in Beijing during the SARS outbreak. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Amanto. Dr. Um, Amanda Cohn, can you start? Introduce yourself. Yes, good morning. I'm Dr. Amanda Cohn. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of the National Center for Immunizations and Respiratory Diseases um, at the CDC in Atlanta. Um, I am a pediatrician who has uh, uh, expertise in vaccines and uh, infectious diseases, um, and I've been at CDC for about 16 years. Great. Thank you. Dr. Chatterjee, could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Achana Chatterjee. I am a pediatric infectious diseases uh, specialist like Dr. Cohn and currently serving as the dean of the Chicago Medical School as well as vice president for medical affairs at Rosalind Franklin University in Chicago. Um, my expertise is in the realm of uh, pediatric vaccines. I have been um, a clinical scientist and uh, conducted uh, over 110 clinical trials, um, about half of those in, um, in pediatric vaccines. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. Dr. Mesner, could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, let's see, who should be up? Cody should be up next? Yes, yes. Cody, go ahead and unmute yourself. I got it. There you okay. go, sir. I, I apologize uh, for the delay. Um, my name is, is Dr. Cody Meissner. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Tufts University School of Medicine. I'm also the director of the infectious, Pediatric Infectious Disease Division at uh, Tufts uh, uh, Hospital for uh, Children. I have had a longstanding interest in uh, vaccine clinical trials, in vaccine safety, and vaccine effectiveness. I have participated in the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices for the CDC, and I continue to work with the Committee on Infectious Disease for the American Academy of Pediatrics. Over. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gans, can you introduce yourself, please? Dr. Gans, we also unmute yourself. Oh. Hi, um, I'm Harry Gans, and um, I am a professor of pediatrics and pediatric infectious disease at Stanford University. I have uh, my work um, focuses on the host pathogen interface using vaccines um, to look at the immune system um, in pediatrics as well as in special populations such as our immunocompromised host. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Kurilla, would you introduce yourself, please? Good morning. Uh, Michael Carilla. I am uh, the Director of the Division of Clinical Innovation at the National Center for Advancing Translational Science within uh, the National Institutes of Health. Uh, prior to that, uh, this position, which I've had for almost three years, I was at uh, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases focused on infectious disease product development. Uh, for uh, biodefense and emerging infectious diseases. Before that, I had uh, several stints in industry and an academic career that included both uh, basic research in viral immunology and uh, clinical uh, microbiology. Uh, I'm a pathologist by training. Thank you. Dr. Paul Offit, can you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Paul Oppitt. I am a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Um, my expertise is in the area of <coughs> infectious diseases, and I'm the, uh, the co-inventor of the bovine human reassortant rotavirus vaccine, Rotatech. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oppitt. Uh, 
Thank you. Dr. Ananziato, would you introduce yourself, please? Good morning. Good morning. I'm Paula Ananziato. I lead vaccine clinical development for Merck. Merck is a, one of the few companies that has uh, discovery, development, and manufacturing in both vaccines and antivirals. And I'm here today as the non-voting industry representative. Thank you. Dr. Shel Mr. Uh, Sheldon Taubman, would you introduce yourself? Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Sheldon Taubman, and um, I am a, an attorney uh, at New Haven Legal Association in New Haven, Connecticut. I've been here for 29 years, but um, my most of my work is in the area of access to health care on behalf of uh, low-income individuals, uh, children and adults, um, and particularly in the Medicaid system. Um, I'm here today as the um, consumer representative for the state. Uh, Dr. Bergam, would you introduce yourself? Hello. Um, thanks, everyone. I'm Steve Bergam. I'm an infectious disease physician, an associate uh, professor at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and at the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington. Uh, my expertise is in infectious disease epidemiology um, with a special focus on um, the immunocompromised population. Dr. Beckham, would you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Dr. Beckham. I'm the Office Director for the Office of Infectious Diseases and HIV Policy within the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. I've been in this role about two years. Um, previous to that, I held several roles in academia, um, leading centers of infectious diseases, and also worked at the United States uh, Medical Research Institute uh, on infectious diseases as well. Um, I'm a DVM PhD by training, and I'm here today as a member. Thank you. Right. Uh, now we will introduce the temporary voting members, uh, starting with Dr. David Wentworth. Good morning. My name is Dave Wentworth, and I'm a PhD in virology. And I am currently the chief of the virology surveillance and diagnostics branch. Uh, in the influenza division at the CDC, and I'm also our WHO Collaborating Center Director. Uh, I have expertise in virology, particularly influenza and coronaviruses. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Hildreth, would you introduce yourself, please? <clears throat> Good morning. I'm uh, James Hildreth. I'm the president and CEO of Meharry Medical College. I'm also a professor of internal medicine. My expertise is in virology and immunology. For the last uh, 30 years, I've been studying HIV. Uh, my focus really is on viral pathogenesis and how the immune system deals with uh, pathogenic viruses. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Janet Lee, would you introduce yourself? Yes, good morning. My name is Jeanette Lee. I'm a professor of biostatistics at the University of Arkansas um, for Medical Sciences in Little Rock. Uh, my area of expertise is um, leading data coordinating centers for multi-center clinical trials in HIV and other infectious diseases, cancer, and pediatrics. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dr. Katherine Holmes, would you introduce yourself? Yes. I'm Katherine Holmes, Professor Emerita from the University of Colorado um, School of Medicine in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. I have spent the last 40 years before my retirement studying coronaviruses, in particular their spike glycoproteins and the receptors with which they interact. I'm interested in the post-range determinants of coronaviruses and how viruses become uh, able to jump from one host to another and cause epidemics. Great. Thank you. Dr. Luigi Notarangelo, would you introduce yourself? You are unmuted. Are unmuted. Are unmuted. Are unmuted. Are unmuted. 
Good morning. Good morning. My name is Luigi Nodrangelo. I'm the Chief of the Laboratory of Clinical Immunology and Microbiology at the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the NIH. Before that, I was Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. My expertise is in pediatrics, immunology, and genetics. I've contributed at the discovery of genetic and immunological determinants of severe COVID-19. Thank you. Dr. Nelson, Michael Nelson, so would you introduce yourself? Uh, good morning. I'm Dr. Michael Nelson, uh, recently retired from active duty service in the United States Army Medical Corps. I'm professor of medicine at the Uniformed Services University and currently a practicing physician at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. I'm also president of the American Board of Allergy and Immunology, certifying allergists and immunologists nationwide. My expertise, if you will, is I was the ground zero for the development of the bioterrorism vaccine program and continue to work with rare adverse events to vaccines within the military healthcare system. And in my specialty of allergy and immunology, we also are fundamentally interested in primary and secondary immune deficiencies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Perlman, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Dr. Stanley Perlman, Professor of Microbiology and Immunology and in Pediatric Infectious Diseases Specialist at the University of Iowa. I've worked with coronaviruses uh, for nearly uh, 40 years, working on the immune responses in uh, people and in animals and in animal models of Okay, great. Thank you. Now we will do introductions for uh, FDA staff. Dr. Gruber, Dr. Krause, and Dr. Weir, uh, Dr. Fink, if, if you would like to introduce yourself, this is the opportunity. And please feel free to turn your cameras on if you would like. Yeah, good morning. My name is Marion Gruber, and I'm the director of the Office of Vaccines Research and Review at the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. Thank you. Dr. Krause? I'm, hi, I'm Dr. Phil Krause. I'm the Deputy Director of the Office of Vaccines Research and Review at FDA CBER. Dr. Weir? Hi, I'm Jerry Ware. I'm the Director of the Division of Viral Products in the Office of Vaccines at CBER FDA. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Fink? Hi, good morning. This is Dorn Fink. I am the Deputy Director for Clinical Review in the Division of Vaccines and Related Products Applications, Office of Vaccines Research and Review, Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, FDA. Very good. Thank you. And, and thank you for all for your introductions. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Peter Marks, Director of the Center for Biologics and Evaluation and Research, and Dr. Celia Witten, uh, Deputy Director for this uh, Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. Uh, would, you, would you like to introduce yourself? OK, so maybe they will join a little later. Um, now, now I would like to introduce uh, my excellent staff, Ms. Kathleen Hayes, who is my backup DFO for this meeting. And if I, if I am unable to conduct the meeting for any reason, she will be able to do so. Ms. Christina Wett is also another DFO providing support to this meeting. The committee management specialist for this meeting is Ms. Monique Hill. And the committee management officer for this meeting is Dr. Janet Devine, who provided excellent administrative support in CY screening and preparing for this meeting today. The topic for today's meeting is to discuss in general the development, authorization, and our licensure of vaccines to prevent COVID-19. Today's meeting and the topic was announced in the Federal Register notice that was published on August 28, 2020. The FDA uh, press media representative for today's meeting is Ms. Abigail Capibianco, and the transcriptionist is Ms. Linda Giles. Now I will proceed with reading the conflict of interest statement for the public record. The Food and Drug Administration is convening virtually today on October 22nd, 2020, the 161st meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act of 1972. 
Dr. Arnold Manto is serving as the acting voting chair for this meeting. Today on October 22, 2020, the committee will meet in open session to discuss the development, authorization and or licensure of vaccines to prevent COVID-19. This topic is determined to be a particular matter involving specific parties. With the exception of the industry representative, all standing and temporary voting members of the WebWork are appointed special government employees or regular government employees from other agencies and are subjected to federal conflict of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws, including but not limited to 18 United States Code Section 208, is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. Related to the discussions at this meeting, all members, RGEs, regular government employees and special government employees, FGEs, uh, consultants of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflicts of interest of their own as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouse or minor children and for the purpose of US uh, Code 208, their employers. These interests may include investments, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts, grants, operative research and development agreements, CRADAS, teaching, speaking, writing, patents, royalties, and primary employment. These may include interests that are current or under negotiations as well. FTA has determined that all members of this advisory committee are in compliance with federal ethics and conflicts of interest laws. Under 18 U.S.C. Section 208, Congress has authorized FTA to grant waivers to special government employees and regular government employees who have financial conflicts of interest when it is determined that the agency's need for a special government employee services outweighs the potential for a conflict of interest created by the financial interests involved or when the interests of a regular government employee is not so substantial as to be determined likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Based on today's agenda and all financial interests reported by committee members and consultants, there have been two, there have been two conflicts of interest waivers granted under 18 U.S.C. 208 in connection with this meeting. We have the following consultants uh, serving as temporary voting members, Dr. James Hildreth, Dr. Michael Nelson, Dr. Catherine Holm, Dr. Stanley Perlman, Dr. Janet Lee, Dr. David Wentworth uh, from CDC, and Dr. Luigi Notarangelo from NIH. Among these consultants, Dr. James Hildreth and Dr. James Lee, Janet Lee, both special government employees have been issued waivers for their participation today. These waivers were posted on the FTA website for the public disclosure. Dr. Paula Anunziato is currently serving as the industry representative and she is employed by Merck. Industry representatives are not appointed as special government employees and serve as only non-voting members of the committee. Industry representatives act on the behalf of all regulated industry and bring general industry perspective to the committee. A non-voting industry representative may not discuss his or, employ, his or her employing company's position as such, but may discuss any matters in general terms. Industry representatives on this committee are not screened, does not participate in any closed sessions if held, and do not have voting privileges. Dr. Sheldon Tubman uh, is serving as consumer rep for this committee. Consumer representatives are appointed special government employees and are screened and cleared prior to their participation. They are voting members of the committee and hence do have the voting privileges. Today's meeting has multiple external speakers. We have four speakers from the Centers for the Disease Control and Prevention. These are Dr. Lawrence Clifford McDonald, Dr. Tom Shimabikaro, Dr. Stephanie Schrag, Dr. Captain, and Captain General Routh. 
One speaker, Dr. Hilary Marston, is from the National Institute of Health. Another speaker is Dr. Robert Johnson, is employed by the by Biomedical Advanced Development Research Authority, BADA, within IHHS. The guest speaker for this meeting is Dr. Ms. Susan Winkler, who is the Chief Executive Officer and of the Reagan Udall, Reagan Udall Foundation for the FDA. She will be supported by Ms. Christian Wilkes. Regular government Regular government employee speakers, Dr. McDonald, Marston, Dr. Johnson, Shima Bukaro, Shrag and Routh have all been screened for conflicts of interest and have been cleared to participate as speakers for today's meeting. Disclosure of conflicts of interest for guest speakers follows applicable federal laws, regulations, and FDA guidance. FDA encourages all meeting participants including open public hearing speakers to advise the committee of any of the financial relationships that they may have with any of the affected firms, its products, and if known, its direct competitors. We would like to remind standing and temporary voting members that if the discussions involve any other products or firms not already on agenda for which uh, an FTA participant has a personal or imputed conflict of interest, the participants need to inform the DFO and exclude themselves from such involvement and their exclusion will be noted for the record. This concludes my reading of the Conflicts of Interest Statement for the public record. At this time, I would like to hand over the meeting back to our chair, Dr. Manto. Dr. Manto, meeting is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prabha. And I would like in turn to uh, introduce again Dr. Marion Gruber, who is the Director of the Office of Vaccine Research and Review, who will give uh, the committee its charge. Marion. Yeah, good morning again. On behalf of my colleagues in the Office of Vaccines and in CEBA, I would like to welcome the committee members and the public to today's meeting. We look forward to a robust and productive discussion on today's topics, which include the data needed to support approval or an emergency use authorization of COVID-19 vaccines. Of note, we will not be discussing any specific COVID-19 vaccine candidates today. I want to take a minute to assure the American public that facilitating the development of safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines is the highest priority of my office, CBA, and the agency. Today's discussions will provide transparency about the data that we will request and evaluate in support of the safety and effectiveness of these vaccines. And discussing these in today's public forum is critical to build trust and confidence in the use of COVID-19 vaccines by the general public and the medical community. The development, the authorization, and licensure of vaccines against COVID-19 are critical to mitigate the current SARS-CoV-2 pandemic and to prevent future disease outbreaks. Numerous COVID-19 vaccine candidates are currently in development, and these vaccines are based on different platforms, including mRNA and DNA vaccines, subunit vaccines, inactivated vaccines, um, non-replicating and replicating viral vectors, life attenuated vaccines, and virus-like particles. Most COVID-19 candidate vaccines express the spike proteins or parts of the spike protein, that is the receptor binding domain, as their immunogenic determinant. Now, while most of these vaccines are in early stages of clinical development, some have advanced to phase three clinical trials in the US and globally to evaluate their efficacy and their safety. COVID-19 vaccines may be accelerated, uh, or I'm sorry, COVID-19 vaccine development may be accelerated based on knowledge gained from similar products that are manufactured with the same technology, and some vaccine manufacturers are using these approaches. Vaccine manufacturers are also using adaptive or seamless clinical trial designs for their vaccine studies 
which would allow for more rapid progression through the usual phases of clinical development. The FDA must ensure that the vaccines that are approved or authorized as investigational products under emergency use authorization are supported by the best available scientific and clinical evidence and that the legal requirements for safety and effectiveness are met. The Office of Vaccines is facilitating the development of COVID-19 vaccine candidates by conducting expedited reviews of the CMC information, preclinical and clinical protocols, and clinical trials data. We also provide timely advice and guidance and have frequent interactions with vaccine development developers to expedite proceeding to phase three clinical trials. And we also engage in efforts to ensure that adequate data are generated to support access to investigational COVID-19 vaccines. COVID-19 vaccines will likely be widely deployed and administered to millions of individuals, including healthy people. And the public can expect that US licensed COVID-19 vaccines are effective and safe and there is a low tolerance for vaccine-associated risks. COVID-19 vaccines that are licensed in the United States must meet applicable legal requirements. And the FDA will apply the same standards to grant a biologics license for a COVID-19 vaccine as for other preventive vaccines. The Office of Vaccines, in collaboration with our colleagues in the Office of Biostatistics and Compliance, will ensure that these standards are met by conducting a thorough review of the data and information submitted, and we will make our regulatory decisions based on these data. The review is conducted by a multidisciplinary team of clinicians, statisticians, research scientists, and other subject matter experts. And many of us have decades of experience in vaccines regulation and regulatory science. Vaccine development can be expedited. However, I want to stress that it cannot and must not be rushed, as it takes time to accrue the adequate manufacturing, safety, and effectiveness data for these vaccines to support their use in millions of healthy people. And thus, the Office of Vaccine will not reduce its scientific rigor or standards in regulatory decision-making regarding COVID-19 vaccines. A single set of regulatory requirements applies to all vaccines, regardless of the technology used to produce them. Section 351 of the Public Health Service Act states that a biologic license application shall be approved based on a demonstration that the biological product is safe and pure and potent, and the facility in which the biological product is made meets standards designed to assure that the biological product continues to be safe and pure and potent. And what that means is that only those vaccines that are demonstrated to be safe and effective and that can be manufactured in a consistent manner would be licensed by the FDA. Our regulations state further that all indications that will be listed in a product package insert must be supported by substantial evidence of effectiveness. And this evidence is derived from adequate and well-controlled clinical studies. For COVID-19 vaccines, considering the current trajectory of the pandemic and the current lack of an immune marker that would predict effectiveness, the goal of development programs at this time should be to generate data necessary to support FDA licensure by conducting clinical trials that directly evaluate the ability of the vaccine to protect humans from SARS-CoV-2 infection and or disease. I want to stress again that the overall development strategy and the data that are required to support licensure of COVID vaccines are no different than what would be required for other preventive vaccines that were licensed by the FDA or are currently in development. Each vaccine, however, may have specific issues to be addressed during development. For a COVID-19 vaccine to be approved, a manufacturing process needs to be developed 
that ensures product quality and consistency. Product-related data and testing plans that are adequate to support the manufacturing process in an appropriate facility to characterize product stability and to ensure consistency of its manufacturer are needed. We need non-clinical data to characterize the non-clinical safety and immunogenicity. And for COVID-19 vaccines, data to address the potential for vaccine-induced enhanced disease. Now, enhanced disease associated with human coronaviruses, such as MERS-CoV and SARS, has thus far only been demonstrated in animal models vaccinated with MERS and SARS vaccine candidates and then subsequently exposed to the respective wild-type viruses. It is not known whether this phenomenon occurs with SARS-CoV-2, but nevertheless, it needs to be evaluated as part of COVID-19 vaccine development. We need human clinical data that are adequate to support the proposed indication and use, which means adequate safety and efficacy data need to be accrued. And in addition, we encourage vaccine manufacturers to also characterize the clinical immune response that is induced by a vaccine. Data are needed demonstrating that the facility where the product is made is in compliance with current good manufacturing practices and a post-licensure pharmacovigilant plan is needed. The FDA developed and published in June 2020 a guidance for industry document to help facilitate the timely development of safe and effective vaccines to prevent COVID-19. This guidance reflects advice the FDA has provided over the past several months to companies and researchers and others. It describes the agency's current recommendations regarding the data that are needed to facilitate clinical development and licensure of vaccines to prevent COVID-19. And these will be presented in more detail this afternoon by my OVRR colleagues. Turning to emergency use authorization now. Based on the declaration by the Secretary of Health and Human Services of a public health emergency that involves the virus that causes COVID-19 earlier this year, FDA may issue an emergency use authorization, or EUA, after it has determined that certain statutory requirements are met. Of note, an EOA is different from product approval. Through an EOA, the FDA can authorize the emergency use of unapproved, that means investigational products, to diagnose, treat, or prevent serious or life-threatening diseases or conditions caused by threat agents such as COVID-19 when there are no adequate approved or available alternatives. In order to issue an EOA, the FDA must determine, among other things, that the product may be effective and that the known and potential benefits of the investigational product outweigh its known and potential risks. Use of an investigational COVID-19 vaccine under an EOA is not subject to informed consent requirements. However, vaccine recipients need to be provided a fact sheet, and that describes the investigational nature of the product, the known and potential benefits and risks of the product, available alternatives, and there is the option to refuse, to refuse vaccination. An EOA for a COVID-19 vaccine may allow for rapid and widespread deployment for administration of the investigational vaccine to millions of individuals, including healthy people, and therefore, issuance of an EOA for a COVID-19 vaccine will require adequate manufacturing information to ensure the quality and consistency of a product and a determination by the FDA that the vaccine's benefit outweigh its risk will be based on data from at least one well-designed phase three clinical trial that demonstrate the vaccine's safety and efficacy in a clear and compelling manner. Any assessment Doctor, regarding an EOA? We have about three minutes left. Thank you. Any assessment regarding an EOA would need to be made on a case-by-case -case basis, considering the proposed target population, the characteristics of the product, the preclinical and human clinical data on the product, as well as the totality of the available scientific evidence 
that is relevant to the product. Now, earlier this month, the guidance that the Office of Vaccines had generated, and this is entitled Emergency Use Authorization for Vaccines to Prevent COVID-19, was issued. And it reflects advice the FDA has been providing to vaccine developers, and it describes FDA's recommendations regarding the manufacturing, preclinical and clinical data that would need uh, to be submitted to support an EUA request and issuance of an EUA for COVID-19 vaccine. And these will be presented again in more detail this afternoon by my OVR, my OVR colleagues. Um, so turning for a minute to today's agenda, we hear next a presentation by the CDC on the epidemiology, virology, and clinical features of COVID-19. Then there will be two presentations by the NIH and BARDA each talking about their respective activities in the development of vaccines against COVID-19. We then will hear presentations on CDC's plans for safety and effectiveness monitoring and evaluation during EUA use and post-licensure. Uh, there will be an FDA presentation on cyber surveillance systems and another presentation by the CDC on the operational aspects of COVID-19 vaccine distribution and tracking. After lunch, there is a presentation by the Reagan Newton Foundation on COVID-19 vaccine confidence, and then my FDA colleagues will present on CMC and clinical consideration on licensure and emergency use authorization of vaccines to prevent COVID-19. Following the open public hearing, there will be the committee discussion and recommendations. Now, to guide the committee's deliberations, we have prepared the following discussion items. Of note, the committee is not asked today to vote on any issues discussed. Discussion item one, please discuss FDA's approach to safety and effectiveness data as outlined in the respective guidance documents. Two, please discuss considerations for continuation of blinded phase three clinical trials if an EOA has been issued for an investigational COVID-19 vaccine. Three, please discuss studies following licensure and or issuance of an EOA for COVID-19 vaccine to A, further evaluate safety, effectiveness, and immune markers of protection, and B, evaluate the safety and effectiveness in specific populations. And this includes, uh, concludes my introduction I'll thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Marion. Uh, you've given us a clear uh, background of what we are to examine today and what we will be discussing uh, later on in the evening. Uh, <coughs> because of the time constraints uh, and because we're going to be getting back to these issues just before uh, the public meeting. I'd like to move on and call uh, Dr. Cliff McDonald from CDC uh, to uh, give us the epidemiology, virology, and clinical features of COVID-19. Good morning. My name is Dr. Cliff McDonald from the CDC. I'm an adult infectious disease uh, trained physician and medical epidemiologist. I'm currently serving as the chief medical officer for the CDC's coronavirus response. I want to begin by thanking the program organizers for this opportunity to share our current understanding of the rapidly evolving COVID-19 pandemic. I have no financial disclosures, uh, and I would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. John Brooks, who has served as the Chief Medical Officer for the CDC response to date for his instrumental work in the preparation of these slides. I'd like to start with a brief overview um, of basic coronavirus virology, which is, of course, referring to the type of virus that causes COVID-19. Coronaviruses are, are single-stranded RNA viruses. They are on the large end of viruses, both in terms of their size and in terms of their genomes. The coronavirus genome encodes four major structural proteins, including the spike protein, shown here in gray, the um, 
The spike protein is the part of the virus that binds to cells and facilitates viral fusion with the cell and cell entry. These spike proteins form a crown-like halo that is the characteristic feature of coronaviruses. And here is the star of our show. This image is an electron micrograph of an actual coronavirus, albeit not SARS-CoV-2. But this stand-in is a good example that nicely shows off the characteristic crown-like halo. Coronaviruses are nidovirals and infect a wide variety of mammals and birds. The term nido comes from the Latin word nidus for nest and refers to the hallmark of nidovirus transcription seen also in all coronaviruses, namely the synthesis of a three-prime coterminal nested set of mRNAs. Coronaviruses are divided into four genera, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. The alpha and beta coronaviruses in mostly mammals and include the coronaviruses that cause human disease, which I'll cover in the next slide. They have been isolated from uh, many uh, land mammals as well as those that fly, like bats, and those that swim, like beluga whales. The gammas and deltas infect mostly birds and have been isolated from birds across the entire uh, size spectrum from sparrow to ostrich. Coronaviruses can cause a variety of lethal disease in mammals and birds and have been well studied due to their impact on the agricultural sector where, the where they cause fatal disease in the form of respiratory and enteric disease. Of the seven coronaviruses known to cause human disease, or HCOVs for short, four generally cause mild disease, mostly upper respiratory illness, such as the common cold. However, three of these pathogens, all beta coronaviruses, can cause lethal human disease. These include SARS-CoV-1, the cause of the 2003 SARS outbreak, MERS-CoV, first recognized in 2012, and that continues to cause sporadic clusters of Middle East respiratory syndrome, and now SARS-CoV-2. So that we're all on the same page, I want to make sure everyone understands we use the term COVID-19 to describe the illness caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And it is and it is named SARS-CoV-2 because it is genetically more like SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV. <clears throat> Let me share with you what we know about transmission of COVID-19. As the initial outbreak in China resolved, COVID-19 was spreading rapidly worldwide. COVID-19 has now been reported basically everywhere except for a few island nations in the Antarctica. Worldwide, new diagnoses are now rising after a period of relative stability, with the largest expansion right now occurring in Southeast Asia, shown here in purple. Note that as of Tuesday, October 13th, the total number of infections worldwide is rapidly approaching 38 million, and the daily number of new infections between 300,000 and 400,000, which is three times the 115,000 diagnoses made during the entire first six weeks of the pandemic when it was mostly limited to China. That now appears as a very modest appearing pink blip at the far bottom left of the figure. Despite the expansion in Southeast Asia, and re recurrent expansion in Europe, shown in light green, the US still accounts for the largest fraction of cumulative number of cases at 22% and of deaths at 21%, followed by India that has accounted for 17% of the world's total cases, and then Brazil at 15% and Russia at 4%. Looking now specifically at the United States, new cases are rising again since around Labor Day after a period of decline from midsummer from a midsummer peak. Deaths are presently stable, but given the rise in new cases and the time from diagnosis to death to then officially reporting that death, we have been watching closely for any signs of an increase. In fact, since this slide was prepared, we have seen a 3% increase in deaths over the past seven days compared to the previous seven days. Presently, we are seeing 50 to 60,000 new cases a day and about 700 deaths. Far too many Americans are still being infected with and dying from this preventable infectious infection. We have plenty of work ahead, and we cannot let our guard down. 
despite the close genetic relatedness of SARS-CoV-2 -CoV to its cousins SARS-CoV-1 um, -CoV and MERS-CoV, this new virus uh, differs from both of its relatives in two important ways. First, although the incubation periods are all about the same, persons with COVID-19 from SARS-CoV-2 infection can be infectious to others and transmit the virus before they develop symptoms. We now know that infectiousness peaks um, uh, around the, excuse me, infectiousness peaks in the few days before and then during symptom onset. Second, a substantial fraction of infected persons, estimated at perhaps 15 to 45 uh, percent, never develop symptoms and remain asymptomatic. We know that these persons can also transmit the infection, although how infectious, how infectious they may be to others is still being worked out. This table shows what we presently know about which body fluids carry and may transmit SARS-CoV-2, showing whether viral RNA has been detected, whether actual virus has been isolated in culture, and whether the body fluid has been epidemiologically documented as mode of transmission. It is very clear that SARS-CoV-2 causes a respiratory illness transmitted through exposure to respiratory particles. Although viral RNA can be readily detected in stool, efforts to isolate virus from stool by culture have been remarkably unsuggestful with uh, only a handful of reports suggesting possible isolation of live virus amid many reports of failed attempts. Moreover, if stool is a mode of transmission, it, it has yet to be epidemiologically confirmed. In blood, viral RNA can be detected, but reassuringly, it does not appear to con uh, contain virus that can be cultured, and uh, no infections have been documented through blood product transfusion. Curiously, detection of RNA has been confirmed in semen, but only in men during the peak of illness. After recovery, RNA appears no longer present, and uh, neither isolation of live virus uh, nor sexual transmission of SARS-CoV-2 has been reported. And lastly, neither viral particles nor virus have been found in urine. Depicted on this slide are results of an ongoing large-scale uh, serial surveillance activity in partnership with commercial laboratories in which the aim is to uh, perform serology on 1,000 specimens from each state on waste serum specimens from persons who had blood drawn for other reasons. These data are available on CDC's COVID uh, tra data tracker and are the most recent available results as of August. 2020, New York, New Jersey, and Louisiana are the only states with over 10% of their population with antibody levels indicating a past infection. The darker shades of pink or purple here indicate higher prevalence of past infection. Uh, I will caveat these findings with the fact that in some patients with past infection, there may be a decay in antibody levels, uh, and some do not uh, develop an antibody response. That decay, however, it's unclear how such how much uh, that might cause uh, a reversion to negativity. Uh, I will also further caveat the seroprevalence findings with the fact that the role of serology is still evolving. The utility of serologic testing to establish the absence, or say the clinical utility of serologic testing to establish the absence or presence of infection. Um, or reinfection, as well as immunity, remains undefined. Although, as suggested by the previous slide, this doesn't prevent it from being an important component of public health surveillance. Data that will inform serologic testing guidance, uh, the serologic testing guidance area, is rapidly evolving. Um, serologic or, or other correlates of immunity have not yet been established, and serologic testing should not be used clinically to establish presence or absence of infection, as I mentioned, or reinfection or immunity. I'd like to move on now to describe um, how we respond clinically um, uh, to infection with SARS-CoV-2, and I want to do this by emphasizing four main points. First, viral burden declines rapidly, uh, steadily, excuse me, after illness onset, as shown in these two figures with the y-axis showing viral load and the x-axis showing uh, time since illness onset. The amount of viral RNA measured in clinical samples is greatest at the onset of illness and then declines steadily as time passes. Second, as shown in the upper uh, figure, as viral load is declining after illness onset, the, the ability to recover 
live virus from human samples by culture becomes less likely. After eight to 10 days, uh, we can no longer recover replication competent virus, or that is virus from culture from respiratory tract specimens um, in otherwise healthy persons with mild to moderate illness. A recent study suggests that severely ill persons who often might spend weeks in the hospital can shed live virus up to 20 days. Third, within days after illness, patients begin to develop a serologic or antibody response to infection that includes uh, <clears throat> excuse me, IgM, IgG, and IgA. And the IgG response includes neutralizing antibodies that can block viral infection in cells and laboratory assays. Although our immune systems are clearly responding to and controlling the infection, we don't know at this time how well this immune response protects us from reinfection and if it does for how long. Not all persons develop antibodies after infection, as I mentioned earlier. And early, uh, early data does suggest some decay uh, in or decline in these antibodies as early as eight weeks uh, after infection. The good news is now approaching nine months following major spread outside China, we have relatively few instances of documented reinfection. The bad news, of course, is that there have now been a handful and growing number of well-documented reinfections, with the first of these in a person initially infected in Hong Kong who recovered and who then became asymptomatically infected after returning from a trip to Spain. However, the frequency um, and um, excuse me, the, however, the frequency of these reinfections is still uncertain, and, and overall they appear quite infrequent when we consider um, the large number of infections. Reinfections should not be surprising given experience with the other endemic human coronaviruses. Uh, fourth and lastly, it has now been widely observed that viral RNA can be de de detected by PCR for weeks, long after persons have been fully recovered from illness, and uh, after evidence would indicate they're no longer infectious. Uh, shown here is an illustrative decay curve from a paper by Xiao et al. that illustrates the classic reverse sigma slope uh, seen with this phenomenon. To date, the longest persistent positive has been uh, documented 12 weeks. Um, and as uh, I um, mentioned earlier, uh, reinfections, when they do occur um, and have been documented, they most um, likely appear to occur after um, three months or 90 days. And during this 90-day interval, we are no longer recommending uh, PCR testing. Uh, mindful of time. I'll keep moving on. The clinical epidemiology, um, we'll just highlight a few uh, facts of this. Uh, first and foremost, uh, just mentioned here, the relative frequency of major uh, signs and symptoms observed. Um, these are from early reports in China. More than 80% of patients develop fever during illness. Over half develop cough, about 25% myalgia or arthralgia, um, and a small fraction headache. Um, I'll um, um, just mention also the loss of uh, smell and taste, which um, is probably one of the most distinguishing factors, although it can also be seen uh, with other respiratory illnesses. Um, given our time, I'll just mention the mortality, uh, case fatality rate uh, here as seen. It goes up sharply in older age groups, um, uh, but um, um, understand that uh, this is seen with other uh, respiratory illnesses. Still, um, the case fatality rate is about 10 to 15 times that of influenza. Um, and uh, because of the time, uh, I'll just jump to uh, mention that uh, uh, NIH has published severity of illness categories, uh, which are important because they are linked to some treatments. Um, and uh, mention some of these underlying illnesses that uh, do markedly increase uh, morbidity and mortality along with age, as shown on the previous slides. I want to also mention that the distribution of uh, underlying illnesses that increase the case fatality rate are not evenly distributed across the United States. And finally, just mention, as you know, unfortunately, there have been longstanding health care inequities and much of this is manifest through uh, 
uh, different rates of uh, underlying chronic illnesses, but also then increase the case fatality rate in different ethnic groups. So um, with that, I'll end. Thank you. All right. Uh, Dr. Monto, are you there? So make sure your audio is still connected. Um, I think your audio may not be connected at the moment, Dr. Monto. Uh, with that being said, since we uh, we did run out of time on that one, um, Kathleen, or Prabhu, would you like me to uh, move on to the next presenter while we are waiting for Dr. Monto to connect his audio? From NIH? Yep, so the next person would be, next up is Hillary Marston. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to speak to you today about the role that the NIH plays in COVID-19 vaccine development. So my name is Hillary Marston. I'm a medical officer and uh, a policy advisor for pandemic preparedness in the office of the director at NIAID. So uh, next slide. I don't think I have control here. Yep, bottom of the screen. There you go. Uh, thanks so much. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'd like to speak today about three uh, different aspects of our work in COVID-19 vaccine development. So first, uh, moving from preparedness to response, our activities in basic and translational research. Second, our work in phase three trials and our efforts to create harmonized clinical trials. And third, within those trials, our key priorities and some future directions. So first, uh, basic research moving from pan pandemic preparedness to response. So when cases of this new pneumonia syndrome first came to light in the beginning of January 2020, and when researchers shared the genetic sequence of this new virus on international databases on January 10th, and it was reported one day later, we had researchers who were ready to jump into vaccine development uh, and they had a specific approach that they wanted to take to vaccine development. And the reason why they were so primed to do this work is because the NIH had made a long-term investment in pandemic preparedness response research and preparedness research, basic and translational. So specifically, these researchers had worked on this family of beta coronaviruses. We knew from both SARS and MERS that this family had the potential to cause epidemics, and we knew that they could, uh, in some cases, be spread by a respiratory route, uh, which is obviously one of the key features of, uh, of a pathogen that would cause a potential pandemic. So we wanted to focus on this group along with other pathogens that we work on quite closely. Uh, in this paper in PNAS, we describe a specific uh, body of work that we have on this uh, group of viruses, whereby we have a specific solution to creating vaccines for them. So we take the protein that's on the outside of the virus, we stabilize it in the genetic sequence by making two specific mutations, and use that as the, as the vaccine antigen. Animal studies on MERS showed that this approach made the protein far more immunogenic in mice, uh, and we were able to show that the same two mutations, if carried into other related viruses, could create the same stable immunogenic antigen. So as soon as the sequence was shared on international databases, our researcher, researchers were able to look at that sequence uh, and the researchers are listed here, Kizmikia Corbett and Barney Graham at our Vaccine Research Center, along with some colleagues. Uh, they were able to make those changes that they wanted to make to make that stabilized antigen, share it with our industry partners at Moderna. We had a pre-existing uh, research collaboration with them. And the Moderna researchers were able to put it into their rapid manufacturing platform. And 65 days later, we were able to start a phase one trial. Uh, but critically, that was enabled by the long-term investments in basic preparedness research. I should also say that that early manufacturing was supported by the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, who has been an excellent partner in this work. 
so we were not the only ones who uh, jumped into action in developing vaccines. And in fact, there are now six vaccine candidates supported by the U.S. government in advanced clinical development. My colleague from BARDA is going to tell you more about these candidates, so I'll just go over them briefly. So there are two in the mRNA ca category. These are the Moderna and the BioNTech Pfizer candidate. The advantage of the mRNA platform is that it offers very rapid manufacturing, which uh, facilitates a, a quick move into the clinic, and they're highly immunogenic. There are two adenovirus vectored candidates from AstraZeneca and Janssen. Again, these are quite quick to get into the clinic. And the platform itself, uh, in the case of Janssen, is used in a vaccine that's approved in Europe, their Ebola virus vaccine. Uh, and then we have adjuvanted recombinant protein vaccines. So they're not as fast to manufacture, but they are very scalable, tend to be quite stable. And there are several approved vaccines that use this approach. So those are Novavax and Sanofi in partnership with GSK. And uh, so I mentioned that we were able to launch into a phase one trial in March 2020, and other candidates moved in quite quickly as well. Uh, those, uh, so all of these candidates are now in phase one and some in phase two trials, and some indeed in phase three. Uh, the phase one and two trials have overall shown that the vaccines are quite safe, immunogenic, and well tolerated. Uh, also that they have good binding antibody titers and viral neutralization titers that are comparable to those seen in human convalescent sera. So with those uh, data and uh, with that human experience, we were confident that we were ready to move into larger scale trials. But we wanted to make sure that we had harmonized those clinical trials. So we wanted them to be individual trials so that we could move as quickly as possible, but we also wanted to make sure that uh, they were harmonized so we would be able to compare across the trials. So we laid out a specific strategy for these trials in this commentary that was published in May 2020 uh, by leaders at the NIH along with a leader of one of our large clinical trials networks, the HIV Vaccine Trials Network. And the key characteristics, characteristics of the harmonization are shown in this figure from the paper. So again, these are going to be individual trials uh, as depicted at the top of the slide, but critically, they're going to be harmonized with respect to endpoints, with respect to statistical analysis plans, for example. They will all use collaborating clinical trials networks, which I'll describe in just a moment. They'll all use collaborating labs. So for the key immunogenicity assays, these are going to be run by NIH and NIH-supported labs. So uh, those will be the serologies that distinguish SARS-CoV-2 infection from vaccination, uh, the neutralization assays, and the T cell response assays. And this is important. They share an independent data and safety monitoring board. So one data and safety monitoring board, which is comprised of longstanding vaccine experts, and they are uh, able to look at the data in an unblinded fashion. Their job is to uh, oversee the scientific integrity of the trial and to safeguard volunteers. And importantly, because they can look across the trials, they can look out for anything that seems out of line, um, anything that seems uh, unusual with respect to the cases that are seen. And then there's also a between-trial statistical group that's looking at correlates of protection. So the, government, so the, uh, the clinical trials network that I mentioned, this is actually comprised of multiple clinical trials networks, uh, which are from the NIH and the Department of Defense. Uh, collectively, the investigators in these networks have decades of experience in uh, clinical trials um, and large-scale cl clinical trials for infectious diseases. So they came together recognizing the urgency of this public health emergency and created a new entity called the COVID-19 Prevention Network. A little bit about the governance of these trials. So again, the vaccine companies are, are the IND sponsors, and each trial has clinical trial sites that are provided by both contract research organizations contracted to the company and the COVID Prevention Network, that clinical trial network that I just mentioned. Each of the companies, uh, e each of the trials reports into this independent data and safety monitoring board, which offers its recommendations to an oversight group. And the oversight group is comprised of representatives from NIH, BARDA, and chaired by the company sponsor. Just a little bit more detail on the NIH role there. 
So again, the company is the regulatory sponsor under 20, 21 CFR 312. Uh, the phase three trials, the protocols, were designed in collaboration with Operation Warp Speed, uh, with the NIH and specifically the active partnership under the NIH, that public-private partnership, uh, the COVPN, and they all conform to FDA guidance. The trials are overseen by that data and safety monitoring board for which NIH serves as the secretariat. And the NIH, along with the active partnership, uh, formed, uh, offered the names uh, for that GSMB. The NIH-supported investigators at the COPN offer both trial sites and network investigators or co-PIs on the trial. And uh, NIH sits on that oversight group. So we're at each level of the, of the trial structure. A bit on the trials themselves. So these are all randomized placebo-controlled efficacy trials with either a one-to-one -one or two-to-one vaccine to placebo match. The sample size varies somewhat, but they are anywhere from 30 to 60,000 volunteers. The primary efficacy endpoint has a point estimate requirement of greater than 60 percent, and the lower bound of the confidence interval must be greater than 30 percent. The population, so these are individuals over 18 years of age, and we're specifically enriching for people who are at risk of severe disease. So whether those are individuals who are elderly or uh, have comorbidities or, for, or from underserved minorities. One notable exception to this is the Pfizer trial, which is run independently. Uh, they are now enrolling down to age 12. The primary endpoint of the trials is prevention of symptomatic COVID-19 disease, which is PCR confirmed. Um, importantly, all identified cases are assessed for severity and followed to resolution of the case. So while it might start off mild, we will document how severe that the cases get. And all uh, clinical case data are, are submitted in an unblinded fa fashion to both the DSMB and to the shared biostatistical group. Some specifics on the safety follow-up in the trial. So the primary safety objective is to evaluate safety and reactogenicity of the vaccines. For seven days, we're looking at solicited local and systemic adverse reactions. 28 days, are, we're looking at unsolicited adverse events. And then at any time in the two-year follow-up for medically attended adverse events, adverse events of special interest as outlined in the protocol, and severe adverse events at any time. So all adverse events are, are reviewed by a dedicated safety team and they're reviewed in an unblinded fashion by the DSMB. For severe AEs, there's a more thorough review that's specifically conducted by the DSMB. And the DSMB is going to be looking at all times uh, for imbalances in severe COVID cases between study arms. So now some key priorities for these trials. And I'd like to speak about three specific areas. Uh, so the first being safeguarding volunteers. Second, enrolling individuals who reflect the pandemic, uh, and particularly individuals who are at risk of severe COVID. And the third is generating and maintaining trust with the public. So first, safeguarding volunteers. So we are developing vaccines in a public health emergency. We recognize the urgency of it. Um, we, as uh, overall in Operation Warp Speed, are willing to take financial risks uh, particularly with respect to manufacturing and investing in manufacturing earlier than one might otherwise. But the scientific integrity of the trials and the volunteer safety are not compromised. So I wanted to specifically address some of the safety pauses and holds in the trials. So adverse events are expected to occur in these trials in both the vaccine and placebo groups. Uh, these are monitored and graded by, for severity using standard procedures. And these are regularly reviewed by study clinicians and monitors and protocol safety teams to ensure proper interpretation and reporting is needed. So in other words, we are finding these events because we are specifically looking for them. And we are looking for them according to tried and true processes. In addition, there are multiple layers of safety oversight, including the company's own pharmacovigilance. This should say the NIH-led protocol safety review team. Uh, the DSMB and the FDA. These are all in place to protect study volunteers. It's something we take very seriously. And I would say that the recent regulatory hold for AstraZeneca and the clinical pause for Janssen are signs that the system is working as expected. We're finding these cases. We are working them up thoroughly and working in close partnership with the regulators over at FDA. 
Next, enrolling those at highest risk of infection and severe disease. So it is critical that at the end of these trials, we have reliable, interpretable data on the safety and efficacy of these vaccines in those who are hardest hit by the pandemic. So who is that? We know, as described by the prior speaker, that those individuals who are in older age groups are at risk for severe disease and those individuals who have specific comorbidities. In addition, we know that individuals from underserved minorities are hit harder by this pandemic, both in terms of infection and in terms of severe disease and indeed death. So we know that we need specific information in these groups. Our trials have parameters that are explicit um, on enrollment of volunteers with these individual risk factors. So for example, whether it's individuals over age 65, people with comorbidities, or people of specific underserved minorities. And in order to do the, do the latter, we've been working hard on proactive community engagement activities. Um, and this really has been a top priority for NIH leadership at the highest levels. These measures are critical to the success of the trials themselves but they're also going to allow assessment of safety and efficacy in the populations that are at highest risk. And we know that's going to be essential for future acceptability of these vaccines. Some specifics on our activities in these areas. So first, the Communi Community Engagement Alliance team. This is an NIH entity that's drawing on longstanding uh, relationships that we have at our clinical trial networks on, at the local level. And then the COVID Prevention Network has a specific working group, which is building on its HIV trial experience. And that group is led by health equity experts. And they've been very proactive in this area, um, and activities have been pretty widespread. So specifically, they have stood up a series of expert panels with scientists from and working with priority populations. They have also stood up community working groups with research familiarity. And there are any number of stakeholder outreach events with national organizations, um, local town halls, a specific faith-based organization, outreach strategy, and grassroots organization. So there's more work to be done there. There always is, uh, and we're committed to doing it. Generating and ma maintaining trust, uh, this is the third priority, uh, both in the trials themselves and in the products if they prove successful in the trials. And we know this is critical because the vaccines will only be effective if that uptake is widespread. You can have a fantastic vaccine, and if no one takes it, it's not going to do much to end this pandemic. And there is a good deal of work to be done in this area. We know that a good portion of the US public is, uh, is skeptical of these vaccines um, and uh, not jumping to take them once approved, at least at present. So what are we doing about it? Uh, so first, maintaining safeguards for volunteers and for the study conduct. Um, we are taking that very seriously, as, as discussed earlier in the presentation. We're engaging directly with stakeholders from underserved minorities and that are hardest hit by the pandemic. And we're communicating the roles that entities like the NIH, like the VRPAC, like regulatory bodies, play in the careful evaluation and potential authorization of vaccines. And importantly, we're committing to transparency. So the companies have made some real strides in this area, posting their final protocols, sharing enrollment data on an ongoing basis, including enrollment by race ethnicity. And uh, the prompt sharing of results will also be a priority for us, prompt sharing of full results. And just uh, to wrap up, um, we, if anyone is interested in participating in any of these trials, this website, preventcovid.org, will allow you to express your interest. You'll take a quick survey um, about your potential risk of infection. Uh, it's not committing you to the trial, but it's uh, a way to raise your hand and say that you might be interested in volunteering. So thank you so much for the opportunity. All right, Arnold. Uh, we have about uh, just about two minutes. Are you there, Arnold? I am here. Uh, thank you so much for a very clear presentation. I think you've set the uh, 
the background for us uh, for our later discussion this afternoon. I have only one question, uh, and I'm just going to restrict myself to this one, our, our group to this one question. I noticed uh, you are using a point estimate of, of efficacy of 60%. The guidance says 50%. Could you explain that? So we hewed pretty closely to the guidance in uh, in most cases. Um, we set a slightly higher bar uh, than the guidance even had um, because uh, of the urgency of the situation and because uh, we wanted to make sure uh, that this would have as great an impact as possible on the outbreak. Thanks. Thank you, uh, and thanks for such a clear presentation again. I'd like to move on to uh, introduce Dr. Robert Johnson. He is Director of Influenza and Emerging Infectious Disease Divisions, uh, Division at uh, the Biomedical Advanced Development Research Authority, better known as BARDA. Dr. Johnson. Great. Great. Good morning. As I was preparing for this presentation, I was struck by just how far we've come in development of vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics in such a short period of time. It is really remarkable that less than 10 months after identification of a new emerging infectious disease, we are at this meeting today being held on the general topic of advanced vaccine development and looking at potential pathways to authorization or licensure. As mentioned, my name is Robert Johnson. I'm the Director of the Influenza and Emerging Infectious Disease Division within BARDA, within the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response in HHS. I also serve as the Vaccine Product Coordination Team Lead for Operation Warp Speed, or OWS, which, I'm, as I am sure you all know, is the Department of Health and Human Services and Department of Defense's <clears throat> excuse me, joint effort to address the COVID-19 public health threat. Today, we'll provide you with a brief overview of the BARDA OWS vaccine portfolio, specifically how the portfolio was built, what does it look like today, and where are we going. But I first want to set the stage by providing the background on strategies and tools that have been developed over the last decade that laid the framework for us to respond as rapidly as we have. Apologies, figuring out the slides. There we go. So as I mentioned, BARDA sits within the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. ASPR's mission is focused with a wide-ranging impact, save lives and protect Americans from 21st century health security threats. This includes current activities, such as providing support to those impacted by recent hurricanes, as well as numerous activities related to the COVID-19 pandemic response. As part of this mission, BARDA supports development of medical countermeasures to detect, treat, and prevent a variety of threats, including pandemic influenza and emerging infectious diseases. This capability is built on core principles, which combine support a rapid response to emerging threats. So the BARD Pandemic Vaccine Preparedness and Response Strategy is really based on three ideas. The first is acceleration of development. How do we do that? One is looking at use of platform technologies which have previous experience. Related to that is doing activities in parallel. So it's not enough to simply have something that moves fast. We all know the standard development uh, pathway. The, the goal is how can we do things in parallel so that we can accelerate that process. Second is around manufacturing. Similar to what Hillary Marston mentioned earlier about a vaccine is only as good as it is people willing to uptake it. A vaccine is only as good also as it is the ability to produce it in sufficient numbers to get out and have an impact. So when we think about domestic manufacturing, really three things come into play. The first is, of course, you have to have the facilities in which to make the vaccine. The second is you need the raw materials and supplies to make the vaccine. And finally, you have to have a vaccine and a platform that's amenable to scaling up and scaling out so you can make a lot of product in a short amount of a short period of time. And finally, risk mitigation. And what do we really mean by that? We really mean redundancy. We don't want to be putting all of our focus on just one technology or one approach or one manufacturing facility. We want to have multiples of each of these so that if one does drop out, we have other candidates that are ready to come into place and move on to the next step. So great to have a strategy, um, but what are we really trying to accomplish with this strategy? So what you have here on this slide is a standard product development timeline where we look at things being done in, parallel, in, in uh, sequence, uh, typically one candidate at a time, and you have large-scale manufacturing coming on fairly late 
in the process. And what we're really trying to do with the approach that I just described is by relying on platform technologies, multiple candidates, <clears throat> excuse me, multiple candidates and parallel the advanced manufacturing, we're hoping to shrink the timeline such that we can accelerate the time to vaccine being ready and at the same time have vaccine ready to be shipped out. All right. So everyone is aware that the COVID-19 outbreak is the third outbreak of a novel coronavirus since 2003. And while there are no licensed therapeutics or vaccines against these novel coronaviruses, as Hillary so eloquently outlined, several studies were conducted with these earlier outbreaks that gave important information from which to build from. And most importantly, from the clinical and non-clinical studies done with SARS and MERS, we knew that the coronavirus spike protein was immunogenic in clinical trials and could protect in non-clinical studies. This information played a critical role in our ability to move forward quickly with vaccine development. Right. So specifically provided BARDA the key information to begin development of COVID-19 spike-based protein vaccines using platform technologies, including several that BARDA had previously supported with other infectious diseases. So Hillary talked about um, the Moderna mRNA-based vaccine. Um, a lot of, some of that earlier technology was done in collaboration with BARDA in the context of the Zika vaccine. And so being able to lean up, um, to follow on with NIH's effort on that mRNA vaccine platform for COVID-19 and further support advanced development of that product. Similarly, bringing into play the, um, the R&D development of the R&D of the Janssen Ad26 vaccine, as well as the Sanofi GSK influenza vaccine platforms. So as work to develop vaccines and therapeutics against COVID-19 grew across multiple agencies and the scope of the effort really came into focus, it became readily apparent that a new structure was needed so these efforts could be accelerated by providing the necessary framework and capabilities to meet the goals of rapid MCM development. Further, we really needed a true end-to-end -end approach, unifying, things, unifying efforts across departments as well as across government to allow seamless transition for every step of the process, from development to vaccine administration. So this resulted in formation of uh, the Operation Warp Speed effort, which I referred to earlier. So what exactly is uh, Operation Warp Speed? Again, I, I provided a quick summary, but I wanted to touch briefly on how does this Operation Warp Speed really enhance the strategy I discussed earlier. And as I mentioned, it talks about the end-to-end -end solution, but it's really more than that. It adds resources and value to every step of the process. So we have cross-departmental strategic guidance, oversight, and teamwork. This allows resources from multiple departments across the government to come together to be working on one task in parallel and together. It greatly enhances the logistical operational capabilities. As I'll discuss a little bit later, we've heard um, already about the um, scope and the size of the clinical trials and the number of candidates that are being worked on. One of the things we haven't talked as much about is the manufacturing requirements to be producing six vaccine candidates at such a large scale. So the logistical capabilities and requirements of setting up that supply chain is tremendous and requires great cooperation. Finally, it brings in the, it incorporates the expertise of DOD and DHHS to support the large rapidly enrolling clinical trials that Hillary talked about earlier. Excuse me. So, what exactly, there we go. And finally, it puts all of this effort under one roof. So I, I spent these last couple of minutes talking about the underlying strategy that formed the basis for product selection for the vaccine portfolio. And I've talked a little bit about the initial investments that were made in the vaccine candidates. So I want to now spend just a couple of minutes talking about where are we now? and then f conclude with talking about where are we going. So since May, <clears throat> under the Operation Warp Speed effort, we've been able to do several activities that have greatly enhanced the portfolio. So those include adding candidates, such as the Pfizer mRNA candidate, as well as the Novavax recombinant protein-based candidate. Equally important, it allowed us to fully support large-scale uh, manufacturing of these vaccines. And this is key in that it allows those vaccines, if they are proven to be successful, to be, to be rolled out at a much rap, more rapid pace than would normally occur if we were to follow the traditional product development timeline. <clears throat> so 
So what are the, the um, products in the current portfolio? Again, Hillary, I think, did a nice job providing an overview, and I don't want to repeat what, what she said. Six candidates, a couple of things that I will touch on in regards to the initial strategy that was outlined. One thing is that the idea about having, from a risk mitigation perspective, having multiple candidates on the same platform. So you'll see two candidates based on the mRNA platform, two based on the adenovirus platform, and two based on the recombinant protein platform. Another important point that I would like to call your attention to is that these candidates, while they've been moving forward rapidly, have also hit every each one of the steps that you would expect to see in typical product development pathway. All of them have, are, have completed or have ongoing non-clinical studies looking at safety and eff effectiveness. They also have, before they went into the phase three clinical trials, they've also conducted phase one and two clinical safety and immunogenicity studies not just in, your, in the younger population, but also specifically in that older population that will most likely benefit from a successful vaccine. And finally, as, as mentioned before, four of the six um, candidates are currently in the large phase three clinical trial. Hillary did a really nice job of providing an overview about the, um, how we conduct the phase three clinical trials of the vaccine candidates in the OWS BARDA portfolio. Um, so I'm not going to repeat that. I put this slide up here as, um, for reference. Um, so, uh, but I will just quickly point out and reinforce this idea that while each uh, protocol is um, the company is the, the pr product developer is the sponsor for that, we do have um, there is an effort that allows this harmonization that is so important in terms of safety and effectiveness oversight. So I want to, before I conclude, I want to touch briefly on where we sit in terms of manufacturing. So as I mentioned before, um, the capabilities, requirements, raw materials, facilities needed to manufacture six um, candidates at such a large scale is, tr is tremendous. You know, we think about the, um, for example, something as simple as the supply chain, which for a normal product development pathway would take five to six years to really put in place and validate, and we're looking to do that in the course of just a few months with six different candid candidates. And this goes back to what I discuss discussed earlier, one of the advantages of the Operation Warp Speed effort is that ability to align and get resources across the government focused on one effort. And that effort is not just um, focused on the vaccine manufacturers themselves, but also making sure we have all of the supplies, equipment, and raw materials that are necessary to produce, um, to produce these vaccines. So finally, I want to conclude, I thought Hillary's comments around the importance of um, uptake and confidence were, were really important, and they really hit on a key fact. And that's when we think from the Operation Warp Speed as well as from the BARDA perspective, what are we looking to, to accomplish? So it really is hitting every one of those steps in the, in the product development life cycle, the manufacturing life cycle, as well as the, the distribution and administration perspective because really the requirement is an end-to-end -end solution. We need to be able to do everything from the earliest stages of product development all the way to administration. So with that, I will thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, Arnold, are you there? I am here. All right. Uh, we have a few minutes uh, for questions. I've stifled uh, questions from the committee. If anybody is, wants to ask a very short question, uh, please raise their hands. So we have the first one from Michael Carella. Michael? Thank you, uh, Robert. Very, very nice overview. I was, I was struck by the fact that the majority of candidates currently being supported are two-dose vaccines. Was that just how there were many other factors that played into selection and you didn't have, or was there very few choices in terms of potential candidates that would be a single dose? It would seem that for a particularly a pandemic and an outbreak response that a single dose would be highly desirable. Yeah, no, thanks for that question, Mike, and that's a, that's a, that's a great point. So uh, before I answer that, I just, uh, you know, 
little bit of background. You know, from the from the BARDA and, and OWS perspective, you know, the portfolio is is not set, right? So we're always um, looking for candidates that will um, that, that to potentially incorporate into the portfolio. And certainly, a candidate with a with a single dose would be would be of great interest for the reasons that you mentioned. You know, I can say that when we were doing, you know, the the initial um, evaluation, um, you know. There wasn't one that really came across as being a, a, a single dose that we thought met all of those other criteria that were so important. Next, uh, we have a question from Dr. Notarangelo. Please unmute. Good morning, Dr. Johnson. That was very clear. I have only one question. Can you tell us more about how many uh, manufacturing facilities are involved for each company? Is it only one or more than one? And what is BARDA's position in regard to um, what is mentioned in the guidelines, October 2020 guidelines, that do not require inspection of the facility, manufacturing facilities in order to provide an emergency authorization, if, if appropriate? Thank you. All right. So, um, all right. So, so great question. So we are, you know, as I, as I mentioned, um, Earlier in the talk, risk mitigation um, is, is, is key for us, so we're always looking to have, you know, more than one facility capable of doing manufacturing. Of course, manufacturing isn't just one step, just doesn't occur at one facility It's when we think end-to-end, -end, but we are always trying to do everything that we can from a risk mitigation perspective to make sure that we have um, um, multiple facilities. Um, to get to your second one, you know, I'll, de I'll defer to, to FDA to respond. I won't, won't speak for them in terms of their guidance document. I can say from from our perspective and our interactions with our product developing partners, you know, quality is, is always paramount. And so this is something we are focused on heavily and spend a lot of time and effort on, you know, regardless of, of um, you know, when um, the regulatory authorities may come for an audit. Uh, let's park that question until this afternoon. I want to call on a couple of more members, Dr. Chatterjee. Yes, um, thank you. And I, I think this question may uh, be more for Dr. Marston, but uh, perhaps you could um, take a stab at it, Dr. Jensen. Um, really, it's a two-part question with regard to the population that is being included in the trials right now. There have been media reports of um, inadequate numbers of patients uh, from minority populations who are uh, disproportionately affected by um, the pandemic. Um, I'm also curious about um, future trials uh, involving um, children, um, pregnant women, etc. Uh, my understanding is that among the current trials, the only one that is uh, enrolling children down to 12 is the Pfizer trial. Yeah. Right. So um, yeah. So I, I, I'll touch on both of those. I don't know if, if Hillary is able to um, to jump in and actually will be able to add more detail. But you know, in, in terms of, of the uh, diversity of enrollment, that's a that's a key criteria for us. I think Hillary's talk did a really nice job of outlining the efforts that you're seeing to make sure that we meet those um, those targets. Um, and that is, I think, as Hillary also pointed out, one of our one of the key tenets that we have for the Operation Warp Speed effort, um, doing and and doing um, everything possible to make sure that those that are most impacted by COVID-19 are being in, um, are being um, enrolled and that we have good diversification across enrollment in the trial. Uh, to get to your second question, yeah, correct, at, at this point um, Pfizer is the only one that I'm aware of um, in, enrolling um, individuals as young as 12 years old in their clinical trial. There's a lot of, there are discussions ongoing right now between the product developers and FDA about what um, enrollment of these um, younger populations as well as the other populations that you mentioned, uh, what that will look like and, and what we can do when. Dr. Cohn. Apologies. Um, I have the same question as Dr. Chatterjee, so I, I don't have a question. Okay. So finally, uh, Dr. Wentworth. Thanks for that uh, great presentation, Dr. Johnson. Um, you mentioned, you know, a, a lot of these have already uh, got data associated with virus neutralization tests. And as you know, that can be a challenging uh, 
process. And I was wondering if, if there's some activity going on to standardize uh, that neutralization so that you better understand uh, the level of neutralization from different platforms. Over. That's a great point. And Hillary, I didn't touch on that in my presentation because I think Hillary uh, did a nice job covering that. One of the tenets under the um, Operation Warp Speed effort is that uh, we will use a standardized neutralizing assay across uh, trials to get just at your point. Okay, thank you, Dr. Johnson. I think we have a break now. We're going to take a 10-minute break, which means we will reconvene at 11.50 Eastern.
All right, so all right, so we are coming back. So all right, welcome back, and we are going to be getting started uh, for our second portion after break. Uh, Dr. Marks, would you like to uh, kick us off here real quick? Go ahead, turn yeah. your camera on and. Take it away. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. I just wanted to take a moment. I'm, I'm this Peter Marks, Director of Center for Biological Evaluation and Research. And just on behalf of uh, the center and FDA, I just want to take a moment uh, to uh, thank a number of people, uh, including uh, the, uh, all of those in the Office of Vaccine Research and Review who did a tremendous amount of effort uh, into uh, preparing for this advisory committee meeting. I also need to greatly thank the advisory committee meeting staff and Dr. Atreya. They spent uh, many, many hours uh, uh, getting ready for this. This is a, an exceptionally uh, well-attended advisory committee meeting, more so than most, so uh, a tremendous amount of preparation went in, into it. Um, and I uh, also uh, want to greatly uh, thank all of our advisors um, who are participating today. Um, we greatly appreciate uh, all of the input uh, that you will provide to us. So without that, since it's a very busy day, I just want to take any more time, but thank you all, and thanks to all our listeners uh, today as well. Thanks, Dr. Marks. Uh, we're going ahead now to the uh, rest of the morning program, which basically looks at what happens after vaccine starts to be used in terms of uh, monitoring safety and effectiveness and other uh, important variables. And uh, first, we're going to hear from the CDC, from Dr. Shima Bukuru and Dr. Shrag, who are both going to tell us about the CDC plans for vaccine safety monitoring and evaluation during future use and post-licensure. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, and please turn your camera on as well. Uh, I, I, I can't oh, that's right. Camera. I, put the, I will take care of that. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone, and I'll be covering CDC post-authorization, post-licensure, safety monitoring of COVID-19 vaccines. By way of background, the U.S. government has a responsibility for public safety with respect to vaccines. Our monitoring is independent from manufacturers and covers all vaccines, and we maintain the largest, most robust, and most sophisticated safety monitoring systems available, and agencies collaborate on analyses. CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices has established a COVID-19 vaccine safety technical subgroup. The subgroup has been advising federal agencies on planning and preparation for monitoring, and it will independently review and evaluate safety data, and safety data will be regularly presented at public ACIP meetings. This is a list of systems and topics I'll be covering. So I'll start out with the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. VAERS is the National Passive surveillance or spontaneous reporting system that is co-managed by CDC and FDA. VAERS can rapidly detect safety signals and can detect rare adverse events, but as a, as a spontaneous reporting system, the main limitation is generally we cannot assess causality from VAERS data alone. It is a hypothesis generating system and a signal detection system. VAR says all 320 million U.S. residents as a covered population for safety monitoring. In recent years, VARES has received about 50, just over 50,000 reports per year. That comes out to about 1,000 reports per week. Approaches to analyzing VAERS data include traditional methods like clinical review of individual reports and aggregate report review. That's looking at large volumes of automated data. Statistical data mining methods detect disproportional reporting of specific vaccine adverse event combinations in the VAERS database. 
VAERS traditionally has provided the initial data on the safety profile of new vaccines when they are introduced. For COVID, va COVID vaccine reports will be processed within one to five business days, depending on the seriousness of the report. CDC and FDA receive updated data sets daily, and data mining runs are planned to be conducted every one to two weeks. So this is an example of uh, the timeliness and responsiveness of VAERS going back to H1N1. This is the first published safety data that was published in the MMWR. The vaccines, the H1N1 vaccines were licensed in mid-September 2009, did not become available until mid to late October. The analytic period for this analysis was through November 24th, and the MMWR was published December 4th. That's less than two months after the start of vaccination. Moving on to the vaccine safety data link. The VSD is a collaboration between CDC and nine participating integrated health care organizations with data on over 12 million persons per year. VSD has uh, information from EH electronic health records and administrative data all linked by study IDs with access to charts. Planned monitoring activities include near real-time sequential monitoring, what we call rapid cycle analysis. These are weekly analyses on accumulating data with adjustments for sequential testing. The outcomes in RCA are pre-specified. Tree temporal scan data mining looks for associations, and there's no limitation or restriction on the outcomes. These outcomes are not pre-specified. We also plan to monitor for vaccine-mediated enhanced disease in VSD. VSD data are refreshed weekly, and there's an approximate two-week data lag from a patient encounter with the healthcare system until the data are in a refreshed database. Moving on to the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project. CESA is a collaboration between CDC and seven participating medical research centers. They assist U.S. healthcare providers with complex vaccine safety questions about their patients and conduct clinical research. And here's a map with the seven CESA sites. Moving on to a new program called vSafe. vSafe is a new smartphone-based active surveillance program for COVID-19. It uses text messaging to initiate web-based survey monitoring. It conducts electronic health checks on vaccine recipients daily for the first week post-vaccination and weekly thereafter until six weeks post-vaccination. It includes active telephone follow-up through the VAERS program for people reporting a clinically important adverse event during any vSafe health check, and data will be available daily. This is a schematic of vSafe. You see the bi-directional communication there between CDC and the vaccine recipient. These are text messages with web links going to the recipient and the recipient transmitting information back to CDC on their post-vaccination experience. Clinically important adverse events include missing work, unable to do activities, unable to do normal daily activities and receive medical care. If any of those are checked on any vSafe check-in, VAERS will initiate active telephone follow-up to contact the patient and take a VAERS report if appropriate. Moving on to additional programs. So some other planned safety monitoring activities are safety monitoring in the Genesis healthcare data. This is 350 long-term care facility sites in 25 states. And we're also planning to do facilitated VAERS reporting for healthcare workers and long-term care facility residents in CDC's National Healthcare Safety Network. Um, for, co for planned activities for COVID-19 safety monitoring during pregnancy, we plan to identify and review all VAERS reports involving COVID-19 vaccination and pregnancy and adverse pregnancy outcomes. Vaccine safety data link studies are planned to evaluate um, safety in pregnancy, fetal death, and infant outcomes. And monitoring of vaccinated pregnant women and women who become pregnant act after vaccination will occur in vSAFE. So in summary, CDC monitoring systems are capable of effectively monitoring COVID-19 vaccine safety both under EUA and post-licensure. 
Analytic methods for VARES and VSD have been validated through years of development and refinement. Data refresh and updates are timely, allowing for analyses in near real time, and additional safety monitoring programs will contribute, especially early in the COVID-19 vaccination program. And I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Dr. Schreg. Thank you. Um, so just as questions will remain for safety after the phase three trials, questions will also remain about vaccine efficacy. One thing we can be certain about is we will have efficacy information about the primary endpoints, which are uh, symptomatic COVID-19 disease across the U.S. Uh, portfolio of trials. But we may have limited and in some instances no information about some of the secondary endpoints, and I've pulled out just a subset relevant to public health here. Um, this would be particularly true in the instance of an early EUA because many of these secondary endpoints required a longer time than the primary to accrue events. Um, also, I just wanted to point out that for the uh, infection endpoint, which is of interest because it relates to transmission, um, even if the trials run the full duration, there may be limited insights because of widely spaced uh, blood draws and uh, complications in interpreting serology. As we heard earlier, the trials have not focused to date on pregnant women and children, so for this talk, I'm going to focus on adults. Um, so with this context, the need for post-authorization or licensure VE estimates is more important than usual, particularly if an EUA is issued uh, early and uh, we will have limited information. But it's also needed for the usual reasons that real-world protection can differ from efficacy under trial conditions. And most of the COVID-19 vaccine products in the U.S. portfolio require two-dose regimens and varying cold chain conditions, so uh, they could be challenging to implement. Given this, we were able to conduct some internal uh, consultations as well as some consultations with external stakeholders and policymakers, including some of the members of the uh, CDC's ACIP COVID-19 vaccine working group. And we really wanted to hone in on the VE priorities that are of relevance to policymaking. And the results of these consultations are summarized in this table here. Everything in the table is really a top priority. And those items I highlighted in yellow were just consistently mentioned and emphasized across our consultations as important. So we will need to go after product-specific VE for an early phase of vaccination when doses are limited. We will focus on uh, just assessing whether the vaccine is behaving as expected based on the trials. But as we hit into a wider, uh, a wider spread phase of use, we'll be interested in generating VE estimates against a range of outcomes and for key subpopulations, and also looking at some regimen-related questions that are what arise in real-world conditions. And the reason why the infection and uh, closely related transmission endpoint were emphasized by many of our uh, stakeholders is because from the policy standpoint, this is in some ways a fork in the road where policies for a vaccine known to protect against transmission can look very different from policies for a vaccine that protects against uh, severe disease but not transmission. And then as sufficient time has accrued, we will uh, be interested in looking at duration of protection, comparative VE if there's more than one product, and also uh, throughout the pandemic and certainly after vaccine comes on the scene, we want to keep tracking uh, the evolution of SARS-CoV-2. So uh, to develop the CDC VE portfolio, we used a few guiding principles and just very briefly, we are trying uh, in all of our efforts to facilitate rapid launch of our assessments. We appreciate the hunger and uh, need for additional information. We want to harmonize and coordinate across platforms, U.S. government where possible, and even to combine similar platforms where possible for more robust VE estimates. And then we are including a diversity of methods which within our portfolio 
um, analogous to what we heard earlier, this is a risk mitigation method because all of these have strengths and different limitations. And all of our efforts will be observational in nature and face some challenges in common. Vaccination may correlate with risk of disease. Uh, COVID-19 epidemiology is dynamic, and our understanding of COVID-19 is also dynamic. And we're all hoping for more than one product uh, available, but uh, this could complicate estimation of product-specific VE. So now to really focus on our currently planned portfolio for adults. In the left column, you'll see the VE priorities that I emphasized earlier. And for each of these, we've tried to identify a prospective data collection approach. Uh, this can allow for participant interview. It can allow for, in some instances, specimen collection or chart review. So a very high quality, rich data set, but often limited in sample size. And so we've also tried in parallel to leverage the power of big data and to um, use electronic health record and claims databases in independent efforts to look at the VE priorities. So looking at the prospective data collection column, most of our designs are leveraging the test negative design case control method where we can. We're also pairing that with a conventional case control approach using facility controls. And a few of the um, efforts in this column don't have a, a match with big data. So we think for the early phase of vaccination, we're, we're anticipating that healthcare workers may be one of the groups that will be early recipients of vaccine. And we've designed a prospective platform, but don't have a big data uh, counterpart. Similarly, for the key uh, VE of, uh, in, against infection or transmission, we have launched already a prospective longitudinal cohort uh, aiming to include about 5,000 healthcare and frontline workers to be ready for the early rollout of vaccine. And we're in planning stages of a general community or household VE cohort for the wider spread phase. Otherwise, in the prospective column, we're, we're leveraging hospital and uh, ICU-enriched platforms to look at severe disease, outpatient platforms for non-severe, and we also have a test negative design study in the American Indian Alaska Native population. So on the big data side, what this represents is a coordinated effort across the U.S. government. Uh, the key players will be CDC, VA, FDA, CMS, and we're also exploring collaboration with IHS. Most of these will use a retrospective cohort uh, design, but other methods may be appropriate and used. And for the elderly, we think the CMS data set is probably the most powerful, even more powerful potentially than our prospective uh, design, and FDA will be leading that effort. So we have a few additional an analyses also planned. These may not all generate VE, but will provide important context we're hoping if the uh, state immunization registries are capturing vaccination administration well, that we may be able to use the screening method for snapshots of product-specific VE. We're interested in ecologic analyses and comparisons of expected vaccine impact based on modeling with observed impact. We're designing studies in pregnant women and children, and we are leveraging the spheres project, which was launched in the spring as an open genomics consortium um, to try to track any changes in the virus over time. So uh, just to conclude, many questions of importance will remain after EUA or licensure with regards to effectiveness. Our portfolio leverages multiple platforms, data sources, and methods, and will continue to evolve as more information from the trials becomes available. And I just wanted to acknowledge all the platforms that we will leverage. Thank you. Arnold? Thank you. We have a, go ahead, take it away. Right, thank you both. Uh, we have time for a couple of critical questions. Dr. Gans. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much. This question might be um, directed at Dr. Shima Bakuro. 
Um, I really had a question about the expansion mostly of the VSD. I mean, a number of platforms were thrown up in terms of how we're going to mine the data. But there's some real key geographic sites, as robust as VSD is, and it's really been an incredible resource um, to look for signals um, that may, as you indicate by hypothesis, come from VARES. But I'm worried that it doesn't fully capture um, the ge geography of this disease. And um, I also wonder uh, about collaborations with our colleagues globally, because um, we're going to be learning a lot, um, I think, together on this. Hi, this is Tom. Um, you're I mean, you're correct that the the VSD sites tend to be um, concentrated on the, the West Coast and um, are, are heavy on the, the California Kaiser um, programs. Um, we've we've done some some looks at the at the VSD data, and although it it's it's geographically concentrated, it, it is fairly representative of uh, the the racial and ethnic demographics of the United States as a whole. Um, we there and I, and um, I think Dr. Anderson in a future um, call will be talking about some of the other systems. So um, you know, the CDC and FDA have complementary systems, and we collaborate and cooperate on our monitoring. Um, we we also do um, are working with global partners on on um, trying to harmonize uh, some of our methods and to um, you know leverage uh, systems in. in Globally in other countries, and 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 with attempts to uh, to combine data to get um, a better overall picture of of safety monitoring. Did you have another question? I'm sorry. Did you have another question? Is that your? Do you have a part two of that question? I I, I just just hung up on part one. No, no, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, let, let's go on to Dr. Meisner, and uh, we're going to uh, continue the presentations after that because we may want to have a more general discussion of the various post-marketing surveillance systems afterwards if we have the time. Dr. Meisner? Thank you, uh, and thanks both uh, presenters this morning. So I wanted to just clarify uh, Dr. Uh, Shima Bukoro, are the VAERS, VSD, and CISA will uh, apply to a, a vaccine that's licensed under an EUA? Yes. Okay. We, we, we plan to conduct post-authorization monitoring using our uh, established systems and some of these new systems during the the EUA period and and during the post licensure period when the vaccines become licensed, and will every subject receive a uh, cell phone? And because that could be a huge number of people. I mean, our our goal is to enroll as many people as possible through the through the VSafe program. Uh, I didn't really have time to get into the specifics of of enrollment, but initially. Um, people will be able to enroll either by going to a, a URL, URL or a, a scannable QR code and, and register and begin to get, uh, begin to get text messaging. Um, we, we plan to use VAERS to follow up on what, how, what we call clinically important or med medically important adverse events. Um, so essentially it's leveraging the VAERS system to help us conduct active surveillance in vSafe. Thank you. Okay, thank you both very much. Uh, we're going to move back to uh, FDA now, and we're going to hear from Stephen Anderson, the Director of the Office of Biostatistics and Epidemiology in CBER on the CBER Surveillance Systems post-marketing. So, so, Mike, I just, so, Mike, I just wanted to say I'm having trouble. Um, the, the screen is frozen, so I think I'm going to have to do this as a um, audio presentation. Uh, you're there, but I have your photo, so I'll, I'll throw your photo up there for you, sir. So somebody's going to have to advance slides. Sure, not a problem. 
All right, so um, hi, my name is Steve Anderson. I'm director for the Office of Biostatistics and Epidemiology. And today I'm gonna talk about CBRS plans for monitoring COVID-19 vaccine safety and effectiveness. Um, so FDA's approach for safety is really safe, a safety throughout the life cycle approach for vaccines um, and for its regulated products. Um, and that includes pre-licensure as well as post-licensure space. Um, and uh, so moving to the pre-licensure space, the safety data comes in through the various um, phases of the studies that are conducted and evaluated um, quite thoroughly by the review team. Um, as part of that, there's also a pharmacovigilance planning process. So manufacturers, when we get to the biological license application process submit plans, they would also do this under an emergency use authorization as well. Um, and those plans really outline the safety questions or issues or concerns that arose and then um, suggest um, plans for dealing with those specific safety questions or concerns that arose um, in the process of studying the, the vaccine. So what a sponsor may do is suggest doing a post-licensure or post-market commitment, and that might include various types of studies, registries, and those might be for general safety. So if a vaccine's being given um, to women of childbearing years, which these COVID vaccines will, we might suggest that, and the sponsor may suggest that they might do, for instance, a registry to make sure that that kind of general question is answered. Um, we might also impose or discuss, and they may suggest doing a pre-licensure or, or post-market requirement or PMR. And that might be something such as a clin another clinical study, an epidemiological or observational type study, registries. And, and the difference with, between this and a post-market commitment is this is a required study to study a specific safety signal that arises. So for instance, if they get a potential safety signal for um, something like Yambore syndrome, then, then they might need to do PMR. Um, Dr. Anderson? Thing is sort of, yes? Dr. Anderson, real quick. First off, if you don't mind, you can log out and log back into Adobe real quick, so that way you can be back up. But also, what slide are you on Cause, uh, so I can make sure we're on the right slide? I'm on the second slide. OK. And if you'd like, you can I log out and log back into Adobe. I don't want to lose the audio connection is the problem. You won't. You won't. You won't. Okay. But you can keep going. Just make sure you tell us to advance slide if, if you're okay. going to. I will ad All right. So and then so then finally the baseline is sort of routine pharmacovigilance, which is includes anything from passive surveillance to review of safety literature, available studies, um, et cetera. So the next slide, um, this just gives an overview of post licensure. Um, programs that we have. So passive surveillance um, is one approach that we use, and Tom has talked about VAERS, and then we'll talk about the active surveillance monitoring programs that we have. So I'm just basically going to talk first about the passive surveillance at a high level. So Tom has already really covered um, a fair amount of this. I'm stealing his slide. So VAERS is this program that's co-managed by CDC and FDA. Um, I, I'm sorry, this is slide six. I keep on forgetting to tell you that. Um, so the, the slide header is VAERS and FDA CBER effort. So um, the CDC presentation covered VAERS, so I'm just going to provide an overview of FDA efforts. Um, FDA and CDC, I just want to mention that we have weekly and biweekly coordination meetings on VAERS and then our pharmacovigilance activities right now going on. Um, for COVID-19 vaccines. Um, that includes the CBER, front, CBER Office of Biostatistics staff in the front office as well as the Division of Epidemiology, um, CDC's Immunization Safety Office and others at CDC. I want to mention that our Division of Epidemiology physicians will be reviewing the serious adverse event reports that come in for the vaccines. They review individual reports. Um, actually very closely scrutinized death reports, conduct aggregate analyses, um, and then case series and a variety of other types of analyses. And I think as Tom mentioned, we're going to be using statistical data mining methods um, to identify if there's any, um, again, potential safety signals that pop up um, or are more frequently reported. 
Next, I want to, which is slide seven, I wanted to talk about our active surveillance monitoring program. Going to slide eight, the next slide um, is talking about FDA's vaccine um, safety monitoring programs and legislative authorizations. I just wanted to mention that um, there is legislative mandates for these programs that we're going to be talking about. Um, the first one is really um, around the FDA Amendments Act. That directed FDA to develop what essentially is a Sentinel system, and, and the best initiative really is um, part of the Sentinel initiative. And the mandate by 2012 was to cover more than 100 million persons. So I'm going to show you some big data systems and just keep an eye on that 100 million number because that's the number that we shoot for when we're doing these types of safety evaluations. And then the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, um, the last iteration was 2017, um, just a discussion between FDA and industry on priority areas. And, and the Sentinel system and best received funding through this um, User Fee Act to fund activities. I wanted to talk, touch on data considerations because I think those are important for vaccines. Um, what we're looking for in data systems are really rapid data access for near real-time surveillance, um, large databases. This is slide nine, by the way, sorry. Um, large databases of tens of millions of patients for evaluating rare serious adverse events, uh, data representing integrated um, care spectrum, meaning outpatient, um, to inpatient, and that means vaccines are largely given in an outpatient setting or a physician's office or clinic, um, but what we also want to be able to capture is if a patient comes in um, to an emergency department or the hospital with a serious adverse event, you want to be able to capture the entire spectrum of those visits in the patient records and have systems to do that. You want high quality data because it's very important to get, um, if you identify a safety signal, very important to adjudicate that and get that validated properly. Um, you want data with significant clinical detail um, and preferably access to medical charts. So moving on to slide 10, um, just a brief overview of the biologics effectiveness and safety system. Um, it includes several partners. Um, the first three are sort of um, contractors, we have academic partners, we have large um, insurers that are part of the program and, and mentioned that we also have point of care facilities and healthcare providers such as MedStar represented. And again, across the entire setting of healthcare um, spectrum. Slide 11 um, talks about claims data sources. And just to remind people that, that claims are obviously the billing data and administrative types of information um, that are used to send patients, to, to bill patients um, for, for services received in a um, care visit. Um, and you can see off to the right that many of these systems are in the tens of millions of patients that they cover. Um, the last three or four are ones that just are newly came on board with the best program, so we're going to be um, engaging those for use for COVID evaluation, um, COVID-19 um, vaccine evaluation. I wanted to talk about electronic health record data sources too, and many times the electronic health records provide a richer source of data um, than the claims data. So as you look over to the right, you can see the numbers vary from 1.5 million upwards to 105 million for Optum EHR systems. Um, so we have a lot of coverage with these um, potential data systems. Um, and then an important thing also to consider is they have strengths and limitations, which I'll talk about in a minute. I wanted then, before I do that, though, to talk about the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services data. Um, we, FDA has had an ongoing partnership with CMS since 2002 to look at vaccine safety and effectiveness. Um, the data cover a very large population. I'm sorry, this is slide 13. Um, and um, cover um, approximately 55 million elderly persons who are 65 years of age or older. Um, it represents a variety of healthcare settings that we're often looking for. And then these claims, their claims data, but they can, we can get access to medical charts for adjudication of adverse events. So this has been a powerful system 
um, that you'll see in a minute for many of the studies that we've been doing. I just wanted to talk a bit about limitations of these data systems because I've thrown a lot of numbers and data systems at you. And I'll just say, you know, not all claims and EHR systems can be used to address um, a vaccine safety or effectiveness regulatory question. So as you're looking at these systems, just remember each one has its limitations. So for instance, you know, the populations they cover. So for instance, Medicare covers the elderly population, but it doesn't give us as much information on individuals less than 65 years of age. It may not cover the healthcare settings of interest. It may just cover, let's say, hospitalizations. Um, and so on and so forth. And it may not actually cover the exposures and the outcomes of interest to us either. We may not be able to capture vaccines that we would like um, and then the adverse outcomes that we'd like to see. Um, slide 15. I'm going to talk a bit about um, safety surveillance planning that we're doing. So like CDC, we're planning to do near real-time surveillance or rapid cycle analysis. We're planning on at this time, monitoring 10 to 20 safety outcomes of interest to be determined sort of on a variety of factors. Um, one is on the pre-market review of sponsor safety data submitted to FDA. So that we'll be looking very closely at that data and especially the phase three safety data to identify potential um, safety questions of interest for us to study with our rapid cycle analyses. We're also going to be looking at the literature and regulatory experience with these vaccines and, and any um, experience or knowledge gained from looking at the vaccine platforms and their use in past vaccines um, and other relevant data. Um, we're also going to be coordinating all of this work with our federal partners, which I'll talk about at the end of the presentation. So our 10 to 20, list of 10 to 20 should largely be the same. Um, as, as CDCs and other federal partners, it's the plan. Um, and I will say for our plans, we plan on using CMS data for COVID-19 vaccine rapid cycle analysis um, as sort of our first um, um, set of surveillance that we're going to be doing for any new COVID-19 vaccine. Tom had this uh, list of possible um, adverse event outcomes of interest. I won't dwell on this. He had them at the end of his presentation. So we'll be coordinating um, which of these and others that we might be using um, in our rapid cycle analyses. But it gives you a feel for the types of events. I'm sorry, this is slide 17. Um, FDA's experience with near real-time surveillance. So we have considerable experience doing near real-time surveillance. So We've conducted um, surveillance for the annual influenza vaccine and Guillain-Barre syndrome since 2007. Um, and then we're supporting confirmation of some of CDC's work with their rapid cycle analysis of safety. And we've done that in the past for the seasonal influenza vaccine work that they've done in Shingrix um, vaccine as examples. Um, we've also done rapid cycle analysis type work or rapid surveillance in Sentinel, um, doing near real-time surveillance in the 2017 and 18 seasonal influenza vaccine, looking at six health outcomes of interest. So the question I think then becomes, once we get these signals, how do we adjudicate them? So another capacity that we are, we're, we've built is really the ability to conduct epidemiological analyses to really look at any of these signals that we get from sort of the screening methods um, that we're using in the near real-time surveillance. Um, and there's also tree scan and other signal detection methods where we'll need to adjudicate signals. So we're, we've got that capacity with these large databases to do that. So we can do some rapid queries and small epidemiological studies. We're prepared to do those. Um, but we can also do larger sort of protocol-based studies that might include sort of approaches such as self-controlled risk intervals, cohorts, um, or case control type analyses. Um, the next slide is slide 19. Um, I wanted to talk about our effectiveness work. Um, I won't go into it to the level of detail that Stephanie did, just for the sake of time. 
Um, but there may be limited information on effectiveness at the time of licensure or authorization of these vaccines. And I just want to remind people that manufacturers have a part in this as well. They're, they're doing the pharmacovigilance plan for safety. Um, they'll also be making um, proposals for studies that they might conduct for vaccine effectiveness post-licensure studies. Um, but FDA may conduct studies, too, along with CDC on vaccine effectiveness. So we're talking as well along the lines of what CDC is, general effectiveness studies, um, including subpopulations of interest, like patients with comorbidities, elderly, elderly in long-term care facilities, and the like. Um, we're also interested in duration of protection studies. So those are on the radar screen for us. Um, and I will just say that um, this is all being done in regular coordination with CDC um, through monthly and bimonthly meetings just to make sure there's no redundancy um, in the work that each of us are doing. Um, I just, the next slide is slide 20. I just wanted to talk about our vaccine effectiveness experience. We have extensive experience with the data and methods to conduct this kind of work. We produced um, several vaccine effectiveness and relative vaccine effectiveness studies for influenza and zoster vaccines, um, and then conducted a duration of effectiveness analysis for Zostavac. So again, this goes, work goes back probably eight to 10 years that we've been doing this type of work. The other thing is we've been using the CMS data to understand and do some foundational work understanding COVID-19 diagnosis and the factors for reporting it in these data systems. So that work has been, at least initial work, has been of characterizing and sort of doing the natural history type studies of patients um, is, is submitted for publication. And I just wanted to remind people that um, just in the past we have significant publication records in this area, um, congressional testimony and the like. Moving to the next slide, um, I just wanted to talk about transparency considerations. So we're developing master protocols, both for safety and effectiveness outcomes that we want to study. We'll be posting the draft protocols on, um, out for public comment, and that's generally about a two-week period. Um, we'll consider those comments and update the protocol as needed. Um, and then post final protocols and final study reports, just again to keep the public informed um, and stakeholders of the work we're doing. That'll be posted on the, F the bestinitiative.org website. And then I just wanted Dr. to reiterate, I think the, yes? Yep, we have about two more okay. minutes. Okay, so I just wanted to emphasize this is a government-wide effort. We've been working closely um, with CDC, CMS, VA, and then others are involved in the work as well. And I just wanted to remind you that that includes sort of regular meetings, the idea of sharing planned protocols and discussions um, of safety and effectiveness outcomes of joint interest to us, um, and we're coordinating the plans for near real-time surveillance um, with our sister agencies as well. And with that, I just wanted to end with acknowledgments to my CBER colleagues, but also the many colleagues from other government agencies and our, our um, contracting partners for the work that they do. And I will stop there. Thank you so much. All right, Arnold. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. I'm going to, uh, I think we have time, or we really don't have time, but if there are two burning questions, uh, please raise your hands. Dr. Gans? Thank you. Um, I uh, Thank you for that. I had a couple of questions. Just um, one of them is really about how we're keeping um, the data mining agnostic so we can really actually find um, potential signals that weren't predetermined. I know you spoke about that, but I really just want to make sure that there is an agnostic approach to that. Um, I have a bunch of questions about the databases. You had mentioned Signal. You had mentioned BEST. And I just want to make sure that those are going to be used since they were pretty, uh, not BEST, but Signal was really prominent in the H1N1. Um, and that was an important um, system that was being used. Um, best is hospitalizations, but I'm wondering if that's going to be expanded to this use. And then my last question is just about 
I, I didn't see, I don't know in all the data systems, are, are you utilizing the EPIC system which is used in most children's hospitals and should be in place for when we hopefully extend these to children? Thank you. Yeah, uh, all right, so there's a, a lot to unpack there. Um, we are trying to keep the data mining signals agnostic. Um, I think I'd point you to other experts at CBER that can probably talk to that better than I can. Um, the goal is to use as many of these data systems and continue to um, improve and sort of expand best so that we can continue to do this type of work. Um, right now we're in this sort of consolidation phase where we're trying to understand um, each of the data sets that we are using and their, their strengths and limitations for doing this type of work. And then um, your third question was really around children. So we've, we've engaged PEDSNET in this work, so we're in the process of onboarding them. And that's a, a network of about, I think, eight to ten different um, pediatric children's hospitals um, and networks that um, we'd like to bring on board. But they're certainly part of this whole effort, too, and we're thinking that, um, especially in later efforts for um, safety and effectiveness surveillance, they'll become an important part of this work. Dr. Nelson? Uh, good afternoon. Great presentation. Thank you for that important data. I have two quick ones. In your list of EHRs that you're un using or looking at to consider for real-time monitoring, uh, perhaps I missed it. I didn't see the DOD or the VA electronic medical records and those closed health systems with longitudinal follow-up of those patients I think would be an important resource and I'm sure it's probably already on your plate. But my other yeah. question, <laughs> oh, go ahead. Uh, the other one which was more substantial was uh, I wondered if you'd comment on the impact of the lag of data acquisition for some of these passive reporting systems and CMS in general, with only 90% of CMS uh, claims getting in within a three-month period. Normally okay, but under these circumstances and perhaps with the UAs for these vaccines, uh, more real-time data might be needed. Thanks. Well, we have preferred access to CMS data, so I think the data stream there for us, we can get weekly or almost um, regular updated feeds from them every couple of days if we want. And, and it starts with unadjudicated data, but then as adjudicated data is added, um, the data all get updated. So we don't, this isn't a research database. This is actually access to live um, insurance data stream. So we sort of have a, um, a unique access as a government agency to the CMS data. But you're right, lag is a huge concern to us, so we try to keep it um, under a month or two for, the, for many of the systems, especially the claim systems, but the claim systems generally go out three or four months of lag, and so that is a, that is a challenge. But the EHR systems are a bit quicker, so we're trying to build more EHR capacity, um, and those can be in a matter of days to a week or two for the lag. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to hear next uh, about the operational aspects of COVID-19 vaccine distribution and tracking from Captain Janelle Ruth uh, from the Division of uh, Viral Diseases at the CDC. Uh, Dr. Ruth. All right, thank you all very much. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today. I'm a pediatrician by training and a medical officer in the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. Today, I will lay out the implementation plans that we've been developing here in the Vaccine Task Force in conjunction with our partners at Operation Warp Speed. So COVID-19 vaccine continues to be a complex and ever-evolving landscape. Before focusing on what we're planning for, I want to acknowledge the major challenges involved in rolling out a vaccine product as complex as the ones under investigation, as my other colleagues have done today. There are products that will likely have one or two dose series. Products may not be interchangeable. We do predict that vaccine efficacy and adverse event profiles will be different in different populations, adding to the complexity of getting the right vaccine to the right person. Cold chain requirements will vary and could be complicated by an ultra-cold product or multiple products all requiring different specifications. We don't know yet how children and pregnant women will be included or recommended for vaccination. 
Vaccine administration will be challenged by the need to maintain social distance in conjunction with infection control guidance. And last but not least, communication and education around these vaccines will be, have to be done carefully in order not to jeopardize our longstanding vaccination program. We know that trust and hesitancy are issues, and it's important to get on front with our messages that are crafted by the data and scientific processes that CDC adheres to. As has been discussed, rollout of vaccine is undoubtedly a phased approach, not to be confused with the phases of the clinical trials. We have focused our planning efforts around three phases. Those first weeks of limited doses, where the intent will be to get vaccine out to groups likely to be selected for early access, such as healthcare providers, through tightly focused administration. Next is the second phase, where increasing doses allows for the expansion of vaccination efforts beyond these initial populations and into broader settings, with an emphasis on populations that may require special consideration to ensure distribution and access. And finally, we, re we do reach a point where supply outweighs demand, and the key is to make sure that access is available for anybody who wants to be vaccinated. Vaccine implementation done right has many moving pieces, from prioritization and allocation to distribution, administration, and tracking safety, effectiveness, and uptake, especially around that second dose. It's important to remember that the success of these pieces is driven by good communication and stakeholder guidance as well as regula regulatory considerations that build trust and confidence in the vaccine. What I'd like to do now is to walk you through the key components of implementation and what we are doing to ensure these pieces fit together into a seamless rollout. The public health impact of a vaccination program relies on the rapid, efficient, and high uptake of the complete vaccine series with a focus on those at increased risk for severe illness. I do want to emphasize that we are thinking through carefully critical populations to ensure access to vaccine in earlier phases. Those selected to receive the first allocation of vaccine may be populations who provide critical infrastructure services like health care providers and other essential workers like emergency management personnel. But while we focus on that first allocation, it's also important to begin planning for populations to be prioritized in the next phases, which will follow quickly. These are persons at increased risk for severe illness, like older adults and those with underlying medical conditions, those who have increased risk of infection, such as per persons living or working in congregate settings, and those persons with limited access to vaccination. Right now, we're asking jurisdictions to identify and enumerate these critical populations and, and making sure that they reinforce partnerships with those trusted community organizations so that methods for rapid information sharing will exist once vaccine or vaccines are available to distribute. So here's an overview of the vaccine distribution concept down to the administration site. Vaccine will flow from the manufacturers contracted by Operation Warp Speed either to the distributor or for a vaccine requiring ultra-cold chain maintenance direct from the manufacturer to site of administration. At the same time, kits containing ancillary supplies such as syringes, alcohol pads, some limited PPE, and adjuvant or diluent as required will be packaged and shipped to the distributor depot. Vaccine and kits will be ordered and ship separately to arrive either from the distributor or from that regional depot. Jurisdictions will order against a defined allocation of vaccine as it becomes available and will direct it to a variety of different administration sites, which will likely depend on that phase rollout. As vaccine becomes more available, we will start bringing in commercial partners like pharmacies who will be given direct allocations to expand that footprint of vaccination sites across the country. One key piece of vaccine administration is making sure we have a sufficient number of providers who can administer vaccines, particularly in the early phases when we want to reach those critical populations. Onboarding and training of providers is vital to ensure the success of this vaccination program. There are multiple unique considerations for COVID vaccine administration that we are taking into account when thinking through vaccination clinic setup and throughput. Regardless of whether that clinic is a mass vaccination activity, a drive through operation, or housed in a health center. These considerations do apply. First is maintaining social distance and infection control guidance for a vaccine clinic management. This means spacing out persons 
and having an appointment scheduling process to avoid overcrowding. Second is storage and handling capacity of the frozen products. We're not recommending at this time that hospitals or clinics purchase ultra-cold equipment. If an ultra-cold product is granted an authorization to administer, it will come in its own shipping container that is able to maintain that cold chain for a period of time to administer vaccine doses. Security may be a concern at some clinics and making sure that the clinic staff and patrons are safe is part of that key clinic design. And finally, clinics must have the ability to have time to speak with patients and provide them the information required under an EUA. This step is critical because for some vaccines, patients will need to come back for that second dose. A good experience with time to answer questions and counsel on vaccine safety will go a long way to ensuring that return visit. Sorry, I missed that slide, apologies. Um, so uh, CDC and our Operation Warp Speed partners have developed an end-to-end -end data structure to monitor and track the distribution, administration, uptake, and demand for vaccines. Starting on the right of the slide, providers use partner systems or jurisdiction immunization information systems to input orders against a defined allocation into CDC's VTRAC system, which transmit the orders to the distributor. Administration and inventory is tracked on the provider side as well as the distributor, and data flow to CDC and Operation Warp Speed for analysis in order to have end-to-end -end visibility on each dose. We are leveraging existing, well-proven immunization systems through our jurisdictional partners to conduct the COVID vaccination program. Jurisdictions are well-positioned to execute this program because they know their populations, their enumerations and where they live. They know where their at-risk populations can be found and who those key stakeholders are. They know how to reach those hard-to-reach populations through established channels, and they know where their providers practice. They also have existing relationships with hospitals that they can leverage to start thinking through that phase one administration. How to order, track, and report on vaccine administration and adverse events is something that jurisdictions are well aware of. And they also know how to run vaccination clinics, manage cold chain, storage, store and handle vaccines, and they know how to get vaccine or other product out in an emergency or outbreak situation. And finally, they know how to execute large-scale vaccination to control and prevent illness. We released the interim playbook on jurisdictional operations on September 16th to assist jurisdictions in their planning efforts. It contains 15 sections on all aspects of vaccine planning specific for COVID-19. This is an iterative document and it will be updated as new information is learned. We are currently providing regional technical assistance to support jurisdictional planning and our teams are doing a multitude of things to make sure that planning is going smoothly. They're collecting and analyzing metrics on capacity, providing direct technical assistance, including on-the-ground assistance in some states, and they're helping to facilitate cross-regional collaboration for best practice sharing. Teams are training jurisdictions on these new data systems we're bringing on board, including the Operation Warp Speed Tiberius system and CDC's data dashboard. Right now, we're currently in the process of reviewing those jurisdictional plans, and once we do, we'll move forward um, with um, providing continued technical assistance once vaccine is available to make sure that jurisdictions have a smooth rollout. So to distribute and administer COVID vaccine, we need to leverage the help of many partners to ensure the success of this really unprecedented effort. We are leveraging public health expertise from the whole of the United States government, as Dr. Johnson outlined in his presentation, and we're also valuing contributors from private partners. Pharmacies can help increase access to vaccines. Almost 90% of Americans live within a 10-mile radius of a pharmacy, plotted here on the map by both big chain stores, shown by the red dots, and the independent pharmacies in blue. This provides a massive footprint to get vaccine out to the public, particularly in those rural communities. We see pharmacies assisting across all phases of vaccine rollout. They'll be assisting in phase one to ensure targeted vaccination of long-term care facility staff, as well as other essential workers and persons at higher risk for severe COVID-19, such as older adults. In phase two, 
They'll help expand access to the general public via their large networks. Jurisdictional vaccination plans were returned on October 16th to CDC, and as I mentioned, we are in the process of reviewing them right now. All 64 jurisdictions did submit a plan for review. Our next steps are to ensure that at the jurisdictional level, they continue to work with commercial partners and our federal entities who may receive direct allocation to expand access, particularly in phases two and three. We ask that they enumerate their critical populations who may be selected for early vaccine allocation or, again, require that special consideration about, around distribution and access. We're asking that they proceed with the collection of vaccination of vaccine provider agreements to make sure those providers are onboarded, um, including providers that serve those critical or early access populations. We want to make sure that they have their state data systems, <coughs> excuse me, uh, connected and uh, the processes to monitor vaccine distribution, uptake, demand, and waste, wastage are all intact. And then finally, we're really asking that they begin engaging with community stakeholders to address the issues around vaccine hesitancy. I can't talk about distribution without addressing concerns about vaccination. We know that vaccine hesitancy is an issue and that we need to rise to the challenge to achieve high coverage, both with seasonal influenza and also COVID-19 vaccines when available. We know that certain racial and ethnic minorities have consistently lower vaccination coverage than others, shown here on the graph of influenza vaccine coverage by season. We need novel and robust strategies to increase vaccine uptake, both for seasonal flu and for COVID-19 vaccine. Focus groups conducted this summer by CDC show that participants were open to get, getting vaccinated eventually, but were hesitant to receive it when first available. Concerns included safety, side effects, um, vaccine effectiveness, and if there was sufficient testing in their group, meaning their age group or race and ethnicity. Participants wanted more information on vaccine products and said they would take a wait and see approach before making a final decision. And most said that a six month period would be a reasonable time frame to sort of wait and see. Our Vaccinate with Competence campaign that was developed at CDC is now being used to reinforce confidence in COVID-19 vaccines. We are using a frame, this framework as a starting point for communications around COVID-19 vaccine, taking into account the critical factors raised by our focus groups. Using this framework, we will work to reinforce trust by sharing clear and accurate COVID vaccine information. We're working to get information out to our website so that effective resources are available to providers to promote confidence both among healthcare personnel, uh, we want them to get vaccinated and also to recommend they vaccinate their patients. And finally, we are working through our community partners to collaborate with trusted messengers in these communities that are at increased risk for COVID outbreaks and also for disease complications. Activities to support the Vaccinate with Competence strategy for COVID-19 include gaining insights into vaccine hesitancy through ongoing data collection, continuing to develop strategy around the three key components uh, that I mentioned in the last slide, developing a rapid community assessment guide, and providing ongoing support to the jurisdictions as they address hesitancy in their communities. CDC has a vaccine website that is now live. It has web content on a separate web page, uh, but it sits underneath our larger COVID website. And we will continue to update this as new information arrives. We also have a new ACIP web page that describes the recommendation process to help build confidence that we are ensuring safe and effective vaccine delivery. Uh, and with that, thank you very much. I'm very happy to take questions. All right, Arnold, we have a few questions Thank that didn't pop up. Thank you, Dr. Ruth. Uh, I have a question about uh, procedures. If uh, two vaccines are available at the same time and uh, both require two doses, 
how do you keep it straight at the uh, clinical sites which vaccine the person has received the previous time? Right, so um, an excellent question. We are going to have both electronic systems and also a fail-safe uh, backup system to ensure that we get uh, that correct second dose to the right person. Um, we are going to be having systems that do track uh, and, and help people um, administer that second, the correct second dose. In every um, ancillary kit that is shipped with a vaccine allocation, there will be um, a vaccine card that is filled out and given to the vaccine recipient. Um, we are asking that they keep and return that card when they come back for their second dose. That card will contain information about the vaccine that they did receive and the timing in order um, to ensure that they um, get that appropriate second dose. Thank you. I'm going to continue with questions. I uh, just want to let everybody know that we will be eating into our lunchtime because we're going to return at 1.30 Eastern. So, Dr. Pergam, you're next. Thanks uh, for that uh, great presentation. It's an excellent review of everything that's in place. Uh, I'm curious, um, one of the the populations that is also at risk for development of complications are immunosuppressed populations. It makes up about 4% of the United States, and it's not been discussed in any um, of the reviews about how this population is going to be addressed. And one question I would ask is, is there any effort to um, prioritize families and close contacts of those individuals since they would most likely not be available for the vaccine in the early phases? Uh, thank you for that question. I know that we are thinking through multiple different critical populations in order to um, think through some of the access issues that, um, that will arise around uh, vaccination of these populations. And I think that is a critical one. I know um, in, in many communities, not just with immunocompromised populations, but uh, with older adults, their younger children are often the caregivers. And so I think you're absolutely right. We do need to give special consideration in some of those communities uh, for caregivers. Uh, we've been focused a lot on healthcare providers, but we know that those caregivers are also healthcare providers in the homes of both immunocompromised patients and others at increased risk for um, severe outcomes from COVID. So I appreciate the question. I think we will definitely be thinking that through as we move forward with our prioritization scheme. Dr. Chatterjee. So I have a two-part question, um, Dr. Rhodes. Um, the first is with regard to mandating uh, these vaccines, uh, either for healthcare professionals or uh, emergency management personnel, uh, has that um, mechanism been uh, discussed and um, what is the plan, if so? And then the second part is once the vaccines are deployed and appropriate numbers of doses have been administered, um, does the CDC have any plans in place uh, to discuss the use of uh, PPEs and um, other uh, mitigation measures uh, for those who are uh, vaccinated. So uh, two great questions, and um, I'll take the first one, uh, that of mandating vaccination for critical infrastructure workers, such as healthcare providers or emergency personnel. I think um, we have not discussed that in, um, it, it's hard to mandate a vaccine. I know even in, in my own experience, um, hospital systems have a hard time even mandating seasonal influenza vaccine for healthcare providers, and I think um, this would be of some, something similar. I think what we need to do, rather than mandating vaccine, is, is really to build trust and confidence in these vaccine candidates, and I think that's what we're really trying to do through our Vaccinate with Confidence strategy. Um, I'd, I'd much prefer, rather than mandating vaccine, to, to build that confidence in our healthcare provider infrastructure, uh, because that it, it sort of gets 
at, at two issues, right? One is that you're protecting healthcare providers um, as they're doing their, their daily work, but at the second, the second point is that it really does allow them to feel confident in the vaccine and recommend it to their patients. Um, and so then we just we continue to spread that message um, out to the general public. So, so I would say um, to answer that, I, much, I would really prefer to move forward with, um, with the work that we're doing uh, around vaccinate with confidence um, rather than thinking through a, a mandate uh, for COVID. Uh, the second question around uh, PPE, you know, I think at this time we don't um, have information yet on the, the effectiveness data of these vaccines once they are rolled out into the general public. And so um, at this time, I would say we would want to continue um, to, to encourage um, good PPE practices, hand washing, masking, et cetera, until we have some better understanding of what the effectiveness is of these vaccines as they're being rolled out. Thank you. Dr. Lee, please be brief. We're eating into our lunch. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, one question I have is that, as you know, some of the doses, uh, some of the um, vaccines have two doses. And what are the plans to ensure people do come back for the second dose, which is either perhaps 21 or 28 days? Thank you. Right. So we are going to have some electronic and texting reminder systems in order to make sure that people do return for their second dose. I think, you know, the other critical piece, as I mentioned, is making sure that they do have a good experience with their first dose administration, um, making sure that they get their questions answered, making sure, again, they feel confident in their decision to get vaccinated. And I think that will go a long way to ensuring that they do return. But we do have measures in place, um, again, um, text message system and, and other electronic systems to, um, to remind people. Uh, everybody's busy, and I know it's easy to forget. Thank you. Dr. Carrillo. Thank you. Uh, you know, beyond vaccine hesitancy, given that all of these so many vaccine manufacturers are will be uh, uh, coming out with all sorts of press releases about the status of their vaccine and the phase three data results will be coming along in dribs and drabs throughout uh, and given that companies tend to try to take advantage of every promotable advantage uh, the potential is set up that there will be vaccines available either licensed or under EUA, but something better may be coming along in another two or three months and people want to wait. Um, have you thought about how that messaging is going to go so that everyone is just not waiting for the perfect vaccine? Uh, we've definitely been thinking that through and, um, you know, as you rightly point out, uh, there are lots of different vaccine candidates right now. I, um, some are two doses. Uh, the ones that may be coming uh, later are a single dose. And so I, I think it is that together with some of the work that we've done to um, understand vaccine hesitancy um, does make a case that people may be waiting to see uh, what those first candidates are and, and whether um, and, and whether they should wait for, for a more quote unquote favorable candidate. I think that's not the message we want to convey, and so we're working hard um, with, within our own strategy to um, help people understand that, you know, vaccination is, is one of the key tools that we have to, um, to start to, to get our, our lives and, and uh, back on track and the, and the things that we like to do, uh, visiting friends and family. Um, vaccine's a way to do that. And so I, I do think we are going to really lean forward into um, the promotion of the vaccines that are available and, uh, and, and make sure, again, that, they, that we have a, a wide footprint to get them out and available to uh, people as quickly as possible. Uh, Mr. Tubman. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I have a 
concern about the allocation and prioritization with regard to people living in congregate settings. There's been a lot of discussion about nursing homes for obvious reasons. We have a very high percentage of deaths occurring there. But in jails, prisons, mental health, hospitals, and other congregate living situations where social distancing is just not possible, hygiene is very difficult. Um, I'm wondering if CDC is looking at prioritizing all congregate uh, living you know, settings. Yes, yeah, so I, I will tell you I don't have information on that yet. I know that uh, ACIP is still in deliberations around that prioritization structure. I think we, we did get some information from the National Academy of Science and their prioritization scheme, but um, ACIP will be, uh, will be doing their own deliberations and, and coming up with that once vaccine candidates are um, moving forward into that authorization. So at this time, I think I can't answer your question uh, completely, but I know um, we are certainly taking uh, people living and working in congregate settings under consideration in that prioritization scheme. OK, and finally, Dr. Cohn. Thank you. Um, I just want to um, thank uh, Dr. Ritz for her great presentation and to clarify um, one point, which is uh, just to uh, for the public record that uh, the federal government cannot mandate vaccines, um, so mandates have been shown to increase coverage in some settings, um, but uh, the federal government would not be mandating use of these vaccines. Um, organizations, such as a hospital, um, with licensed products uh, do have capability of, 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 of asking their workers to get the vaccine, uh, but in the setting of an EUA, uh, patients and individuals will have the uh, uh, right to refuse the vaccine. Over. Okay, well, thank you very much, and thanks to all the presenters. As I promised, uh, we are going to start again at 1.30. We will be, at that point, only 15 minutes late. So I think we're doing very well. Thank you all, and see you at 1.30.
I'll put my my camera on. Okay. Okay, Dr. Monto, we are back live and back from break. Uh, why don't you take it away? <laughs> All right, welcome back. Uh, sorry for the short lunch. Uh, we're next going to hear uh, from Susan Winkler and Chris Wilkes uh, about COVID-19 uh, uh, COVID vaccine confidence. They're from the Reagan Udall Foundation. Thank you, Dr. Monto, and uh, good afternoon. We're really pleased to be able to join you today. Um, the Reagan Udall Foundation is a nonprofit, non-government organization that was created by Congress solely to advance the mission of the FDA. So recognizing that we're um, likely less well-known than the other organizations that have been presented today, presenting today. I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Chris Wilkes, who was the lead researcher for the project that we will discuss. So as part of our purpose to advance the mission of the FDA, uh, today we will present one of our pandemic projects, uh, and specifically that's the COVID-19 Vaccine Confidence Project. As mentioned by prior speakers, uptake of the COVID-19 vaccine will be it really important when we get to the point where there is an authorized or an approved vaccine or vaccines available. In this project, we are working with CBER to help them to understand the public perceptions about COVID-19 vaccines and the center's role in vaccine approval or authorization, and to identify what information key audiences want as they determine whether to receive an approved or an authorized vaccine. Uh, I'll walk through the stages of our project, but we're focusing on two specific populations in frontline workers as well as often underrepresented communities. And the goal is to work quickly to develop some information that will be helpful to the agency. I want to note that this is a rather narrow project looking at FDA's role and then key audiences' interest or questions that they may have about that role in a COVID-19 vaccine and how it is that CBER might respond to those questions or concerns. Our project goes through a four-step approach. And so we began um, in August and September doing a quick analysis of key themes in media and social media. And this was to help inform our listening sessions. So this was to see what is it that is being reported in the media as a dynamic uh, uh, or questions or concerns about a COVID-19 vaccine. We are then conducting listening sessions, and we are deep in this stage right now. And our intent here is to listen to opinions and attitudes from different groups about a COVID-19 vaccine. We are distinctly in this stage gathering information. So we are listening in these sessions. We are not responding nor educating, but rather listening to what it is that the participants in these, these sessions say. We'll then take that information, take what we heard, and construct approaches for how one might respond. And look, there we'll be looking to develop um, messages or responses that respond to those concerns or questions, as well as teeing up the messengers who would be best positioned to deliver those messages. And then, uh, then to test the messages and messengers to assure that they're relevant and credible to key audiences. So our focus today is to report out our initial insights from these listening sessions. As I noted before, we have two key audiences. And in particular, we're looking and hearing from frontline workers and then traditionally underrepresented groups. In the frontline workers, we're conducting sessions in uh, those who work in retail, uh, within healthcare systems, and then some in community health. In the traditionally underrepresented groups, uh, we've talked about this within our project, that this is prioritizing those whose voices are often not heard and trying to make sure that we hear from them about their concerns and opinions. 
And so here, we're conducting the listening sessions with African American black men and women, um, the black and Latinx community leaders, English as a second language, and um, two different approaches in indigenous, indigenous and native people. So those are who we are hearing from. The bulk of my presentation, of our presentation, will share what we are hearing. We have conducted eight listening sessions to date and have four or five more in the queue to complete in the next few weeks. As a component of these listening sessions, we assure the participants that we will not connect them with uh, specific comments, but rather that we will protect their information. What we're going to do in the next few slides is to share with you direct quotes from these listening sessions. So we have organized some of these quotes into themes that are emerging um, so that we can share them with you. As we've described these sessions, um, you could sum it up and say that they have been powerful, illuminating, and sobering. And I hope as we share these direct quotes as an illustration of what we're hearing, that um, you too will have the opportunity to, to learn from these sessions. I'll note that in presenting these quotes, we aspire to share the, the words of the listening session participants, but we do not intend to replace the, their individual voices with our own. But to assure that the words are heard, what I will do is introduce the theme for each slide, and then my colleague, Dr. Chris Wilkes, will read the direct quotes from the session. So I'll just note the next six slides, these will be our direct quotes from the listening session that we have conducted. The first theme that we heard is a concern about the speed of the process and how quickly it is that uh, things are moving forward. Dr. Wilkes? The speed is appreciated, but there are questions. They want to get one out as soon as possible, which I don't think is very safe. We all know how long vaccines take, so to hear that it will be ready in a few months is concerning. I would not be first in line and I would want to see some data. Vaccines take years to develop and test. For them to try to do it in a year is pretty absurd. Thank you. The next concern was a very a specific distrust of government and government agencies. Who can we trust? That's the million dollar question. I also hear so many people arguing about the pros and the cons, mostly cons, because of distress of the government from past experience. When COVID first came out, I trusted the CDC website and was sharing from there. But now I trust the FDA and CDC much less than I did when this first came out. I don't think the FDA can be trusted to keep people safe. When I hear the FDA say that they have a particular process, but then I hear the White House say they can cut it in half or negate it, that brings more distrust. Thank you. This distrust, however, was not limited to government. Um, but rather extended to components of the broader healthcare system. Dr. Wilkes? Thank you, Susan. I'm looking for an organization I can trust that does not have a tainted history and has not been brought, by, brought, out, brought out by some big farmer. A family has had issues in a wrongful death suit with local, wrongful death with local hospitals. I have a major distrust. I've become really not trusting of the medical establishment. They never answered my questions. Doctors are going to be pushed to sell this, the vaccine, to our community. I would not like you to sell me, but show me and tell me. Educate me. African Americans are treated differently by doctors.
Another emerging theme is concern that politics and economics will be prioritized over science. Dr. Wilkes? I would love to take it, the COVID-19 vaccine, because my wife is asthmatic. So if I can prevent me being sick, I can prevent her from being sick. But I'm suspicious that they're trying to get it out before the election. A lot of people don't trust the people who are making the vaccine because they're politically motivated, and we are all a bunch of guinea pigs. There's a common feeling that economic considerations are being considered over people's health. Time and time again, the U.S. has proved it is about the dollar, especially in healthcare. For me to make my decision to trust myself with the information, I would have to hear from countries who take better care of their people. Another insight relates to fear that the vaccine will not work for individuals or for their community. Dr. Wilkes? I need to know that minorities who took it are okay. I need to know it works for everybody. I'm not trying to be harmed. Indian people are different biologically, but then who constitutes as Indian? Half Indian. Unless there's a specific study done with us and our specific makeup, we're going to be incidentally immune with a vaccine that is studied with a proportionately lower number of participants in the study group. I need to know other minorities have taken it. Are other minorities okay? We're all built different. How do we know? The final emerging insight grounds us in a reality that a COVID-19 vaccine will be used in a system in a nation with racial and ethnic disparities and discrimination. I firmly believe that this is another Tuskegee experiment. I stand strong on this in saying that my family's personal belief is that the vaccine would be an experimentation on us, and that's not something I'm willing to risk, not something I'm willing to do. One of my biggest concerns is that Alaska Natives, indigenous people are at the highest risk of death, and we are the ones that are, are the guinea pigs for the rich. They want to use us, and I don't want to keep getting used. We're not going to be guinea pigs again. The more they study me, the more they know how to get rid of me. This concludes the direct quotes from our listening sessions, but I hope that you found them illuminating. As we aspired here, our intent was to gather the concerns to then help be able to generate the responses to those concerns and questions. So in a manner that's consistent with CDC slides before the break, we know we have a lot of work to do in this space. And here are some of our initial learnings that there is interest in the science and how the science relates to individuals, that they want to, want to understand the process and for it to work. When we think about messengers, that personal relationships will matter with doctors and other healthcare providers, and that timing matters in perceptions of safety on at least two levels, both in development and in uptake of a, of a vaccine. Uh, some of our listening session participants noticed, noted rather that they would want to wait months or even years before choosing to receive a vaccine. There's also a fifth dynamic in that when we conducted these sessions, the individuals focused on a COVID-19 vaccine. What? Dr. Winkler? Dr. Winkler, I think um, somebody confirmed, but uh, does anybody else hear Dr. Winkler? I can't hear her at all, Mike. 
Yep. I can't hear her uh, Chris Wilkes. Yeah, she dropped audio. I can see that. Or Dr. Wilkes. I can't hear I her or Dr. Wilkes. Are yep. you able to hear They're her? They're reconnecting. Now? Here she comes. Here comes Dr. Winkler. We'll just give her a second. Just bear with us. I see Dr. Winkler coming right back in. It's one minute. Yep. <laughs> I think her phone went disconnected. It happens. There you go. Welcome back, Dr. Winkler. So we're back besides retaining our connection. And so complete remaining listening session. We will that message has including polling and success groups and individual interviews. She's coming through garbled. Yeah. Dr. Winkler, you gotta bring the phone closer to your mouth. I think you got give us a sound check quick. I think your earbuds disconnected. That Go ahead. And so finally, we'll delete a good news is that the last time I hope to hear me answer a question. Are there any questions for us? Why, why don't we go on to the next presentation? Because <laughs> the time's expired anyway. Okay, I'd like to uh, introduce now Dr. Jerry Weir, uh, Director of the Division of Viral Products at OBRR. He will be talking to us about licensure and emergency use authorization of vaccines to prevent COVID-19, chemistry, manufacturing, and control considerations. Jerry. Uh, thank you and good afternoon. Uh, this will be a fairly short presentation. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is uh, describe briefly the role of the CMC uh, chemistry manufacturing controls in licensure and, and EUA uh, use. And by using a few examples, uh, key examples, try to illustrate the complexity and the importance of CMC in both of these processes. Uh, the next two slides are going to give a, just a brief background. Uh, chemistry manufacturing controls and facility information and data are critical to ensure the quality of vaccines and the consistency of vaccine manufacture. Licensed vaccines must meet statutory and regulatory requirements for quality manufacturing control. You heard this in the introduction earlier this morning. All vaccines must be safe, pure, and potent, and manufacturing and facilities must be in compliance with applicable standards. But also, sufficient information must be provided for vaccines that will be used under emergency use authorization to ensure vaccine quality and manufacturing consistency. As you've also heard many times today, COVID-19 vaccine development may be accelerated based on knowledge, it may be accelerated, and some of that acceleration may be based on knowledge gained from similar products manufactured with the same well-characterized platform technology. What this means is that some aspects of manufacturing control may be based on the vaccine platform. But I want to stress at the very start here that any CMC data that will not be available at the time of licensure or at the time of an EUA issuance must be discussed with the FDA in advance, sufficiently justified, and judged to have minimal impact on product quality. In the next two slides, I'm going to give a few key expectations uh, for licensure of COVID-19 vaccines. 
this is just a brief uh, high-level uh, uh, overview of some of these expectations. Much more detail is provided in the guidance that was put out in June. Uh, and so you can look there for uh, more details on all of these aspects. But what we would expect for a COVID-19 vaccine is complete details of the manufacturing process. This includes history of process development, capturing all changes incorporated into the manufacturing process, uh, information documenting ad adequate control of all source material, and establishment of a quality control system for all stages of manufacturing. We would also expect validation of the manufacturing process. Uh, this includes data to support consistency of the manufacturing process across all manufacturing sites. We would expect the establishment of a quality control unit. Uh, this particular demonstration that quality release tests, including key tests for vaccine purity, identity, and potency are suitable for their intended purpose and validated. A uh, few more expectations. Uh, we would expect the establishment of comprehensive stability program, uh, including the demonstration of final container stability and expiry date, and demonstration that the vaccine potency is maintained throughout expiry. Uh, we would expect compliance with all applicable standards for manufacturing sites, including validation of major utilities and qualification of all equipment, validation of aseptic cleaning and sterilization processes, establishment of a quality control unit that has responsibility for the oversight of manufacturing. And the last one that I have listed is establishment of a lot release protocol for product distribution. Next, I'm going to turn to emergency use authorization. Uh, this slide just uh, gives a high-level overview of some of our considerations. To enable FDA to conduct a meaningful review, an emergency use authorization request for a COVID-19 vaccine must include CMC data, identification of the manufacturing sites, and information with respect to current GMP. It is critical that adequate manufacturing information be provided to ensure the quality and consistency of EUA vaccines. The manufacturing and process control data will need to be submitted in advance of an EUA request. Uh, the CMC information and data that we would expect and it would be needed to support the use of a COVID-19 vaccine under EUA are generally similar to that needed for licensure. In the next two slides, I'm going to once again just highlight some of the key expectations. Again, these are provided in much more detail in the recently released guidance document earlier this month. Uh, so this is sort of a high-level overview. Uh, I, you'll notice italics in some of the uh, bullets that follow in this slide and the next slide, and all that means is that these are, I put them in italics just to sort of point out some slight differences with the licensure process. But here are some of the key expectations from our guidance document. For an EUA application, uh, we would expect, again, complete details of the manufacturing process. We would expect validation of the manufacturing process. We would expect establishment of a quality control unit. Uh, we would also expect a stability plan that includes tests for product safety, quality, and potency, <laughs> and stability data from all available developmental and clinical lots to support the use under EUA. This stability data would be necessary to support investigational use of the product under EUA. Uh, we would also, okay, uh, I want to say that expectations for manufacturing facilities will be similar to those for licensure. This was brought up earlier this morning in one of the questions, uh, and it's true that the inspection process is technically applies to the licensure process, but as I've already pointed out a couple of slides ago, we have made it clear that we expect at the time of a submission for an EUA application that all manufacturing sites be identified as well as their uh, GMP compliance status. And what we are expecting to do is that we will have uh, GMP compliance assessed using site visits and other submitted information to ensure that the products in the manufacturing facilities uh, are GMP compliant. And finally, the last one that I've listed is that the appropriate quality specifications established for all drug products used, lots used under EUA and testing results 
would be submitted at the time of vaccine distribution. The reason I mentioned this one is because the FDA regulation for lot release does not apply to educational products, including those distributed in a Oh, I'm back. Okay. The reason for this, the pointing this out, is because the lot, even though the lot release of the FDA regulation for lot release doesn't does not apply to investigational drugs, uh, we expect to obtain essentially the same information uh, in other ways. And I'll summarize in the last slide uh, this entire presentation uh, about CMC considerations for licensure and emergency use authorization. A manufacturing process that ensures product quality and consistency is necessary whether a vaccine is considered for licensure or for use under EUA. The CMC expectations will be the same for all COVID-19 vaccines, but the manufacturing and control data are going to be unique for each product and each production process. And finally and importantly, the confidence and reproducibility of safety and efficacy results from pivotal clinical trials depends on the establishment and maintenance of high standards of vaccine quality control and manufacturing. Uh, I'll stop there. Uh, hopefully we made up a few minutes. I can either take questions now or I guess we could wait until after the next presentation on clinical considerations. That's up to you, Dr. Monto. Right. And thank you, Dr. Weir, for making up the time. I think it would be most efficient if we wait for questions until after Dr. Fink's talk. So we'll go ahead and uh, hear from Dr. Doran Fink about the clinical considerations of licensure and emergency use. Dr. Fink. Thank you, Dr. Monto. So I want to start off uh, by repeating something that you've heard several times today. And that is in the context of the worldwide effort currently underway to develop safe and effective vaccines to address the COVID-19 pandemic as quickly as possible, CBER is committed to ensuring that COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective by relying on sound science, established regulatory standards, and transparent decision-making in our review of COVID-19 vaccine candidates. We need to make sure that we're doing these things to ensure that any COVID-19 vaccine approved or authorized for widespread use will be safe and will have a meaningful impact on the pandemic. But just as importantly, we need to ensure public trust and confidence in COVID-19 vaccines and vaccines in general. And you heard some of the concerns uh, expressed by the public in uh, the presentation by the uh, people from Reagan Udall. So to ensure transparency about our processes and our decision making, we've released two guidance documents that you've heard about several times today and that are included in the briefing package. Now in this presentation, what I'm going to do is to summarize and explain what we consider to be the most important clinical considerations from these guidance documents to inform the committee's discussion. First, I'll cover clinical data to support licensure of COVID-19 vaccines as laid out in our June guidance. Then I will talk about clinical data to support emergency use authorization of COVID-19 vaccines as detailed in the guidance document released earlier this month. And then I will end the presentation with a discussion of continued evaluation of COVID-19 vaccines following either licensure or EUA, borrowing from both guidance documents. To lay the ground rules, I want to remind the committee and the public that CBER has an expectation for randomized, blinded, placebo-controlled trials to provide direct evidence that a vaccine protects against SARS-CoV-2 infection and or disease. We can Consider that such trials should be feasible given the current COVID-19 disease epidemiology. And also, understanding of how vaccine-elicited immune responses might predict protection is currently too limited to infer vaccine effectiveness from immune responses alone in the absence of clinical data providing direct evidence of protection. 
In our guidance document, we've stated that clinical trials to support licensure should enroll adequate numbers of subjects representing populations most affected by COVID-19. These include racial and ethnic minorities, elderly individuals, and individuals with comorbidities associated with increased risk of severe COVID-19. We've also stated that it's important to examine safety and effectiveness data in previously infected individuals because, in practice, pre-vaccination screening for prior infection is unlikely to occur. There are a variety of effectiveness endpoints that could be evaluated in phase three trials for COVID-19 vaccines. Most of the trials underway currently are evaluating COVID-19 disease of any severity. However, most of these trials also include endpoints related to more severe COVID-19 disease and also SARS-CoV-2 infection, whether or not symptomatic. We have recommended standardized case definitions to be used in pre-specified analyses for both disease of any severity and also severe disease. However, we have not specified any requirement or preference for a specific endpoint to be used in the primary analysis of vaccine effectiveness. Again, most of the studies currently underway are using disease of any severity as the primary endpoint uh, to be analyzed. Now, we have released what we consider to be minimal criteria to support the effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines. But before I get into what those criteria are, I want to spend this slide explaining why we've set this standard. The reason we consider such a standard to be important is because widespread deployment of a weakly effective COVID-19 vaccine could result in more harm by good, or sorry, more harm than good. It could do so by providing a false sense of security that interferes with measures to reduce SARS-CoV transmission, such as wearing of masks and other PPE and social distancing. It could interfere with development and evaluation of potentially better vaccines that could have a greater impact on the pandemic. And it could potentially allow for even less effective vaccines to be deployed based on meeting non-inferiority criteria for relative effectiveness, a phenomenon known as biocreep. Without sufficiently stringent criteria, a COVID-19 vaccine candidate could be declared effective just by chance. And the risk of declaring a weakly effective vaccine and deploying a weakly effective va vaccine uh, increases as the number of vaccines being evaluated in phase three trials increases. So here's the standard that we've outlined. What we've said is that the success criteria for primary vaccine efficacy endpoint analysis to support licensure of the COVID-19 vaccine includes that the point estimate for vaccine efficacy versus a placebo comparator should be at least 50%. And the appropriately alpha adjusted confidence interval lower bound should be at least 30%. Now, these are what we consider to be minimum criteria. Clearly, it would be great if a vaccine could be demonstrated to be much more effective. And we certainly wouldn't argue with development programs that are designed to show that vaccines are more effective than these minimum criteria. We've also outlined that secondary efficacy endpoint analyses to further inform protective effect and to be described in vaccine labeling could be tested against a less stringent lower bound, greater than 0%. However, this testing would be contingent upon meeting the primary endpoint criteria first. We also recognize that there are some populations for which it may not be feasible to directly demonstrate vaccine effectiveness using a clinical disease endpoint. For example, pediatric populations where the attack rate of symptomatic COVID-19 disease is much lower than in adults. And so for these populations, following direct demonstration of protection 
in another population, for example, adults, as are currently being evaluated in ongoing phase three trials, effectiveness of the same vaccine could be inferred in a second population by immunobridging. This immunobridging approach would be based on comparison of one or more immune response biomarkers between populations using pre-specified criteria and presumes that disease pathogenesis and mechanism of protection in each population are similar. Turning now to data to support safety of a licensed COVID-19 vaccine, I want to reiterate that our general expectations are no different than those for safety data that have supported licensure of other preventive vaccines. And this includes a safety database of at least 3,000 subjects in relevant age groups exposed to the vaccine regimen intended for licensure. So just to be clear, uh, a safety database of at least 3,000 younger adults and at least 3,000 elderly subjects. We don't anticipate any issues with meeting this standard for COVID-19 vaccines that are currently in phase three trials. These trials are enrolling substantially larger databases and will have a placebo control group as well. Our guidance document goes into additional details about safety uh, data needed to support licensure. For sake of time, I'm not going to go into those details right now. There are some additional considerations that are important to the benefit risk assessment for a COVID-19 vaccine because these considerations may have limited data to address them at the time of a successful case-driven interim or final efficacy analysis. We may know very little at the time of, of a successful efficacy analysis about the durability of protective immunity elicited by the vaccine, the effectiveness of the vaccine against the most severe and clinically significant manifestations of COVID-19, the potential risk of enhanced respiratory disease associated with waning of vaccine-elicited immunity, as well as limited longer-term safety follow-up. And therefore, even following a successful efficacy analysis that meets our pre-specified criteria, additional follow-up would still be warranted to further inform the benefit risk assessment for licensure as well as to inform labeling. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the last third of my presentation. I'm going to turn now from licensure to emergency use authorization. As you've heard earlier today, an emergency use authorization for a COVID-19 vaccine may be requested to allow for the vaccine's rapid and widespread deployment for administration to millions of individuals, including healthy people. And in this scenario, a determination that a COVID-19 vaccine's benefits outweigh its risks would require data from at least one well-designed phase three clinical trial that demonstrates the vaccine safety and effectiveness sufficient to support such widespread use. I wanna make sure that everyone understands that as with vaccine licensure, Issuance of an emergency use authorization would specify use only in those populations for which the available data support favorable benefit risk. Just as with licensure, an EUA request for a COVID-19 vaccine may be supported by a case-driven interim analysis from one or more clinical trials. However, this type of case-driven interim analysis may come very quickly with the large clinical trials currently underway, especially if attack rates are very high. So to support a favorable benefit risk determination, again, taking into account that we're contemplating the potential rapid and widespread depl deployment millions of individuals, including healthy people, we consider that vaccine effectiveness to support issuance of an EUA should first of all demonstrate direct evidence of protection against SARS-CoV-2 infection or disease, 
And secondly, should demonstrate a vaccine efficacy point estimate of at least 50% versus placebo with an appropriately also adjusted confidence interval lower bound of greater than 30%. You'll see that these are the exact same criteria that we consider necessary to support vaccine licensure. But meeting these efficacy criteria is not the only information that goes into a benefit risk assessment. Additionally, analyses intended to support issuance of an EUA should ensure that vaccine effectiveness is assessed during the time period when adaptive and memory immune responses, rather than innate responses, are mediating protection. These are the type of responses that would be most relevant to the vaccine having an impact on the pandemic. The analyses should also allow for early assessment of waning protection and potentially associated risk of enhanced respiratory disease. And finally, they should ensure adequate safety follow-up to inform a benefit risk determination. So taking these considerations into account, what we've outlined our, in our guidance document is that we consider a median of two months to be the minimum follow-up duration that could support a favorable benefit risk determination to issue an emergency use authorization for a COVID-19 vaccine. And just to be clear, what this means is at least 50% of participants will have two months of follow-up for both safety and effectiveness following completion of the full vaccination regimen. To explain a little bit further the safety considerations that informed um, our selection of a two-month median follow-up duration, Historically, uncommon but clinically significant adverse events plausibly linked to vaccines, uh, for example, immune-mediated adverse reactions, generally have onset within six weeks following vaccination. And therefore, the median follow-up duration of two months allows time for potential immune-mediated adverse reaction to be observed and evaluated. Taking these safety considerations into account, as well as considerations around timing of protective immunity that I discussed in the previous slide, we've advised vaccine manufacturers conducting phase three clinical trials that their timing of interim analyses for vaccine efficacy should account for these expectations for follow-up to support an EUA. Our EUA guidance has also described some additional expectations for safety data to support a benefit risk assessment. First, we expect that phase three safety data will include a high proportion of enrolled subjects numbering well over 3,000 vaccine recipients who have been followed for serious adverse events, adverse events of special interest uh, for at least one month after completion of the full vaccination regimen. For the large phase three trials, that are currently underway that enrolled subjects at a very rapid pace at the beginning of the trial, we do not expect this expectation to cause any problems. It's in the guidance more to cover a scenario for a relatively much smaller and or much more slowly enrolling clinical trial that might reach a successful efficacy analysis, for example, due to high attack rates. Secondly, we expect that solicited adverse reactions will be characterized in an adequate number of subjects in each of protocol-defined age cohorts. Thirdly, we expect sufficient cases of severe COVID-19 in, in placebo recipients, cases that have been collected in the same time frame as primary endpoint cases, so that we can assess the case splits between vaccine and placebo groups looking for signals of both vaccine effectiveness against severe disease and also for enhanced respiratory disease. In our guidance document, we mentioned five cases in the placebo group as being generally sufficient to meet this expectation. However, in cases where the vaccine efficacy point estimate and lower bound are both exceptionally high and there are no severe cases in the vaccine group, fewer than five cases may be acceptable. Finally, we have requested that all safety data accumulated from phase one and two studies conducted with the vaccine, focusing on serious 
adverse events, adverse events of special interest in cases of severe COVID-19 also be included in an EUA submission. This is important because these data from studies that were initiated early, earlier will include longer duration of follow-up. For the last part of my talk, I'm going to discuss considerations for continued evaluation of COVID-19 vaccines following licensure or EUA. We've heard a number of more detailed talks from CDC and also FDA on the potential mechanisms uh, for conducting this type of continued evaluation. In terms of safety, it is inherently obvious that safety monitoring during rapid and widespread deployment of a COVID-19 vaccine will be needed to detect and evaluate adverse reactions that may be too uncommon to detect even in large clinical trials, apparent only after additional time to come to medical attention, or relevant to specific populations with limited safety data at the time of vaccine deployment. Populations such as pregnant women, persons with prior SARS-CoV-2 infection, or individuals with immunodeficiency conditions. In terms of effectiveness, longer-term data on COVID-19 outcomes following licensure or EUA would further characterize duration of protection, determine vaccine effectiveness in populations not included in the initially authorized or approved use, further evaluate effectiveness against specific aspects of SARS-CoV-2 infection or disease, such as disease transmission, investigate immune biomarkers that might predict protection, and finally, further assess the theoretical risks of enhanced respiratory disease and other potentially immune-mediated complications following vaccination and subsequent exposure to SARS-CoV-2. We consider that evaluation of a COVID-19 vaccine after licensure or EUA should occur through a combination of pharmacovigilance activities, including both active and passive safety monitoring during deployed use of the vaccine, continuation of blinded follow-up in ongoing placebo-controlled trials for as long as is feasible, and observational studies, including those that leverage healthcare claims data to evaluate safety and effectiveness outcomes. You heard about these types of observational studies in presentations given earlier in the day. Additionally, CBER may require post-licensure studies to address known or potential serious risks identified during review of a licensure application. To touch very briefly on passive safety monitoring, which you heard about from CDC, this will occur using established reporting mechanisms such as VAERS and direct reports to the vaccine manufacturer. What I'd like to highlight on this slide is that our EUA guidance directs that any EUA request for a COVID-19 vaccine should include a plan for active safety follow-up of persons vaccinated under the EUA. This active safety follow-up should monitor for deaths, hospitalizations, and other serious or clinically significant adverse events, and will be critical to inform ongoing benefit risk assessments for continuation of the emergency use authorization. I want to spend the last two slides talking about continuation of placebo-controlled trials. In our EUA guidance released earlier this month, we have stated that CBER does not consider issuance of an EUA for a COVID-19 vaccine in and of itself as grounds to immediately unblind ongoing cl clinical trials and offer vaccine to placebo recipients. The reason why we have made this statement is that a COVID-19 vaccine made available under an EUA will still remain investigational. As I've outlined in previous slides, safety and effectiveness data to support an EUA may be collected under a relatively short follow-up period a median of two months following completion of the vaccination regimen. Much shorter as compared with data that have supported licensure of other preventive vaccines, and shorter than the follow-up 
that we would expect to support eventual licensure of a COVID-19 vaccine. Therefore, continuation of placebo-controlled follow-up after emergency use authorization will be important and may actually be critical to ensure that additional safety and effectiveness data are accrued to support submission of a licensure application as soon as possible following an emergency use authorization. Given these considerations, a discussion of the conditions and the timing that would make unblinding of an ongoing clinical trial imperative deserves careful thought and attention, as does consideration of the possible mechanisms that could be used to replace loss of such follow-up. Once a decision is made to unblind an ongoing placebo-controlled trial, that decision cannot be walked back, and that controlled follow-up is lost forever. We do recognize that following issuance of an EUA, there will be interest among study participants to receive vaccine under the EUA. And therefore, any EUA request for a COVID-19 vaccine should include strategies to ensure follow-up in ongoing clinical trials and to handle loss of follow-up due to withdrawal of participants, including those who withdraw in order to seek vaccination under the EUA. I would also like to note that availability of a licensed vaccine does not automatically preclude continuation of blinded placebo-controlled trials. Specifically, in populations for which the licensed vaccine is not yet approved for use, and in populations for which the licensed vaccine is not sufficiently available to address public health needs. However, we do acknowledge that situations will likely arise where it is no longer ethically permissible and therefore no longer feasible to continue placebo-controlled follow-up in an ongoing trial or to initiate a placebo-controlled trial. In those situations, if widespread availability of a licensed COVID-19 vaccine precludes use of a placebo comparator, then the licensed vaccine could be used as a comparator to evaluate relative vaccine efficacy of other vaccines, testing the confidence interval lower bound against a non-inferiority margin. These types of non-inferiority trial designs require much larger uh, sample sizes than placebo-controlled trials. And so feasibility will certainly be an issue. But there may be innovative and novel uh, clinical trial designs that could help to reduce the size of such trials. We are also aware that uh, there is interest in inferring effectiveness of a vaccine solely from comparison of immune responses between vaccines, i.e. comparing a new vaccine to one that has directly been demonstrated to be effective. However, such an approach would require further discussion as currently the understanding of mechanism of protection is too limited to support this approach. That's the end of my talk and I will open it up to any questions. Thank you, Dr. Fink. Very intriguing presentation, raising many questions. And uh, what I would like to start our question period with is a question about what the advantage of seeking an emergency use authorization would be given the fact that the primary outcome is the same and a corollary if somebody does get emergency use authorization how then do they get full licensure thank you for that question so i did outline in my presentation several differences in the data that would be expected to support emergency use authorization versus the data that would be expected to support licensure. 
mainly related to duration of follow-up. Um, in terms of safety data, we typically require uh, a uh, reasonably sized safety database with at least six months of follow-up to support licensure. We would not have any different expectation for COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, for an emergency use, use authorization that is intended to address an ongoing public health emergency, what we've outlined is that uh, a conclusion of favorable benefit risk could be made based on meeting the same standard for vaccine effectiveness that would support licensure, but with an abbreviated follow-up for both safety and effectiveness. Um, the abbreviated follow-up for effectiveness, I think, is, is equally important. At the time of an interim analysis, we may see a point estimate uh, that is very high. In fact, the point estimate uh, would have to be high in order for a smaller number of cases to meet our uh, uh, requested success criterion for the lower bound um, around that point estimate. Um, however, because of the relatively smaller number of cases, the confidence interval would be very broad. Uh, and so additional follow-up to uh, further define uh, and uh, get more certainty in vaccine effectiveness uh, would be another important consideration separating uh, uh, the data used to support emergency use authorization versus those data that would eventually be submitted to support vaccine licensure. And uh, if there is emergency use authorization, then the longer follow-up, et cetera, would be required to get licensure as long as the studies continue or some studies continue to be blinded, correct? We, we have advocated for a continuation of blinded follow-up in the ongoing trials, that's correct. And that could re re uh, result in full licensure, getting a BLA. That is correct. Okay, Dr. Carella. Thank you, Arnold. I have, I actually have one, I have one question for, for Jerry and one question for Doran. So the, the question for Jerry is with regard to CMC requirements, can you, can, can you, can you briefly outline what a, what a BLA would contain that is not, you would not expect for the EUA? What extra would you be getting? That, that's my question for you. And then for, for, for Doran, uh, did you consider at all the, the possibility of an expanded access protocol for those specific groups that you would issue the indication for the EUA instead of an EUA? You want me to go first since that was yours, yours to me was the first question? Um, as I pointed out somewhere in the talk, uh, the CMC expectations are very similar for uh, EUA use or licensure. There are some differences, though. I'll give you one quick example. Uh, you may have noticed that I mentioned uh, something about stability. Uh, it's when a, for example, when a manufacturer comes in and licenses a product, by that time they have enough data to support a shelf life or an expiry date of whatever period of time. Uh, under emergency use, we don't expect to have that much information. We only want to know that, uh, for because as Doran pointed out, it's still under investigational use. We want to have enough stability data to ensure that it's being used as under EUA, that it is stable for that period. But that would be one sort of not subtle difference difference between what we would expect in licensure and uh, versus a product under EUA. So there are a few things like that. I mentioned the inspection program is some slight differences. The uh, uh, the lot release protocols and uh, process is a little bit different. So there's some, some differences like that, but generally the expectations are very similar. Over and door. Yeah, so to, to answer your question about an expanded access protocol, that, that is another regulatory mechanism for providing access to uh, investigational vaccines. 
I think if we were to consider an expanded access protocol of the same size and scope as what is being considered uh, for uh, an emergency use authorization, then the benefit risk considerations and the data to uh, inform those benefit risk considerations and, and allow that, that type of use uh, would be highly similar. The differences uh, between expanded access use and emergency use authorization are that expanded access use is done uh, or is, is carried out under FDA's investigational new drug regulations. And so, um, among many other things, those regulations require uh, use of an institutional review board and also uh, obtaining informed uh, consent uh, from uh, recipients of the investigational vaccine uh, according to regulations for clinical investigations, uh, research uh, use of investigational vaccines. Uh, and so operationally speaking, uh, an expanded access protocol would add uh, some complexities. Uh, and that is uh, why emergency use authorization is being uh, considered primarily as the mechanism for uh, addressing the public health emergency that has been declared. Okay, Dr. Nortrangelo. Thank you. Uh, uh, my questions are actually for Dr. Fink. Thank you very much, Dr. Fink, for a very clear presentation. I really appreciated it. Uh, so you clearly mentioned the issuance of an EUA would not represent grounds for unblinding uh, ongoing clinical trials. At the same time, one could imagine that those individuals, those subjects who volunteer in these trials, um, obviously have an interest in vaccine development. And so they might easily withdraw. A proportion of them might withdraw. Is this a matter of concern and what strategies are you anticipating in order to keep a sufficient number of individuals enrolled in placebo-controlled trials? And the second question is about the bridging, immunobridging that you mentioned when you refer to inferring data from the adult population or the pediatric population, which is an important issue because, of, as you mentioned, we are not enrolling in any of the trials a sufficient number of minors. Now, the problem with minors is that, uh, as you all know, uh, MIC is uh, another different manifestation of the disease, which you don't see or you see in a much smaller proportion in adults. So inferring data from adult to kids might not be necessarily um, a good thing to do unless we have uh, proven efficacy and safety of the vaccine also in not eliciting an MIC condition. I'd like you to comment on this as well. Thank you. All right. So uh, first of all, with regards to uh, uh, mitigating the risk of, of dropout from ongoing clinical trials, uh, we, we do share that concern. Um, I don't have any uh, specific remedies to offer uh, at this time. We have asked the, the vaccine manufacturers uh, and the other government agencies who are involved in conducting these trials to, to think carefully about um, how they would ensure clinical trial retention. Uh, and so uh, we, would, we would like to hear from them uh, in the EUA submissions that, that we might get. Uh, in terms of pediatric development, uh, we do recognize that uh, there is still uh, a lot to be understood about the pathogenesis of, of MISC and uh, what differences there may be uh, in COVID-19 uh, disease manifestations uh, comparing uh, pediatrics uh, versus adult populations. Uh, for the time being, uh, we have considered that uh, adolescents are sufficiently similar physiologically to adults. And uh, in general, uh, we have a, an established paradigm, uh, an established framework of age de-escalation uh, once there is uh, enough uh, data, in including both clinical and non-clinical data from animal studies to support a prospect of benefit uh, in pediatric populations, as well as sufficient uh, safety data in adults uh, to reasonably understand the potential risks in pediatric populations. And so 
Uh, we have been advising uh, vaccine manufacturers and their development programs uh, to at least uh, start with consideration of enrolling adolescents uh, in clinical trials and uh, then further considerations for lowering uh, the age groups uh, involved in vaccine development can proceed. Dr. Offit. Yes, thank you. I, I think, I think first of all, thank you both Doran and, and Jerry for excellent presentations. I have a much better understanding now of what I think are largely the subtle differences between the EUA and a sort of BLA licensure application for this vaccine. So I think, and it sort of underlines to me what I think is our problem. I think we have a language problem. I think when people hear the term emergency use authorization, what they hear is not necessarily an approved or authorized product. They hear a permitted product which is to say that you are permitted to use it as you would any investigation of your drug or phase one product, which is a very low bar. So, so hydroxychloroquine was permitted for use. I mean, convalescent plasma was permitted for use, even though neither worked. That's not what we've been talking about for the last few hours. What we've been talking about for the last few hours are large prospective placebo-controlled trials of 30,000 to 60,000 people, where we plan to include all groups for whom we would eventually use this product, including you know, the elderly, those with different racial or ethnic backgrounds, uh, people with various medical conditions, because we want to make sure that we have data in each of those groups that allows us to say we can then recommend these vaccines for that group. So the kinds of sort of CMC subtle differences that, that uh, Jerry was talking about are the, the, the more subtle sort of clinical differences that you were talking about are not huge. I mean, the, the, you know, this is much, much, much closer what is typically a BLA licensure process than it is to how at least the public, or frankly I, perceive an EUA process. So I think we need to make that clear, I think not just to the, to the general public, but to the medical public as we move forward what it is, the, 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 what I think is a, a relatively high standard that we're holding these vaccines to. I mean, these vaccines are about to be given to a lot of healthy young people who are unlikely to die from this, this uh, virus, which is why you got the kinds of uh, uh, comments that you saw through Susan and Chris earlier. They, the people think that there are critical safety guidelines or, or efficacy guidelines for being curtailed, but that's really not the story. I, I just, I wish we could get use of the word, rid of the word EUA. I was going to make the recommendation, let's just do it through a BL, BLA and, and licensure process, but I see there are subtle differences that would make us make it so that we couldn't do that, at least not initially. Am I right in, 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 this, in this perception? Yeah, th thank you. I, I, I think you you um, you describe the considerations very well. And um, yes, some of these differences are subtle, but but some of them are are not so subtle in terms of timing. Um, and so, what what an EUA could accomplish would be to make a vaccine that has been vetted by very stringent criteria um, available much sooner than would be possible uh, with a with a BLA. Uh, with, with licensure. Um, and so I, that I think is, is a key message is that the, the evaluation criteria uh, remain very stringent, um, but it, it does allow access sooner to address the pandemic. Yeah, but see, I think that's Dr. Offit, I think, I, I think, I, I think this is something we're going to have a lot of time to talk about okay. during that's our fine. our discussion. I agree with you totally. Uh, I, that's why I asked my question about how different it is. And uh, my concern also is that with uh, issues of continued blinding, that something that is given an EUA will never be able to get a BLA because of uh, various issues. Any further, before I, before I recognize the next uh, question or any, any further I, uh, comments, Jerry? I was just going to say that Paul got the point about why we considered uh, what we were asking for very important. That was all. Okay, next is Dr. Meisner. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Dr. Ware and, and Dr. Fink. I um, am much more reassured after hearing uh, your presentation. So, so, so thank you for that. I have two questions that I would like to ask. The first question is, why did you select a 50% efficacy 
point for the vaccine. We know, for example, that last year's influenza vaccine overall effectiveness among all age groups and all strains was 39%. And in view of the very large burden of disease, the argument is made that if there are 30 or 40,000 infection, influenza infections in the United States each year, then a 39% reduction in the burden of disease is, is quite large and desirable. Then, if, if I may, I'd like to ask you a second question that's a, a little bit uh, more complicated. The, um, I agree strongly with the need for vaccine for children. I'm a pediatrician. Um, we, we definitely need uh, a vaccine for children. But, the, but I agree with the position that I, I think the FDA is taking, is that COVID-19 in most children is not a severe disease. And I looked up the hospitalization rates this morning from uh, COVID-19. And for children 5 to 17 uh, years of age, it's 0 0.9. And last year, for influenza, the hospitalization rate was 42.1 per 100,000. So COVID-19 in children is much less a severe disease than, uh, than, than influenza. And in terms of hospitalizations, mortality rates are higher for influenza than for COVID-19 in uh, children. And I'm frankly a little concerned that Pfizer has gone down to 12 years of age because we know Miss C does occur between 12 and 20 years of age. And some recent data has shown that the S protein has superantigen activity, that is, it can bind directly to T cells and stimulate a very brisk immune response. And so I worry, I think before we move to children, I think we need a very solid uh, database regarding the safety of this vaccine uh, in, in, in older adults. Over. Yeah, th thank you for your questions. Uh, so first of all, to address the 50% the point estimate, which of course is, is accompanied by the 30% lower bound, uh, we, we chose those numbers uh, based on a balance of what we thought uh, would be reasonable and, and feasible to, to achieve, um, also taking into account uh, uh, standards that we've used for, for other vaccines, such as, as influenza uh, vaccine, um, and balance, tried to balance that with uh, uh, what we thought would be needed to, to actually make an impact. And, and yes, in a, in a scenario where uh, there are many, many cases of disease. A, a vaccine that um, is not strongly effective could potentially still make an impact, but I outlined a number of reasons why um, a very weakly effective vaccine uh, could do more harm than good. And the criteria that we came up with, we thought uh, were a good balance of both what was feasible and what was necessary to ensure that a vaccine that turns out to be only very weakly protective uh, does not actually get deployed based on a chance finding in a clinical trial. Um, with regards to the, the flu example that you mentioned, um, I think it's also important to note um, that vaccine effectiveness that we see from season to season uh, is you know, based on real world conditions. Um, our influenza vaccine guidance um, uh, does specify a lower bound of, of at least 40% or greater than 40% uh, for, for vaccine efficacy to support licensure of, of seasonal influenza vaccines. And this would be consistent with uh, usual observations that um, efficacy point estimates in per protocol uh, analysis populations in uh, clinical trials tend to be higher uh, than those uh, that we see in, in effectiveness studies 
uh, once the vaccine is, is used in, in the real world. Um, in terms of uh, uh, concerns about, about uh, pediatric uh, development, we, we do take those concerns uh, very seriously. Um, and I, I would turn it back to, to you and, and maybe other members of the committee uh, to, to ask what, what sort of safety data do you think uh, would be necessary uh, to support uh, uh, progression of, of pediatric development, uh, especially down into younger age groups. Uh, certainly recognizing that, that the younger age groups are, are not the top priority at this time for addressing the, the pandemic. Thank you. Yes, I, I can offer a comment. The, uh, in the paper in the New England Journal uh, a couple of months ago regarding MIST-C in, um, in children uh, in New York State, and uh, at a time when SARS-CoV-2 was pretty widely circulating, the rate of, of MIST-C was two cases per 100,000 children under, or 100,000 people under 20 years of age. So to me, we've got to be very sure that these vaccines do not elicit a, an, uh, an adverse reaction that may be delayed. Um, Missy seems to be three, four, maybe five weeks afterwards, and, and so I think uh, two months is is a reasonable time, but I worry that that the 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 vaccines that contain the S protein, which most of them do, I think, um, in genetically predisposed children may elicit a very troublesome reaction. And because disease is, is generally quite mild, yes, there are deaths in children, yes, children do get hospitalized, do get quite sick, but relatively speaking, it's a very mild disease. And I think we have to be very sure about the safety of a vaccine in children. And I, I don't know, I can't tell you what, the, what number would, be necessary? It's such a difficult question. But I don't think we can directly um, transfer the information that, that you, uh, uh, I can't remember if it was you or Dr. Weir said earlier about um, zero bridging. I, um, if we get a... Dr. Miser, I, I apologize, oh, um, and Dr. Fink, we are really running out of time and we have to make sure that we yeah, get right. the OPH session right. on time. Right. Right. Let me Sorry. Let me make a proposal. Darn, you uh, agreed that we need to discuss this more. Would you be available when we start the uh, committee discussion later on? Because there are a lot of questions that are w still waiting and we need to move on. Absolutely. Very good. Then let's take a 10 minute break and then we go into the public comments. Dr. Monto? Yep. Please hold on. Please.
All right, welcome back from our break. Uh, I'd like to hand it back to Dr. Monto as we are about to start our OPH session. Dr. Monto? 
Welcome back and welcome to the open hearing session. Please note that both the Food and Drug Administration and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the open public hearing session of the advisory committee meeting, FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speaker, at the beginning of your pre uh, written or oral statement to advise the committee of any financial relationship that you may have with the sponsor, its product, and if known, its direct competitors. For example, this financial information may include the sponsor's payment of your travel, lodging, and other expenses in connection with your attendance at the meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your statement to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. Now over to Prop. Oh, hold on a second, Prabha. I'll make sure we unmute your phone there. Dr. Atreya, are you there? Yes, I am here. Can you Take it away. Me? Yes, we do. Take it away. Okay. Okay. Do I have my webcam on? Yes, you do, ma'am. Thank you. Good. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just announcing uh, public speakers. Uh, first, we'll go with the. Ms. Katherine Jensen, take away. You have uh, five minutes to talk. With you today, my name. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Katherine Jensen, and I'm senior vice president and head of vaccine research and development at Pfizer. In this position, I oversee a global vaccine research and development organization with responsibilities ranging from discovery to registration and post-market evaluation of vaccines to prevent diseases of significant unmet medical need like meningitis B and pneumonia. I'm here today representing more than 1,000 researchers, clinicians, statisticians, and regulatory experts, and many more colleagues across Pfizer and our partner BioNTech who are working on delivering a potential breakthrough vaccine against COVID-19. We always recognize that safe, effective, and high-quality vaccines are important and now more urgent than ever to provide protection against COVID-19. To briefly orient you to our COVID-19 program, we have made a conscious decision to evaluate multiple RNA vaccine candidates to address speed of development and a broad immune response to select the one candidate with the best safety, tolerability, and immunogenicity profile. From day one, we knew that the selection would be data-driven with an emphasis on clinical data. We have been working closely with regulatory authorities, including the FDA, to progress our program while ensuring that safety and maintaining the highest standards in our development process is our top priority. We have the utmost respect for the FDA and all regulatory authorities and support them in the evaluation of our program. Considering the public health challenge that COVID-19 presents, they are taking a thoughtful approach to regulatory requirements to expedite development without ever compromising vaccine safety or efficacy. Right now, the world is looking to science, and specifically to vaccines, to bring us to the other side of this pandemic. With increasing levels of public concern about the scientific and regulatory processes to evaluate potential COVID-19 vaccines, I felt it was important to again make clear that science has guided and will always guide our efforts without compromise. We will never cut corners in our research development or manufacturing efforts to meet any artificial or arbitrary timelines. Science has overcome disease before, and it will again. It is our hope 
that mRNA vaccines become one of the tools in the fight against COVID-19. We look forward to hearing the discussion today at the FDA Burpack meeting. As always, Pfizer and BioNTech will support and meet or exceed the standards for safety, efficacy, and manufacturing that the agency adopts. Thank you so much for your time today. Okay, great. Thank you. We will move on to Ms. Jacqueline Miller. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jacqueline Miller, and I'm the head of infectious disease development at Moderna. I'm also a pediatrician who has spent the last 20 years of my career in vaccine development. I've had the pr privilege of addressing this committee previously, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with you again. Moderna is developing a candidate vaccine against COVID-19 called mRNA-1273. We've announced that we enrolled 30,000 participants, including 15,000 1273 and 15,000 placebo recipients in the pivotal phase three efficacy and safety trial called the COVE study. We want FDA, VRPAC, and the American people to know that Moderna is committed to rigorous scientific research and the highest quality standards. Transparency is essential to public trust. And that's why we posted our weekly enrollment progress published our phase one data when available in peer-reviewed journals, and we're the first company to post our full phase three study protocol. While I will not present data from our clinical trials today, I want to spend a moment speaking about messenger RNA or mRNA. This molecule is fundamental to the biology of every cell and serves as the blueprint for all protein synthesis. Our vaccine allows cells in our body to activate the immune system in the same way as if we were naturally infected by the virus but without the potential limitations of administering a live virus vaccine. In the case of mRNA-1273, the mRNA sequence instructs immune cells how to construct the spike protein that naturally occurs on the surface of the virus. These immune cells then learn to recognize the spike protein and develop immune responses against it, comparable to those seen in those who have recovered from COVID-19. It's important to note that mRNA does not enter the nucleus does not interact with a person's genes and is rapidly degraded by the normal mechanisms the body uses to dispose of its own mRNA. The manufacturing process is cell-free, does not use animal products, and does not contain preservatives. I want to also update you on our development program. Over 25,000 participants have received both doses of study vaccine or placebo. <laughs> The vaccine was designed in consultation with FDA and the NIH to evaluate Americans at the highest risk of severe COVID disease. And therefore, 42% of study participants are older adults and people with chronic diseases such as cardiac disease and diabetes mellitus. In addition, our study population represents U.S. demography, including communities of color who have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. 37% of our study population comes from communities of color, including 10% African American and 20% Hispanic participants. We're now accumulating data and preparing for study analyses. As cases of COVID-19 are reported by our study physicians, they're reviewed by an independent safety and data monitoring board, or DSMB. Formal efficacy analyses will be triggered when 151 cases have accumulated with two earlier interim analyses after 53 and 106 cases. As we've done throughout this process, Moderna will transparently share the outcomes of these analyses. While the study is ongoing, the DSMB will continue to monitor the safety of the participants on an ongoing basis. And ultimately, Moderna will determine whether or not to submit a dossier to FDA requesting emergency use authorization based on an assessment of whether the potential benefit of the vaccine outweighs the potential risks once the required two months of median safety follow-up have accrued. We look forward to hearing Verpac's recommendations about the handling of potential crossover vaccination for placebo recipients, since those participants are beginning to ask when they will know if they receive study vaccine or placebo. We intend to continue to generate data about mRNA-1273 through uh, the phase three protocol and beyond. We're currently planning the initiation of pediatric clinical trials and a collaboration with the National Cancer Institute to evaluate vaccine safety and immunogenicity in patients with cancer. We'll also conduct studies to better understand the duration of immunity. I would like to extend this opportunity to conclude with a heartfelt thank you on behalf of Moderna to the FDA for their guidance through this process 
to our collaborators at the NIH, the COVID-19 Prevention Network, BARDA, and Operation Warp Speed for their intellectual contributions and advice, to our CRO PPD, and most of all to the investigators and study participants who are the true heroes of this endeavor. Without the unselfish dedication of our clinical trial participants, none of this would be possible. Many thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. David Essayan. My name is David Essayan. I have no conflicts of interest with this topic and no one has paid for my attendance. Given the limited time available and out of respect for the committee and other meeting participants, I will limit my comments to a list of considerations for SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development and approval that require additional public discussion. Next slide. We must consider the mutation rate of the virus and the risk for escape mutants that may render a spike protein specific vaccine ineffective over time. These considerations include the potential benefits of multivalent or whole virus based vaccines and the need for genetic characterization of the virus in clinical trial patients who develop COVID-19 disease to determine whether it matches the vaccine gene sequence or whether it represents a new mutation. Next slide. We must consider the need for studies assessing long-term safety and efficacy, including an assessment for antibody-dependent enhancement, an assessment of the efficacy of vaccine in new vaccinees over time to address the concern for escape mutant mediated loss of efficacy, and rigorous pharmacovigilance to assess the duration of protection following vaccination. Next slide. We must consider the need for post-marketing safety monitoring and reporting, specifically addressing the frequency of reports and the need for comprehensive data collection, including active monitoring through a registry for early detection of rare adverse events and serious adverse events. We must also consider the need for an improved understanding of the immune response characteristics necessary for adequate antiviral protection, including the role of cell-mediated immunity. Next slide. We must address the lack of data in children and the need to consider the potential differential safety and efficacy of these hitherto unapproved vaccine technologies on the developing immune system. We must also address the lack of data in pregnant or nursing women, in the advanced elderly, and in immune compromised patients. Next slide. Finally, we must address the importance of conveying clear, science-based, objective, complete, and accurate data about vaccines to the American public and providing a public response to all questions in order to overcome vaccine hesitancy. We are happy to engage in further discourse on any of these topics. Thank you for this opportunity to address the committee. Great. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Annabel Decent Maurice. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Annabelle D. St. Maurice, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at UCLA. I've previously worked at CDC and published on vaccine hesitancy. Actually, hold on one second. Annabelle, hold on one second. Yeah. We just got to get you set up here. <laughs> you guys are no faster worries. than we are. Um, hold on a minute. <laughs> Annabelle, did you have a slide deck? I do not, know. OK. I'm somehow. All right, Annabelle, uh, take it away. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Annabelle D. St. Maurice, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at UCLA and have previously worked at CDC and published on vaccine hesitancy. I have no relevant conflicts of interest and no one has paid for my attendance. Given my limited time, I would like to focus my discussion on the importance of maintaining, maintaining confidence in vaccines. This year, I personally have seen an erosion of public trust in federal agencies and science. Anecdotally, patients, including healthcare workers, 
have been refusing influenza vaccine this year due to distrust, despite the importance of vaccination during COVID-19. More than ever, we really need to ensure that the vaccine process is transparent and communicated effectively, not just in scientific journals, but for the general public. The general public needs to understand how a COVID-19 vaccine was approved and understand the process of ensuring vaccine safety. We need to ensure transparency of data, the approval and authorization process, and continued safety monitoring to ensure public confidence in a vaccine. If a biological license application is not obtained, the reasons for this should be clearly delineated. At a minimum, the FDA must ensure that the criteria outlined in its October 20th guidance for industry on emergency use authorization is met. Disproportionately affected populations, including the elderly, African Americans, Latinx, and indigenous populations and individuals with chronic conditions should be pri prioritized and represented in clinical trials. This will help ensure public trust and confidence. We need to get this right to maintain vaccine confidence for future generations. Thank you for your work and for the opportunity to speak to the committee. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Next speaker is Dr. I'm sorry. Extension three one zero two six seven one one three three does not answer. UCLA voicemail. Hello? Hello, my name is... Go ahead. Hello, my name is Peter Doshi. Uh, hopefully you can see my title slide now. For identification purposes, yes. I... Okay, great. Uh, I'm on the faculty at the University of Maryland and a medical journal editor at the BMJ. I have no relevant conflicts of interest and no one's paid for my attendance. A copy of my slides is available on my faculty homepage. Uh, next slide, please. I've reviewed the FDA's guidances on COVID-19 vaccines and the four publicly released phase three trial protocol. My brief talk today aims to point out that unless urgent changes are made to the way the trials are designed and evaluated, we could end up with approved vaccines that reduce the risk of a mild infection, but do not decrease the risk of hospitalization, ICU use, or death, either at all or by a clinically relevant amount. The reason for this is that all trials are using a primary endpoint of COVID-19 of essentially any severity, such that even a mildly symptomatic person would qualify. For example, in the Moderna and Pfizer trials, somebody with a mild cough and positive lab test would meet the primary endpoint definition. Next slide, please. Permitting mild COVID cases to be counted as the primary endpoint will allow trials to complete quickly, but doing this will leave us without proof that the vaccine prevents serious complications of COVID. Simply preventing mild cases is not enough and may not justify the risks associated with vaccination. Additionally, without a definitive assessment of efficacy in the elderly and other subgroups at highest risk, we could be left with an approved vaccine that reduces mild cases in healthy people, but does little to protect the most vulnerable. Estimates are that it's somewhere around half of all deaths are occurring in nursing homes. We need the trials to find out which vaccines can save lives. Next slide, please. I think this issue has flown under the radar because most people assume severe COVID was what we were studying. The NIH, in fact, even said so in a press release about Moderna's trial. Next slide, please. Finally, please note the FDA and sponsors definition of severe COVID also needs revising because currently mild COVID-19 cases with the added single criterion of a blood oxygen saturation of 93% meets the definition. The problem here is that at least one in 20 normal asymptomatic older adults have an oxygen saturation of 92% or less. Low blood oxygen levels are arguably an important risk factor for severe disease, but they are not severe disease itself. 30 Final seconds. Slide, please. Most Americans assume our vaccine development process, in contrast to, say, Russia's, ensures that an approved vaccine can save lives, reduce hospitalizations, and ICU admissions. But unless we set the right primary endpoint in trials, we won't have hard evidence to know that is the case. Thanks for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, 
Okay, great. Thank you for your comments. So, Dr. Kaplan, Robert Kaplan. Hi, I'm Robert Kaplan. I am a faculty member at the Clinical Excellence Research Center at Stanford University. I'm also a former NIH Associate Director with responsibility for overseeing the behavioral and social sciences programs across the NIH institutes and centers. And I'm also a former Chief Science Officer at AHRQ. I have no conflicts of interest and nobody paid for my attendance. I want to talk to you today about vaccine hesitancy. Uh, although there are a lot of nuances in seroprevalence studies, Current estimates from Stanford suggest that only about 9% of the U.S. population uh, have neutralizing antibodies, or about 91% of the population may be um, at risk. And as has been mentioned several times today, if a vaccine is about 50% effective and the uptake rate is only about 50%, then about 75% of the population might remain unprotected. We're all in this together. Recently, our center has been doing a series of public opinion surveys in collaboration with UGov. Our most recent study that was completed around the 1st of April showed that about, only about 35% of the U.S. population reported being very likely to take a vaccine, with another 29% saying they're likely to take a coronavirus vaccine. A full um, one in five, or 20% of the U.S. population suggest they would not take a vaccine under any circumstances. And in response to another question, about 36% of the U.S. population endorsed a statement that said it's definitely or probably true that uh, vaccine harmful effects are not being disclosed to the public. Next slide. I think I've uh, missed a few uh, transitions. Um, so we should be on the slide that, that shows a series of, of uh, blue bars and histograms. Um, we know that the percentage that are likely to take the vaccine systematically increases with age, uh, I mean, sorry, with uh, education, with those completing more years of formal education being the most likely. But one of the findings, next slide, that um, has been reported less often is that the variables that we uh, find most influential are not necessarily demographic variables, but in fact are political ideologies. Our studies show that um, those who uh, describe themselves as very conservative and less trustful of government are least likely to say they would take a vaccine. I also want to point seconds. out, next, uh, next slide, that um, it, our results are quite consistent with a variety of other polls. Uh, this study from Bracken, for example, also shows systematic declines in likelihood of taking vaccine just over the last six months. Next slide. So in conclusion, uh, the Stanford YouGov uh, data shows increasing skepticism about a coronavirus vaccine. And this uh, hesitancy has been accelerating over the last few months. We believe that rushing an approval or an EUA could increase skepticism. There may be long-term consequences of a decision that precedes the evidence. So what can we do? Well, first of all, as has been mentioned several times today, more transparency. Time has come up and inclusive discussions that go beyond traditional demographic variables. And finally, we're in this together. We need to uh, achieve high vaccine participation through assurance that we have no, that there have been no shortcuts in establishing safety and efficacy. Thanks for uh, having me today. Okay, great. Next. Thank you. And uh, next speaker is Mr. Kerbit Kubitz. Hello. Uh, my first slide says, what is a good coronavirus vaccine, looking at it from overall public health and personal safety choices? Next slide. I'm 73 years old. In 1954, I was a polio pioneer in the stock vaccine trial. Next slide. The objectives of COVID-19 vaccination should be to protect widely public health through both direct protection and indirect protection. Next slide. My objectives are, what is my dominant anti-infection personal strategy? So far, I've been masking, shopping once a week, uh, social distancing. When would a vaccine change that? COVID vaccine, next slide, COVID vaccine evaluation is proceeding under an emergency use paradigm with safety from 30,000 participant studies, but it must be followed by effectiveness studies. Emergency use authorization with a benefit-risk ratio is appropriate, 
but uh, future vaccines should also get the benefit of EUA if early vaccines have less than 80% effectiveness. Efficacy is preliminary analysis. Effectiveness is, next slide, effectiveness is uh, protection in mass use, which would inform the public and the community about how well vaccines work. Uh, efficacy and vaccine uptake, as other people have commented, uh, interact. Next slide. Efficacy objectives of 50% may be affected by the number of degrees of freedom. That is, what if the placebo has 200 cases and the vaccinated trial has 50 cases, but that's affected by non pharmaceutical interventions like masking and distancing and would be 100. You don't know that until the masks and the social distancing come off. Next slide. Uh, so I need to know if a vaccine is 65% effective, is it working for me? I recommend consideration of uh, innovative uh, serology techniques. I have no connection with adaptive therapeutics, but I recommend their consideration of T cell response. And so uh, I thank you for your uh, uh, consideration, but follow-up is definitely limited. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay, great. Thank you so much. The next speaker is Dr. Andy Pavia. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Monto, and thank you, colleagues. I'm Dr. Andrew Pavia, and I'm Chief of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at the University of Utah. I'm presenting today as a member of the HIV Medicine Association, which is part of the Infectious Diseases Society of America. I have no relevant conflicts of interest, and no one has paid for my travel, which would be a trick over Zoom. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to offer comments regarding the FDA's consideration of the application and for sharing the guidance and the transparency that you've shown. HIVMA and IDSA would prefer that COVID-19 vaccines be approved through a BLA or biologics license application with the high standards that that would entail, given the importance of ensuring the safety and efficacy of the vaccine that is going to be given to hundreds of millions of healthy people. At a minimum, the FDA should ensure that the criteria outlined in its October 20th guidance uh, be met including full analysis of at least two months of safety and efficacy data and that the point estimate of 60% efficacy that Dr. Marston specified be the specified endpoint. Wide acceptance of COVID-19 vaccines will be critical to achieve vaccination rates that are necessary to stop the spread of SARS-CoV-2. As we've uh, heard many times, without high uptake, uh, no matter what the effectiveness of the vaccine is, there will be no effectiveness in stopping the pandemic. Therefore, we strongly recommend that a vote of support by FDA's Vaccine and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee be required before FDA consider uh, an authorization or a formal approval. Transparency is, of course, critical to building trust among the public, but also among the medical community. Most patients trust their own provider. And therefore, we feel it's a, uh, critical for FDA to share trial data with CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices prior to authorization or approval. The ASIP is a source that most practitioners trust and turn to for advice. Due to the varying endpoints across the vaccine studies from different sponsors, it will be important for the FDA and for VRPAC to evaluate and compare standardized endpoints to include severe disease and using standardized analyses across the vaccine candidates in a manner similar to what FDA has pioneered for, FDA therapeut for HIV therapeutics. In addition, uh, in considering a BLA or an EUA, clinical trial efficacy must be available at the time of decision on the efficacy of the vaccine candidates in the populations who've been most impacted by COVID-19, including the elderly, African-Americans, Latinx, and indigenous populations. Ten seconds. Lastly, if uh, a vaccine is made available through an EUA, FDA must ensure a strategy to continue uh, the collection of blinded data after the uh, issuance of an EUA. We're concerned that the practical and ethical issues will make it difficult to do this. And that's one more reason that a very high standard needs to be met 
not the minimum legal requirement for an EUA. Thank you very much for the opportunity to provide input, and thank you for the work that you're all doing. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Marcus Schabacher. Good afternoon. I'm an anesthesiologist and intensivist and affiliated associated professor at the Strict Medical School of Chicago and the president of, and CEO of ECRI. And on ECRI's behalf, I'm speaking today to you. Thank you for inviting me. I have no conflict of interest, financial or otherwise, to report. ECRI, a trusted voice in healthcare, is an independent, non-for-profit organization. Our mission is and has been for over 50 years to advance effective, evidence-based healthcare globally. Next two slides, please. We are here today with an urgent call for the review of completed clinical trial data to ensure the safety and effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines, a paramount consideration for understanding the risks and benefits of any of the vaccines under development. ECRI fears that unexpected events may occur if a vaccine is rolled out with rushed timelines and incomplete data. Vaccine trials can fall short of their aim because trial conditions are highly controlled and may not reflect real-world conditions and outcomes, especially now with so many unknowns about the coronavirus. Considering preliminary trial data for rapid vaccine development, deployment can introduce additional risks of bias substantial enough to invalidate the evaluation and therefore might not be justified even in the context of a pandemic. We ask the public and regulators and this uh, expert committee to be mindful of three key points. The Operation Warp Speed trials are well designed and should provide robust data, but only if completed as designed. Preliminary trial data are inherently unreliable and should not be used to support action when there's risk of harm. Number two, it is imperative that the first vaccines distributed in the US, and we have heard that numerous times today, be safe and effective, or we will risk losing the public's already diminished trust needed to control the spread of the virus. Deploying a safe but weak COVID-19 vaccine may actually worsen the pandemic if other public health measures are relaxed. And number three, as a science-based patient safety organization, we respectfully disagree with Dr. Fink and the FDA and appeal to you to demand a minimum of six months follow-up from the full trial cohort before EUA is considered. To control COVID-19, immunization must be conveyed to more than 50% of recipients and provide protection for at least six months to be useful in reducing the virus spread. Follow-up of at least six months is necessary to understand the risks of inadequate exposure and veining immunity to enrolled patients. Furthermore, interim analysis at earlier points is at risk of bias, such as demographic sampling imbalance, as mentioned earlier today by NIH's Dr. Marston. Next slide. After reviewing the limitations of COVID-19 vaccine testing and the potential harms that vaccines might cause, ECRIS recommends COVID-19 vaccine deployment only after thorough review of completed phase three trial data and under no circumstances should vaccines be authorized with fewer than six months of follow-up data from the full trial cohort. Additionally, up, we urgently ask for post-authorization comprehensive surveillance trials as such as discussed earlier today for all vaccinated individuals. Doing any less would simply risk too much and the consequences might be severe. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker is Dr. Sidney Wolf. Dr. Wolf? Yes. You, go ahead, Dr. Wolf, are you there? Yes. Go ahead. I'm Sydney Wolf, Dr. Sydney Wolf of the Public Citizen Health Research Group. I have no financial conflicts of interest. Next slide. Although there have been some recent additions to what's required for an emergency use authorization, they're still grossly inadequate. EUA efficacy standard is now potentially 50% greater or greater significant reduction 
of COVID-19 and vaccinated compared to placebo cases as it is for vaccine approval. And as you've heard before, EUA standards for chemistry manufacturing controls are now closer to those required for approval. But how much longer after the currently inadequate EUA requirements could be fulfilled would it take to complete the all-important phase three trials and for FDA and your advisory committee to review the data? These are just two major reasons why the currently allowable deficiencies impair any legitimate benefit risk evaluation. You've heard this before, but phrased in a slightly different but accurate way, EUA approval could occur when up to half of the participants in phase three trials have been followed for less than two months after completion of full vaccination. Safety data would include over 3,000 vaccine recipients. This is out of between 15,000 and 30,000 various trials followed for serious adverse events and events of special interest for as little as one month after completion of vaccination. The benefits, obviously, of using unfinished phase three data are faster availability of the vaccine, depending on how much time beyond whenever the EUA is, is filed or is able to be filed now to finish phase three studies. The risks are obviously incomplete safety and efficacy data because large phase three studies have not been finished and reviewed by the FDA and your committee. Saving time by a faster but riskier data deficient EUA pathway will surely be outweighed by the loss in public confidence in an incompletely tested, unapproved EUA vaccine accompanied by decreased willingness to be vaccinated. So the question for the advisory committee is, I think, straightforward. Based on incomplete phase three trials, will your advisory committee, and we're getting into confidence in this case of the, vac of the, of the advisory committee members, based on incomplete phase three trials, will your advisory committee have enough confidence, despite all this missing data, to recommend authorizing via an EUA any vaccine for use in tens of millions of people? The gap between completed phase three trials needed for approval and the current EUA standard exemplified by allowing half of phase three trial participants to be followed for less than two months after vaccination, vaccination does not engender confidence. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolf. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Diana Zuckerman. Uh, thank you. Are my slides up? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, go thank ahead. You. I'm Dr. Diana Zuckerman, president of the National Center for Health Research. Next slide. We scrutinize the safety and effectiveness of medical products, and we don't accept funding from companies that make those products, though I've personally inherited stock in j and My expertise is based on postdoctoral training in epidemiology uh, and as a faculty member and researcher at Vassar, Yale, and Harvard. I've also worked at HHS, the U.S. Congress, and the White House. Next slide. We've heard that the agencies are doing many things right, but the vaccine trials have serious design flaws. The standards set in FDA guidances and the study protocols make it likely that vaccines that, that will be authorized or approved won't achieve what the public and policymakers expect. Instead, these vaccines will only be proven to reduce the risk of mild infections but not proven to reduce the risk of hospitalization, ICU, or death. The major flaws are as follows. The FDA's proposed primary endpoint is defined as symptomatic COVID-19 that, that can include only one very mild symptom, such as a mild cough or sore throat, as long as the person has tested positive. The FDA's requirement of at least two months medium follow-up after vaccination or placebo is too short to study efficacy. Even if a person is exposed during that time, we don't know the correlates of protection, and so we need to, a longer follow-up to know how long an effective vaccine remains effective. We can't rely on post-market studies for that information because once a vaccine is on the market, many people in the placebo control group will switch to a vaccine. 
And we don't know whether diversity of study participants will be achieved in terms of age, race, or comorbidities, especially for those people who are exposed to the virus. Next slide. The requirement of at least five serious COVID-19 cases in the placebo group is completely inadequate for two reasons. Serious COVID-19 cases are too loosely defined and could include a case of mild COVID-19 if the patient has a blood oxygen saturation under 93%. But thousands of otherwise healthy Americans have levels below that. And even if the definition were more stringent, such as requiring hospitalization or death, and even if there were no such cases among the vaccinated patients, the absolute difference in disease between zero and five serious cases would not be clinically meaningful to individuals and could easily have occurred by chance. Next slide. The next one just shows the FDA guidance, so let's skip that and go to the, the last slide. In conclusion, the last slide with bullets, I should say, the American public has been told that life can go back to normal when we have a vaccine. It isn't FDA's job to achieve that overly optimistic goal for any vaccine but it is FDA's job to make sure that a vaccine Fine. has meaningful benefits for the health and lives of most Americans, and especially those most at risk. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you uh, for your comments. The next speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Duchin. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Dr. Jeff Duchin, Health Officer for Public Health, Seattle and King County, Washington and professor in medicine at the University of Washington. I'm speaking today as a member of the board of directors of the Infectious Diseases Society of America. I have no relevant financial relationships, conflicts, and no one has paid for my participation. The Infectious Disease Society, IDSA, prefers COVID-19 vaccines be approved through the traditional biologics licensure application. Short of that, FDA must ensure that the criteria outlined in its October 20th guidance for industry on emergency use authorization are met, including full analysis of at least two months of safety and efficacy data following the last dose. Public trust is critical to build vaccine confidence and for successful uptake of COVID-19 vaccine. Therefore, we strongly recommend that public deliberations and a vote of support by FDA's Vaccine and Related Biologics Products Advisory Committee, VERPAC, be required before authorization or licensure. IDSA emphasizes that clinical trial data on the use of a vaccine candidate with the populations who have been most impacted by COVID-19 must be available for BLA or EUA consideration. These populations include the elderly, Black, Latinx, Indigenous people, and those with chronic conditions. Transparency is critical to building trust among the public and the healthcare providers that the public will look to for advice on vaccination. We urge FDA to share vaccine trial data with CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices as soon as it is available to VERPAC and prior to a decision on authorization or licensure. The ACIT is the trusted authority that provides guidance on vaccines to our nation's healthcare providers. Their review and recommendations to healthcare providers regarding populations to be vaccinated, equity, and implementation considerations will be critical to a successful vaccination program. Before making COVID-19 vaccine available through an EUA, FDA must ensure the trial sponsor has outlined a feasible strategy for continuing the vaccine trial post-authorization, given the challenges continuing a trial after a product is available for public use. And due to the novel vaccine platforms and technologies being considered, we also recommend manufacturing facilities be inspected as part of the process of approving or authorizing a vaccine for COVID-19. And finally, yeah. IDSA would like to remind everyone that even after a COVID-19 vaccine is available, other COVID-19 prevention measures, including masking, physical distancing, improving ventilation, and hand washing will remain critical as vaccine uptake increases and we learn about long-term protection. 
Thank you for the opportunity to provide input on the approval or authorization of a COVID-19 vaccine needed to protect both Americans and persons worldwide. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Duchin. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Elizabeth Batalino. Hi, good afternoon. Batalino. I'm Beth Batalino. I'm a practicing fetal and maternal health care provider and president and CEO of Healthy Women, the nation's leading nonprofit health organization representing more than 18 million women. We provide consumers and healthcare providers accurate, evidence-based information about diseases and conditions, innovations in research and science, and changes in policy that affect women's access to treatment and care. I come before you today to talk about the need for public trust in vaccines, research, and the need for any approval to report sex differences. The development of COVID-19 vaccine is our best hope of ending this deadly pandemic. Vaccines save millions of lives every year, but only if people have access and are willing to get vaccinated. A recent survey from STAT in the Harris Poll revealed that 78% of Americans worry that the COVID-19 vaccine approval process is being driven by more politics than science. In September, Pew Research found that only 21% of respondents would definitely get a vaccine if it were available immediately, down from 42% in May. Public trust in science and information from our federal agencies has been undermined. It is therefore imperative that we address the spread of misinformation and the growing fear and distrust of the regulatory process and its politicization. The agency must show that any approval and distribution of vaccines is the result of rigorous regulatory reviews such as independent data and safety monitoring boards and a panel of outside scientific advisors that find that vaccines safe and effective. With respect to research, it's crucial that sex differences be analyzed and reported along with approvals for COVID-19 vaccines. It is well established that there are sex differences in immune functions and responses to vaccinations. Women build better immunity to infections compared to men due to estrogens and certain genes on the X chromosome, which cause lower viral loads, less inflammation, and higher levels of antibodies that remain in circulation longer. Research on influenza vaccines has demonstrated that women only need half the usual dose to get the appropriate immune response. The FDA should determine whether women report greater adverse events or side effects more often to, or to a greater extent than men since women are known to generate stronger antibody responses to viruses. To that end, women and men should be equally represented in the clinical trials and the data should be dis, dis, disaggregated for analysis. We believe implementing these recommendations will ensure the success of COVID-19 vaccines. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Okay, thank you so much for your comments. The next speaker is Dr. Arthur Kaplan. Uh, Dr. Kaplan, Dr. Kaplan? Uh, Dr. Kaplan was unable to, to stay on. Oh, okay, so we will move to the next speaker then. Uh, next speaker is uh, Ms. Sarah Christopherson. Hi, thank you. My name is Sarah Christofferson. I am the Policy Advocacy Director at the National Women's Health Network. We're a nonprofit advocacy organization that has been bringing the voices of women to the FDA for 45 years. We are supported by our members, and we do not accept financial support from drug or device makers, and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. As we heard earlier in the powerful Reagan Udall presentation this morning, there is a larger socio-political context for today's meeting. The ramifications mean you must go above and beyond before recommending an EUA. As noted in several presentations, distrust of even widely used vaccines predates the pandemic and has only grown this year. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the President of the United States has promoted unproven miracle cures and dangerous theories for partisan gain. Added to that volatile mix, FDA has made serious missteps this year. And while we recognize that FDA resisted shortcutting the collection of follow-up data in the face of significant external political pressure, much damage to public trust has already been done to the public's faith in federal scientific integrity. This committee must play a strong role in reassuring the public that the vaccine is safe and effective. 
Otherwise, the damage could ripple through public health for decades. Relatedly, while the guidance strongly encourages clinical trial enrollment of the populations most affected by COVID-19, we urge this committee to go further and not recommend an EUA until there's sufficient data to demonstrate that the vaccine works in those groups who are most affected. As noted earlier today, Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and other people of color have faced high and disproportionate infection and mortality rates. They've also expressed a strong interest in knowing that the vaccine will work in people like them. Yet they are significantly underrepresented in vaccine trials, and there's no guarantee that they will be included in case-driven interim analyses. Determining safety and efficacy in a clear and compelling manner must mean more than simply reaching a sufficient number of total cases. The sponsors' protocols indicate that they will take an interim look at the effectiveness of their vaccines at 31 or 53 cases. While that might be enough to demonstrate that a vaccine is effective overall, we believe that the committee should ask for more. Do those cases show that the vaccine is effective in women, in people of color, in older adults? No matter how many cases have occurred in the vaccine trials when the committee is finally asked to weigh in on a sponsor's data, communities of color, women and older adults must have confidence that vaccines work for people like them. We're Thank counting you. on you to send a strong message to the FDA. Thank you for your consideration. Great. Thank you so much for your comments. The next person is, next speaker is Ms. Linda D. Hi, I'm from AIDS Linda Action D. Baltimore and the AIDS. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead, please. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you. Go ahead. Ms. D, can you hear me? Please go ahead and make your remarks, please. Ms. D, did you mute your own phone? I don't, can you hear me now? Yes. Now we can hear you. Go yes. ahead, Ms. D. Okay. Jesus, God. All right. Sorry. I'm from AIDS Action Baltimore and the AIDS Treatment Activist Coalition, a former CEDAR um, Antiviral Advisor Committee uh, community represent representative. I'm delighted that the agency did an end run around the White House when it publicized today's briefing document, which resulted in OMB approval of the new vaccine guidance. The HIV community applauds the agency's courage and battle for scientific integrity, especially the center directors who uh, published in USA Today. But we all know that anything can happen with this administration at any time. That's why you need to advance the agency's bravery and determination. You are the last bastion of independent US scientific experts able to prevent or help to prevent dangerous politicization of science and ensure public protection against authorization or licensure of uh, COVID vaccines. Thus, I would urge you to consider the following recommendations that are more stringent than the uh, new FDA guidance. We need to um, establish adequate safety and um, efficacy if we wish to. Um, if not, we will do more harm than good, and we could really crash the vaccine effort for years to come. Uh, we, we need to require that in future vaccine trials, a significant number of older adults and people of color are included to permit a safety and efficacy sub-analysis for these populations, as well as their comorbidities. If there are insufficient numbers in current phase three trials to permit a sub-analysis, describe an acceptable risk-benefit analysis, analysis that would justify an EUA and require post-marketing studies that will establish safety and efficacy. Recommend that adequate funds be allotted for government community advisory boards and industry community advisory boards can, 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 constituted with COVID-19 survivors and advocates to foster education and inclusion of these vulnerable populations. Tuskegee is always foremost in the minds of African Americans. They do not trust the government or industry. The Reagan Udall comments clearly prove we still have a lot of work to do before communities of color are going to volunteer for, va for a vaccine or any other COVID-19 trial. Recommend that the phase three trial vaccines include people with controlled HIV, HPV, HCV, and other important comorbidities and require a pathway for the inclusion of pregnant women. Recommend a 75% standard to promote vaccine confidence. Require that participants be followed for three to six months, not just two months, to provide adequate time to capture most 
usual serious adverse events. Recommend that all phase three participants be followed for at least one year after EAU or licensure to establish durability and long-term safety. Uh, recommend BLA, not e EAU, after uh, Verbeck approval. Thank you for your dedicated commitment and service and for allowing me to comment. Thank you so much, Ms. D. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Ms. Claire Hannon. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, very much so. Thank okay. you. Okay, great. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Claire Hannon, Executive Director of the Association of Immunization Managers. I don't have any specific conflicts, but AIM as an organization does accept educational grants and contributions from corporate entities. Um, so AIM represents the 64 immunization awardee jurisdictions, um, 50 states, 8 territories or federated states, and 6 large cities. They have all submitted uh, vaccine distribution plans to CDC. So the states are working very hard to prepare for potential distribution of a vaccine. But the distribution plans will only be successful if people show up and accept the vaccine. And this will only happen if we establish trust and confidence in the vaccine. Because the turnaround time for, from potential EUA authorization to vaccine distribution is very short, it's critically important that trust in the approval and authorization, authorization process be established early and maintained throughout the process. The guidance provided by FDA for vaccine licensure and the additional guidance for the EUA is extremely helpful. It's also extremely reassuring that VRPAC will meet and will review data and make recommendations on EUA as well as licensure. We're very thankful for these measures. The transparency continues to be critically important. Holding open online meetings allow the public to see for themselves how the process works. So thank you for making this meeting accessible to the public. We encourage you to continue to be transparent with all of your actions. We encourage the FDA to produce and distribute educational materials targeted to specific communities at low, and at low literacy levels. By reassuring the public that the vaccine approval process is conducted ethically, transparently, without interference, and through a health equity lens, VRPAC can help build confidence in the safety and efficacy of any approved or authorized COVID-19 vaccine. The committee and FDA must continue to openly inform the public about the progress of the vaccine trials and post-approval safety monitoring. Beyond the COVID-19 vaccine, VRPAC plays an essential role in recommend recommending approval of vaccines and biologics. Parents and consumers trust this process knowing that independent experts on VRPAC thoroughly review all related data. It's critical that the trust in this scientific review be preserved. Any deviation from this process could erode trust not only in COVID-19 vaccine, but also in routine vaccinations as well. We thank the members of the VRPAC committee for their time and expertise and commitment. Um, thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you so much for your comments. The next speaker is uh, Ms. Elizabeth Lavinger. Yes. Go ahead, please. Go ahead and make your comments. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Lovinger. I'm a Senior Government Relations and Policy Officer at Treatment Action Group, and I have no relevant conflict of interest to declare. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on behalf of Treatment Action Group. Our comments and recommendations encompass a broad range of community concerns regarding COVID-19 vaccine development and regulatory review as follows. Number one, there have been unprecedented missteps and misstatements related to emergency use authorizations for hydroxychloroquine and convalescent for COVID-19, and it is vital that similar debacles do not occur with vaccines. This is a particularly important concern when vaccine hesitancy in the U.S. is rising, as was noted in today's meeting. With only 50% of the American public trusting any COVID-19 vaccine candidate approved by the FDA, the agency can restore public trust by improving transparency and communication and by removing staff who have been involved in perpetrating political interference. Number two, we appreciate the issuance of FDA guidance on EUAs for COVID-19 vaccine candidates. However, 
we strongly recommend that the parameters outlined should be viewed as the absolute minimum requirements, particularly for duration of safety follow-up. Number three, the unprecedented speed at which prospective COVID-19 vaccines are being developed points to the need for post-marketing surveillance to be required and strongly enforced by the FDA. Number four, robust information should be obtained on safety and, if possible in subgroup analyses, efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines in survivors of tuberculosis and people living with HIV and other chronic viral infections, including, but not limited to, hepatitis B and C. Number five, Vaccine developers should generate data on safety and efficacy across the full age spectrum in women, transgender and gender nonconforming people, and men, and in racially and ethnically diverse populations. Number six, in addition to being transparent with data on people who become pregnant during efficacy trials, sponsors should be asked to disclose plans and timelines for the developmental and reproductive toxicology work necessary to conduct clinical research specifically in pregnant and lactating people. Similarly, sponsors should disclose plans and timelines for the clinical research necessary to obtain vaccine licensure in pediatric populations. Number seven, the FDA must ensure that COVID-19 vaccine efficacy evaluations proceed for sufficient duration to obtain evidence on the duration of immunity if vaccine-mediated protection from SARS-CoV-2 infection and or COVID-19 disease is demonstrated. Number eight, we encourage the FDA to proactively consider the implications for ongoing and future efficacy trials if and when a vaccine safely meets or exceeds the 50% efficacy threshold for approval. Issues will arise regarding how to approach control arms and trial designs, and this may be an appropriate topic for an additional FDA guidance document. Finally, number nine, sponsors should be encouraged to monitor for potential cases of reinfection with SARS-CoV-2 among trial participants. Trials also offer the opportunity to evaluate the effects of pre-existing immune response to seasonal coronaviruses on the response to vaccination, SARS-CoV-2 infection, and COVID-19 disease. Making samples available to independent researchers would allow important questions on these topics to be addressed. Lastly, we encourage you to refer to our fuller written comments for further information and explanation. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Peter Lurie. Good afternoon. I am Peter Lurie, President of the Nonprofit Center for Science in the Public Interest and an Associate Commissioner at FDA from 2014 to 17. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. This meeting represents a potential turning point in assuring that the scientific method and the principle of transparency take center stage. Until now, the process of developing candidate vaccines has been inappropriately politicized with an eye on the election calendar rather than the deliberate time frames that science requires. Now is the time for a reset. This committee has a unique opportunity to set a new tone for vaccine deliberations going forward. In so doing, the following five principles should be honored. One, agency transparency. The committee must assure that FDA honors its commitment to hold an advisory committee meeting on particular products before issuing, issuing EUAs. The committee should also pressure the agency to provide more detail on the reasons for clinical holds on vaccine trials and on other products. Two, corporate transparency. While some companies have released their clinical trial protocols, others have not. And in general, companies have not provided detailed statistical analysis plans or stopping rules. This committee should also insist that companies granted EUAs commit to rapid submission of BLAs. Three, appropriately high efficacy standards. FDA has been inconsistent in its application of EUA standards during the course of this pandemic, often accepting data considerably weaker than it has in previous emergencies. When a vaccine candidate comes before this committee, I urge you to interpret these efficacy standards rigorously. A vaccine that is only minimally effective is one for which any efficacy can be overwhelmed if people lowering their guards and reduce mask wearing or social distancing. Four, high safety standards. Even for authorized products, it is critical that sponsors continue to follow subjects for up to a year to monitor for late occurring adverse events and to establish whether immunity wanes. This committee should also seek clarity on the agency's efforts to exclude vaccine-induced enhanced respiratory disease. Even after today's presentation, I remain confused about the EUA guidance and how it suggests that there should be at least five placebo subjects who should have severe COVID disease. Five, high ethical standards. This committee should 
demand that informed consent forms and institutional review board minutes be made public. It should assure that subjects are receiving proper counseling on how to avoid infection with SARS-CoV-2 and that vaccines proved truly safe and effective are provided to control patients in ongoing and subsequent trials. The politicization of vaccines in this pandemic has already undermined public trust, contributing to an alarming rise in vaccine hesitancy. A vaccine that is not accepted is an ineffective vaccine. The only antidotes to public mistrust are scientific rigor and transparency. I urge the members of this committee to be their staunchest advocates. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lodi. The next speaker is uh, uh, Ms. Emily Martin. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. I have no relevant conflicts of interest to disclose. My name is Emily Martin, and I'm an associate professor of epidemiology at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist, and my research and public health practice involves studying the effectiveness of vaccines and how vaccines can be used broadly to protect as many people as possible. Today, I am advocating that emergency use authorization should only be applied to limited situations and that EUAs must not preclude the completion of ongoing randomized trials. The standards for an EUA must be high, and EUAs must be applicable only to limited populations with the highest level of exposure, including healthcare workers or first responders. Before making a COVID-19 vaccine available through an EUA, the FDA must ensure that the trial sponsors has outlined an, a feasible strategy for continuing the trial after the authorization. Data from randomized controlled trials are essential for laying the groundwork needed for vaccine policy going forward. These trials must prioritize the inclusion of those experiencing disparate impacts of the pandemic to date. Importantly, these trials must be continued until their completion in order to gather the data that's needed to protect these groups. Without complete and full randomized trial data, we will lack the evidence base needed to monitor and adapt vaccination strategies as needed over the many years that these vaccines will be in use. The complexities of vaccine effectiveness monitoring are particularly challenging when multiple products and vaccine platforms are available, as could be the case with COVID-19 vaccines. For this reason, it is essential that all trials are continued until completion. It is too soon to know the details of how the co coming COVID-19 vaccines will need to be delivered. As we have learned with the influenza vaccine, post-distribution studies will be needed and will be critical to continually refine when and how often to administer the vaccine and to identify those groups in need of additional strategies for protection. However, post-distribution and comparative effectiveness studies must be founded upon robust, randomized trial data, and ending these trials early will irrevocably hamper our our ability to optimize the effective use of the vaccine going forward. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak to the committee today, and thank you for your important work. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Martin. Uh, next speaker is uh, Ms. Susan Peshin. Hello. I'm Sue Peshin, President and CEO of the Alliance for Aging Research. The Alliance receives industry funding for non-branded older adult vaccine and COVID-19 education, but we have no conflicts for this meeting. It's hard to comprehend the horror of mass COVID-19 deaths among those aged 65 and older in the U.S., totaling more than 160,000 people. That's 80% of all COVID-19 related deaths in a group that only accounts for 16% of the U.S. population. Please keep that in mind as you do your work. First. Research shows our immune systems grow weaker as we age. This phenomenon, known as immunosenescence, makes the immune systems of older adults less responsive to standard vaccines. Thankfully, there are FDA-approved enhanced flu vaccines specifically designed for older adults that help overcome the effects of immunosenescence. Unfortunately, in their most current recommendations, the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP, once again avoided recommending enhanced flu products over standard dose for those ages 65 plus. This was a missed opportunity to encourage older adults to better protect themselves during the worst pandemic in 100 years. Yes, any flu shot is better than no flu shot, but older adults need all the protection they can get. So it's critically important to understand geriatric immune response as you review COVID-19 vaccines. The Alliance implores the FDA and VRPAC to be transparent about all steps taken to ensure COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective for older adults 
particularly those 80 and older. Sponsors should be required to explicitly demonstrate how their vaccines were tested and how they performed among stratified older age groups in late stage trials. And because COVID-19 vaccines may be granted EUA status, we strongly advocate the FDA require public reporting of post-market studies. Second, it makes sense public health experts are recommending that those in nursing homes be among the first groups to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. However, we ask the FDA, VRPAC, and ACIP to consider which COVID-19 vaccines will provide the most protection to our oldest citizens and balance it with efforts to prioritize distribution and administration. Third, COVID-19 vaccines will be considered for EUA during flu season. The FDA's thinking on COVID-19 vaccines and co-administration with flu or other CDC-recommended adult vaccines is very important. We urge you to make this information a priority in provider and patient education efforts. Lastly, 20 seconds. The Alliance, 20. Thank you. Lastly, the Alliance continues to call on our federal health agency leaders to be straight with policymakers and the public about what lies ahead in the COVID-19 fight without sugarcoating or political spin. Please continue to champion science because science is what will save us. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker in line is uh, Ms. Suzanne Rabati. Thank you. I'm Suzanne Rabati, the founder of MedShadow Foundation, an independent nonprofit health journalism site focusing on the side effects of medicines. We are very supportive of vaccinations. In fact, one of our employees is a volunteer for one of the COVID-19 trial, vaccination trials. We do not accept support from pharmaceutical companies or medical device manufacturers, and therefore, I have no conflicts of interest. I have also served as a consumer representative on the FDA Drug Safety and Risk Management Committee. An effective vaccine would save hundreds of thousands of lives and end the deeply damaging social separation we're suffering. But a faulty COVID-19 vaccine is more dangerous to population health than is COVID-19 itself. Rushing to market a vaccine with harmful and life-altering side effects would have decades-long repercussions. A flawed vaccine would increase fear in the public of all vaccines, and hope of gaining the trust of those suspicious of vaccines would be lost. COVID-19 is dangerous, but not as dangerous as the return of measles, whooping cough, mumps, polio, and more. The FDA has indicated that a vaccine need only prevent or decrease COVID-19 severity in 50% of the people it's given to, but 100% of the people given the vaccine will risk a side effect. The vaccine must be engineered so that those who get no benefit from the vaccination aren't also risking a lot of harm. A COVID-19 vaccine could be given to 300 million people in the U.S. alone. Even a side effect so rare as one of every 10,000 patients would end up impacting 30,000 people and their families. When testing a drug or vaccine in a vulnerable population, there will be adverse events. And the only way to tell if an adverse event is the result of the vaccine, or if it's a drug interaction, or of the result of underlying condition of the patient, is if it is tested in tens of thousands of people for many months and years. Even after a vaccine is approved, you must ensure the post-approval testing is robust. I am asking the committee to ensure that the path to vaccine use through approval or EUA or any other method protects the citizens that you represent. Do not trust pharmaceutical companies to get it right. We've been unhappily reminded, most recently with Purdue Pharma, that pharmaceutical companies may take shortcuts. As Dr. Cody Meisner was quoted in saying in STAT today, we're going to get one chance to introduce the vaccine. If that goes badly, it's going to be a long time before we get another COVID-19 vaccine. Thank 25. you. I appreciate your work. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Um, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Dorit Reese. I, I came to know that she is not available at this time. Uh, thank you. We'll move on to the next speaker, on Ms. Nisa Shafi. Nisa yes, Shafi. thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Nisa Shafi, and I'm here today on behalf of the National Consumers League. I have no relevant conflicts of interest regarding today's remark. For over 120 years, NCL has advocated on behalf of consumers who depend on vaccines as life-saving medical interventions. 
NCL has advocated on behalf of consumers who depend on vaccines as life-saving medical uh, interventions. We extend our gratitude to the vaccine, Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee for all that you do to protect public health and for the opportunity to speak here today. Today, NCL would like to highlight the following priorities, the deployment of emergency use authorizations, the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine, and the inclusion of diversity in clinical trials. These three concerns align directly with NCL's efforts to enhance vaccine confidence and uptake, especially in the context of the pandemic. We trust that the FDA will release the vaccine upon careful consideration of its safety and effectiveness. Post-market surveillance of the vaccine is imperative to determining the ongoing efficacy of the vaccine. Implementing the release of the vaccine on such a magnificent scale will involve precise coordination that traverses all levels of government and consumers will rely on public health agencies to communicate and respond to any potential adverse events regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. There has never been more, a more critical time for consumers to have confidence in the Food and Drug Administration. The FDA is entrusted with ensuring the safety, efficacy, and security of the treatments needed to treat and prevent the spread of the virus. Throughout the pandemic, consumers have received conflicting information about the from the administration on various COVID-19 treatments. We are aware that developing a vaccine for COVID-19 is a time-sensitive priority. However, we are concerned that consumers may believe the FDA is hastily approving investigational tests and drugs. NCL appreciates the FDA rec and recognizes that EUA is not intended to replace randomized clinical trials and that clinical trials are critically important for the definitive demonstration of safety and efficacy of a treatment. Through our education and outreach to consumers, we support the FDA in its efforts to develop a safe, effective, and expedited pathway towards a COVID-19 vaccine. Finally, to mitigate the disproportionate disease burden experienced by people of color during the pandemic, NCL requests that clinical trials for the COVID-19 vaccine are inclusive and consist of diverse subjects. People of color are significantly underrepresented in clinical trials and undertreated in medical settings. This phenomenon will prove thank you. Phenomenon will prove to be a challenge when encouraging vaccine uptake. Ensuring adequate representation in clinical trials would foster vaccine confidence across all demographics. In closing, to stem the tide of vaccine preventable diseases, NCL submits these comments for review by the committee to ensure that cons consumers are afforded with safe and effective vaccines to combat the pandemic. Thank you for your consideration for our views on this important public health issue. Great, thank you so much for your comments. The next speaker is Mr. Uh, Mitchell Warren. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mitchell Warren. I'm the executive director of AVACA nonprofit organization that for 25 years has worked to accelerate the ethical development and global delivery of HIV vaccines and other new prevention options. In March, we joined with several other organizations to establish the COVID-19 Advocates Advisory Board, a global partnership to engage civil society to accelerate R&D and eventually delivery of COVID-19 vac COVID vaccines. I have no conflicts to declare and we accept no funding from pharmaceutical companies. I want to acknowledge and support the FDA guidance documents on both licensure and on emergency use authorization from June and October. Both documents set important criteria that should be viewed as the absolute minimum requirements for FDA action, and that any action requires this committee's positive recommendation needs to be a direct outcome of today's meeting. I should say that while this committee and the FDA are, of course, focusing on the U.S. by statute, what happens today in this virtual room has global importance. No pressure, but what happens in the coming days, weeks, and months through this process and your actions and deliberations will either enable or inhibit our collective ability to translate clinical trial results into public health impact and to instilling confidence in vaccines and regulatory processes generally. As you deliberate today and in subsequent meetings with each application, we urge you to consider the following. One, the critical importance of distinguishing between an EUA and a licensure under a BLA, and ensuring that any EUA places specific requirements for continued data collection and clearly articulated pathways and timelines for a full BLA. If an EUA is granted, uh, the committee and the FDA must make clear that the EUA is not in lieu of an approval, a signal that licensure is imminent or guaranteed, or promoted or described as pre-licensed. Further, you must place strict requirements on the continued data collection in ongoing blinded clinical trials that are going to be required for possible future BLA. 
an applicant should be required to present a timeline for that submission. Two, the need for inclusion of diverse populations in the trials and the accrual of relevant safety and efficacy data across those populations. If an EUA or BLA application does not provide adequate diversity across age and population, we urge the committee to determine strict requirements to place on the applicant. A partial authorization or approval will further diminish trust and confidence. Three, the importance of broad community engagement in the development and implementation of trials, as well as in the review of applications. Any COVID-19 vaccine that proves safe and effective will need to be introduced at scale and with speed never previously seen. The importance of community engagement cannot be underestimated, and we urge you uh, and the FDA to support the inclusion of strong civil society voices um, and community perspectives as part of the regulatory process and of future committee meetings. Fourth, clarifying the initial authorization or licensure of one vaccine on the design and conduct of future trials. As the committee and the FDA time to review these applications, it's be critical to consider the implications of approving a product of only 50% efficacy, and we urge you to start now to develop clear time. additional FDA guidance documents to help with those discussions. Let me thank you for your work uh, and your commitment to a science evidence-based process to instill confidence throughout the way. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. The last speaker for today's OPH is Ms. Kim Witzak. Uh, good afternoon. Go um, my, uh, good afternoon. My name is Kim Witzak, and I'm calling in from a snowy Minneapolis. Um, I am speaking on behalf of Woody Matters, a drug safety organization that started after the death of my husband due to an undisclosed side effect of an antidepressant. I have no financial conflicts of interest. I'm also on the board of directors for the USA Patient Network, an independent patient voice advocating for safe, effective, and accessible medical treatments. We make sure the everyday, real-world patient perspective is represented in healthcare conversations. The discussion we are having today reminds me of the famous ad campaign for Rolling Stone magazine, Perception versus Reality. Perception of a vaccine for disrupting severe COVID-19 versus the reality of what's actually being studied and evaluated. Through the help of media, government officials, and important public health organizations, the perception is that vaccines are key to getting our lives back to normal. The perception is that the, this vaccine will help keep, keep people from getting very sick and dying while preventing infection and disease transmission. However, the reality is the trials were not designed to test whether the vaccine reduces the risk of severe COVID-19 or reduces the risk of hospitalization, ICU, or the spread of the virus. Nor does it include some of the, um, including the most at risk, like the elderly, immune compromised, and other comorbidities. According to the FDA guidance, just a 50% efficacy with an allowable margin of error as low as 30% is acceptable. Is acceptable hardly a high bar to gain public trust. The reality is vaccines were designed with speed in mind. Historically, vaccines have not been a quick solution as they can sometimes take decades to become effective. Like the virus itself, there are so, still many unknowns with the vaccine that need to be figured out, like does it need to be taken in multiple doses? Will it need to be tweaked and given every year like the flu shot? These are things we still don't know. And we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of the potential short and long-term safety issues with these new vaccines and the adjuvants that are being used. Transparency is crucial. We need to shoot straight with the American people. We deserve to have an ongoing, open, civil debate of the merits of the changing science, protocols, the evidence, and the harms in real time. Ideally, these vaccines would be reviewed by independent scientists and researchers without any ties to vaccine makers or have any financial or political agendas motivating decisions. A lot is riding on COVID, a lot is riding on COVID vaccine approvals, not to mention the billions of dollars being spent from governments around the world. The public wants more than just some vaccines out um, in hopes that something sticks. It is the American public that will ultimately pay the price. Of all while the companies manufacturing vaccines have been given complete immu um, legal immunity should something go wrong. Speed isn't everything. I believe there's still an opportunity and to course correct and make changes so that we don't end up with an approved
approved vaccine that reduces mild cases in healthy people, but does little to protect the most vulnerable and plays up the perception of having effective and safe vaccine to stop COVID-19. We need to stop, pivot, and do the hard right, not the quick, easy wrong. Thank you, and I know and I appreciate all the hard work you're doing because I'm currently a consumer representative on another FDA committee. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Zuck. This concludes the open public hearing session for the Actions Advisory Committee meeting today. Thank you all. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, Dr. Monto. There you are, sir. Let's make okay. sure we get your audio back. There you go. We are about to launch into a two-hour discussion of the questions that the FDA has asked us to consider. Uh, so if we could see those questions. And the first are really related because we are being asked to look at uh, the FDA's approach to safety and effectiveness in the guidance documents, which include guidance for both EUA and full licensure, and then to comment about, in question number two, how, if EUAs are granted, how there would be continued uh, blinding in the clinical trials. Uh, the Stop. first question is Dr. Uh, Monto. Yes. Dr. Monto, can can I make a couple of comments? Would you please? Okay, thank you so much. So first of all, thank you for introducing these questions. And I thought while the third discussion item may be rather self explanatory, maybe the first two discussion items require some clarification and I wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, regarding each of them. So discussion item one that you just read that we would like for you to discuss FDA's approach to safety and effectiveness data as outlined in the respective guidance documents. Now we do realize that these guidance documents are long and comprehensive and they have a lot of information in them. So what we would like for the committee to really focus on is we would like to hear are we on balance? did we strike the right balance? On one side, we want a safe and effective vaccine available to the public as soon as possible, but on the other side, we do realize that this not cannot come at the cost of public health. So what we would like for you to opine on is specifically, are there areas or recommendations or data needs that are discussed um, in these guidance documents um, that you think as a committee are too strict, or conversely, are they not strict enough? Are there areas of broad disagreement in some of these guidance documents, or is there broad agreement? So this is what we would like um, for you to, to discuss, rather than really going into each um, details of the data needs discussed in this guidance document. Now, question two. And I, I would like to pause on this um, a little bit and, and, and give a bit more background. So we discuss, we, we asked the committee to discuss the considerations for continuation of blinded phase three clinical trials in the event that an EOA has been issued. And Dr. Rias and Dr. Fink this afternoon explained to the committee that for a preventive vaccine, that is intended for use under an EOA in potentially millions of people, the data that the FDA would request to support the benefit of the vaccine should be very close to meeting the standards that would support licensure. And Dr. Fink also explained 
why an issuance of an EOA should not in and of itself require unblinding of a COVID-19 vaccine. And we are concerned about the risk that use of a vaccine under an EOA would interfere with long-term assessment of safety and efficacy in ongoing trials and potentially even jeopardize product approval and not only the first vaccine, but maybe even follow-on vaccines and continued follow-up of clinical trial participants to further refine efficacy estimates to look at duration of protection, the potential for enhanced disease, and to obtain the required safety follow-up is essential and can really only be successfully accomplished, ideally, with keeping these trials blinded. And that's why we're asking you to discuss this question if there are other considerations. Now, in the interest of transparency, and Dr. Corilla brought this up this morning, he asked about why the agency has not contemplated expanded access. And Dr. Fink summarized this very elegantly and also pointed out that there are some, there are complexities, complexities for a national expanded access program. But in the interest of transparency and to explain to the committee that we have an additional provision to make investigational products available, uh, I'd like to show five slides real quickly to explain to you our expanded access regulations. And, and again, just for the purpose of transparency and put that on the table. So, as Dr. Fink explained earlier on, the expanded access regulations are really to facilitate availability of investigational drugs to patients with serious or life-threatening diseases or conditions when there are no satisfactory alternatives. And the primary purpose of an expanded access program is to treat the patient's disease or condition. Can I have the next slide? Okay, so we have three categories of expanded access, and I'll be discussing only the treatment IND or treatment protocol because that really calls for widespread treatment use of a product. Next slide, please. So there are requirements for all expanded access uses. First of all, the disease must be serious or life-threatening, and there is no satisfactory alternative. Again, the potential benefit needs to justify the potential risk of the treatment. And providing the investigational drug will not interfere with clinical development of the product for that specific use. Next slide. Next slide, please. Now, there are three categories, as I mentioned, and within each category, there are additional criteria that must be met. We want to skip these slides and the next slide and go straight to, I think, slide number six. Six, please, slide number six. Can I have slide number six? Thank you. So under expanded access use of a treatment protocol, and that really means widespread use, the FDA must determine that the drug is being investigated in a controlled clinical trial under an IND that is designed to support marketing application. So that is the phase three clinical trials that are currently ongoing to use the example for COVID-19. The sponsor has to pursue marketing approval. And for a serious disease such as COVID-19, we need sufficient clinical evidence of safety and effectiveness to support expanded access use ordinarily from phase three trials, but could also come from compelling data from phase two trials. And we need available evidence that provides a reasonable basis to conclude that the investigational drug may be effective in what not and would not expose patients to unreasonable and significant risk. And such evidence also could come from phase three and two trials. And the last slide, please, slide number seven. As Dr. Fink explained, um, we would require an expanded access submission. And this can be a new investigation, new drug application, or an amendment to an existing 
uh, investigation and new drug application. These are clinical studies that are conducted under informed consent and IRB approval. There is a requirement for safety data uh, that is adverse event reporting, and we need accurate case histories and drug disposition records. And there are other investigator responsibilities that may apply depending on the type of expanded access. So that concludes that slide presentation. I just wanted to inform the committee of this additional provision to make um, investigation products available. Thank you. Uh, before you go, Dr. Gruber, is the expanded uh, use uh, authorization usually done for drugs or for vaccines? Uh, the expanded access regulations and provisions do apply to biologics and to vaccines. And we have been using these expanded access provisions for vaccines lately, not under treatment IND, under widespread use, but they have been used a couple of years ago when we had the meningeal cockle um, type B outbreak at universities. And it's also being used to make yellow fever um, vaccine available in the United States. So, so we have been using those for vaccines. But again, treatment IND means widespread use. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's go back to our discussion of uh, item number one. And uh, I did uh, cut off the questions that were being given to uh, uh, Dr. Fink and Dr. Uh, Weir. And uh, if we still have questions about uh, EUAs and BLAs, uh, they are available for us right now. So raise your hands if you do have continued questions. OK, Dr. Mr. Taubman. Yes, thanks. Um, so I did have questions, and it, it turns out that the public speakers during the um, open hearing uh, sort of emphasized some of these points. So I'm, I'm glad that I didn't get to ask them beforehand. Um, two questions relate for, for Dr. Fink, specifically. Um, two related to either licensure or EUA, and one specifically to EUA. Um, the endpoint. Um, I, myself, in reading the documents, and again, I'm a lay person, so bear with me. But I was concerned that the endpoint did not require serious disease, even moderate to serious disease, only some symptomatology. And the concern there is that we could have a vaccine that seems to do well, meet the 50% test, uh, and it's effective in avoiding mild cases, but actually does very little to address what we really care about, which is serious disease and death. And the, the way it was described in the documents is that it's a choice um, whether to use that as a primary endpoint, but if not, it should be a secondary endpoint. And as I understand that contrary to one of the speakers, only there is one company that is one sponsor that is using it as a primary endpoint, uh, moderate to severe disease, but only one. And the others, it's a secondary endpoint. And my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that that really is significant because the 50% efficacy test is only being applied to the, to the primary endpoint. So it may not actually you could do well with the primary endpoint of avoiding any kind of disease at all, but do very little, and it'll still pass the test. So my question is, why was that not required as a primary endpoint is serious disease? The second question, and this is because there's different information here. Um, we read about the 50% and it was repeated again today. But this morning, Dr. Marston from um, NIH said, and, and uh, you know, Dr. Mato followed up on that, um, that 60%. And I certainly could see the argument for 60% in a situation where we also have a problem of uptake. Uh, maybe 60% is warranted. But my question was, you know, why the difference between the 50 and 60? Why is it not 60? And then my last question related to EUA is, um, this came up in the public hearing as well, 
two months, a median of two months of experience post the, the final uh, regimen, uh, the second dose, if there's a second dose. And it was pointed out that means half of the cases won't have been, uh, people won't have been inoculated for, for two months, that they'll be less than two months. In the explanation, we were told that um, the document says that most of the adverse effects occur in the first six weeks, uh, but they could be longer than that. And we're talking about drugs based upon untested, or I should say, unused platforms that have never been the basis for vaccines. So there could be adverse effects we don't know about. And so isn't uh, two months a little short? And in, in, in finishing this question, I would note that the WHO has a three-month um, minimum test for their what they call uh, emergency use listing. I don't know how different that is from EUA, but it does seem that one very respected official body looking at this whole problem has said it should be at least three months. So if you could answer those three questions, I, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you for those three questions. I, I'll try to answer them um, in order. So uh, the first question was about the primary efficacy endpoint uh, being any disease versus uh, being severe disease. Um, you know, here we um, are really trying to, to strike a balance um, between uh, getting information on the most clinically significant uh, outcomes of, of COVID-19 and how a vaccine might be able to uh, prevent those outcomes uh, versus uh, being able to, to make an impact on the pandemic um, in as uh, reasonable amount of time as, as possible based on, on good data. Uh, and so uh, in, in trying to strike this balance and also um, really having to acknowledge that the vaccine manufacturers um, are, are free to choose what they consider to be the most relevant primary endpoints for, for their vaccines, and then we evaluate uh, whether uh, the, the data support that the vaccines are effective uh, for that uh, specific indication. Um, and then other uh, bodies, such as ACIP, determine whether the vaccine should be used uh, in, in certain situations. Uh, we felt that we could not mandate a, a specific primary endpoint, uh, including a primary endpoint that focused on severe disease. Now, that being said, when we do make our benefit-risk determination for an EUA or for licensure, we do expect to have data uh, to inform whether the vaccine um, is or, or may be effective against more severe disease. Uh, we, because more severe disease is going to be less common, uh, then we will unlikely um, have in, a, in an analysis that used a less severe uh, disease endpoint as, as the primary analysis, we will unlikely have with, with the same degree of statistical rigor uh, evidence to determine effectiveness against a more severe endpoint. But we do expect to have some, and we will use that evidence um, as one piece of information to inform our benefit-risk determination. Um, I'll also mention that there are uh, multiple examples of vaccines where um, the data do appear to show that the vaccines are most effective um, against more severe disease, less so against uh, uh, less severe disease, and even less so uh, against asymptomatic infection. So we took that, uh, that experience uh, into consideration as well. Uh, to answer your second question about 50% uh, versus 60%, I'd, I'd have to go back to Dr. Marston's slides to remind myself of whether 60% was a success criterion that uh, had been outlined uh, for a specific study or an assumption of vaccine efficacy that uh, was used to uh, calculate a sample size uh, for that study. I think it might have, have been the latter. Um, we as I mentioned before, we make our recommendations based on what we think um, is uh, an efficacy standard that would be needed to make an impact on the pandemic. And of course, we would not argue 
uh, with any study that, that aims to go higher. Um, lastly, in terms of the uh, two months um, of follow-up, we do recognize that, that other uh, 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 organizations and individuals, including WHO, have specified and advocated for a longer uh, follow-up duration. Again, uh, this was a consideration of balance uh, in terms of um, having the amount of safety data that we thought was absolutely necessary to inform a benefit-risk consideration, given what we know um, about vaccines uh, and vaccine safety uh, in general, um, and, uh, and the, the goal of actually not uh, uh, withholding a vaccine that, that, that could make an impact. Um, uh, with the trials that are currently underway, um, we, we do acknowledge that, that some subjects will have been enrolled later. Um, some subjects will not have quite uh, two months of follow-up at the time an interim analysis to support an EUA uh, might be conducted. But we are still talking about many thousands of, of vaccine recipients for which uh, two months or more of, of safety and efficacy follow-up data uh, would be expected to be available. Thank you. Thank you. I'll have comments about that, but I appreciate the answers. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Carrillo. Thank you. Yeah, Dorian, <clears throat> I figure if I don't ask the question here, I'm never going to get an answer. There's been a lot of, uh, not a lot, but there's been some scientific discussion of non-coronavirus vaccines, BCG, OPV, MMR, having a potential role in reducing severity of COVID disease. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there are some trials that are going on. So I guess one question which you probably wouldn't share is whether or not you've been approached by investigators. But I'm wondering how the FDA would handle that. Would you treat them by the same criteria for coronavirus? The real, con not, not a concern, but the potential outcome is a positive readout of a clinical trial may, because these are commercially available licensed vaccines, we may actually end, we could end up in a case of vaccine shortages for some of these other vaccines if they were to be positive. I'm just wondering what the FDA, how the FDA would handle those. Uh, right, so the, the best that I could say um, is that our, our EUA guidance and our, our June guidance don't specify what uh, the vaccine components need to be. Um, and of course, as you mentioned, I, I can't uh, divulge any information about uh, studies that, that might be uh, uh, underway under um, IND. Um, you know, really this, uh, this uh, VERPAC is, is intended to focus on those vaccines that are, you know, in phase three trials currently, for which we might expect to, to have data soon. Uh, and so I, I really would like the, the discussion to, to focus on, on those vaccines. And I'll invite my, my colleagues at CBER to, to add uh, anything if, if, they, if they have anything to add. I think your answer is pretty specific about uh, what our uh, scope of uh, interest is right now. We're not going to be looking at other interventions. Uh, we have a very long list of those who want to answer, to uh, get you to answer some questions right now. I want the committee to know that we are going to have a general discussion. And I want to restrict the questioning right now to those people who want to get further information about uh, EUAs and BLAs and the rest, because we need to move on to the more general discussion. Uh, so please, uh, if you don't need a specific answer, just please lower your hands, and then we'll recognize you when we get to the more general discussion. So Dr. Pergen.
Thanks. Um, one of the questions I had was related to um, the, in the EUA, it's a 50% of patients will be followed with at least two months of both efficacy and safety. And then you also mentioned that um, it was 3,000 older patients must be included in that EUA. My question is, I know that enrollment has been difficult in the high-risk groups, particularly the uh, racial minorities, and there's no specification about including um, the appropriate number in the EUA specifically that I could find that suggests there would be equal numbers based on what the trial should look like. And I'm concerned that if an EUA is put forward without adequate enrollment in um, those particular um, uh, racial minorities, that that might be seen in a negative light. So I'm curious how that was decided and, and is there any thought about modifying that specifically? Uh, could, could I just ask for a clarification? What, what are you asking? How was how what decided? Yeah, so I'm saying for the, the time point where the, the EUA, you said you wanted at least 50% of the population that had both efficacy and safety data at two months, but there's no um, pre-specification about um, racial breakdown in that group. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Right. So, you know, we, we, we have not um, ever had requirements uh, for demographic composition um, of of data to support licensure of, of a vaccine. And uh, I think it would be very difficult to, to outline uh, such requirements for EUA. Now, that being said, I think we all understand and, and agree with and support the importance of having a diverse study population that is able to provide safety and effectiveness data across the demographic spectrum. Uh, that, that is the goal. Um, and so uh, one way in which our regulatory action um, can, can help to ensure that the vaccines being deployed um, are safe and effective uh, for, for the entire population for which it is authorized is to make sure that the entire population for which it is authorized actually has data um, that support the safety and effectiveness. And so we will be looking very closely at, uh, at an EUA application uh, to see where the gaps are uh, in terms of demographic representation. Thank you. Um, but I also have to caution that, um, you know, we, we have had situations where, unfortunately, um, you know, licensure applications have come in with less than desirable uh, representation in certain uh, you know, say racial or, or ethnic groups, um, that, that wouldn't a priori um, be a, uh, a reason to uh, restrict the vaccine from, from use in those groups. I just want to make that clear. Dr. Nelson. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you again um, for your patience with us as a committee and hopefully with this quite related question as well. So in our current state, when the entire world is indeed looking for the vaccine, who specifically, once an EUA would be authorized? have access to that vaccine. And I say this in reference to your last bullet on slide 13, which states, as with vaccine licensure, an EUA would specify use in those populations for which available data support favorable benefit risk. So just like the last questioner asked, we're all anticipating that the initial application for EUA will have insufficient enrollment for, the, for some of these higher risk groups and underrepresented groups. Does that mean when the EUA is authorized that if there's not enough data for those groups, they will be excluded from having access to that vaccine under the EUA? And your particular thoughts on the heels of Dr. Offit's question this morning about the potential for offering an EUA and extending the time to which um, applicants will really bring their, their vaccine for full licensure. Uh, right, so to, to answer the first Question first. Um, we, as I as I mentioned, uh, 
in response to the previous question, we will look carefully at the demographic representation for safety and effectiveness data and will approve or authorize the vaccine for those populations for which the, the data support uh, safety and effectiveness and favorable benefit risk. Um, there may be circumstances in which demographic representation uh, is less than we would like uh, or not large enough to uh, make firm conclusions, uh, but those types of gaps would not uh, necessarily in and of themselves uh, result in a, in a restriction. Um, we, we would have to think about whether it makes a sense from a scientific basis to be concerned that there is, there is some difference um, based on uh, differences in, in demography uh, to result in such a restriction. Uh, the most uh, common example that I, I can think of would be age. Uh, we do not automatically assume that if the vaccine uh, works for one age group that it will uh, necessarily work for another. Uh, and so, for example, if uh, we had very limited uh, data on safety or effectiveness in elderly individuals, that would cause us concern um, and uh, we would um, uh, have to consider uh, whether the, the data really did support authorization or licensure of the vaccine for use in an elderly population. And could you repeat your second question? I think the second question was, uh, with the potential for delays in bringing uh, vaccines for full licensure, some of the excluded groups who aren't part of the initial EUA might have to wait even longer. And I think if you look at what some of the strategies for deployment, there may be disconnects between the initial intent of deploying, of deploying the critical infrastructure individuals and higher risk patients where we may not have the sufficient benefit of data for both safety and efficacy. So you see the dilemma that has been pre presented and outlined by our public testimony earlier today that there is great concern about being able to acquire that data in these specific subsets. Thank you. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. We, we fret about that constantly. Um, and so that, that is why um, we are seeking your input on all of the, all three of these questions that we have out for discussion. And we'll try to do it. Uh, Dr. Gans, and then we got a couple more and then we'll get you off the hook right now. Hi, thanks so much for entertaining our questions. Um, mine is quick because I can um, save some of mine for the discussion, but I really wanted to know, and I haven't really heard much, I mean, we know that a lot of people have questioned the efficacy point of the 50% meeting cases, and I, I haven't heard how that's being impacted by all our other public health strategies, and what if we actually don't see with people's behavior um, these kinds of numbers that we need to even establish that time point. I worry a little bit about that. Um, and th that's my first question, just sort of thinking about the epidemiology of this and hitting time points, um, even though th those are even low for some people. Um, the other thing is, in all of your safety data, I really don't see how the uniqueness of this virus and some of the components of its immune um, its immune responses, um, not so much for immunogenicity of a vaccine, but for safety reasons in terms of the immune and thrombotic events. I see none of that in um, sort of the FDA thinking on terms of vaccine safety, which actually might be markers before the clinical disease and waiting for those clinically is maybe something we can't afford to do with this particular virus. Right. So what, what you're describing, these, these concerns that are, you know, they're, they're theoretical, but they're certainly uh, well-founded theoretical concerns. Um, we, we are interested in them. We, we mentioned enhanced respiratory disease 
um, in our guidance as, as an example of a type of immune-mediated process, chiefly because um, it, uh, it's been described with uh, another respiratory virus uh, vaccine, RSV, in, in the 1960s, and there uh, were some animal data with uh, SARS-1 uh, vaccine candidates that, that raised that concern. Um, so uh, I, I don't want the committee to come away with the, the impression that we're, we're thinking of enhanced respiratory disease as the end-all, be-all of, uh, of, of these types of concerns. Uh, we are concerned about uh, 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 phenomena that, that might manifest uh, similar to MIS uh, and, and other immune-mediated processes. And of course, we will be examining um, adverse event data that come in with the safety follow-up, uh, looking specifically at events that, that might be signals for these types of phenomena. Dr. Fink, have you thought about changing the guidance to enhance disease instead of enhance respiratory disease? Sorry, my lights just flashed off. Um, <laughs> that, that is certainly um, food for thought. Um, but but I, I do want to make clear that, that we are thinking about it. Okay, Dr. Hildreth, long list here. Uh, Dr. Hilbert, you have your own uh, phone muted. Go ahead. See if we can hear you now. Dr. Hilbert, we're still, you still have your own phone muted, sir? So, all right, we're going to go to uh, the next one, Catherine Holmes, while you get your audio uh, unmuted, uh, Dr. Hilbert, because we can't hear you. Kathleen Holmes? Um, I wanted to raise a, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, we can. Hear you, clear. <laughs> I wanted to raise a different question um, based on what you recently said. It seems to me that this is a giant experiment that's being done with many vaccines and will be possibly having a great deal of data which can inform a lot of information about this disease and this virus. We anticipate having future um, COVID-like diseases coming about and we need to find out as much as we can about these various platforms as soon as we can. But one of the things that I have not heard much about during this conversation is infection. I'd like to see how we could actually be measuring infection rather than just mild disease, and rather than saying what we should be trying to do is developing a vaccine for the most seriously affected people, we should be looking to see what can prevent infection because that is the, the rubric which would prevent spread through the community most effectively. And that is what will protect our elderly as well. And so there is a new, a new assay for uh, detecting antibody in the saliva. And I think if people use that as a test, periodically after vaccination um, to see if people had been infected sometime, you know, use it at certain intervals. It would not be onerous for the uh, vaccinees to be assayed in that way, and they could pick up which people had been infected. You made the assumption that mild cases and inapparent cases had less immunity, but that may not be true for this virus. We don't know. But all that data is out there and accessible in the populations that are being tested now. And we should be collecting that kind of data. And I don't know whose responsibility it is to do that during this time, but it seems a terrible shame to let that kind of data go to waste 
when it, so much money has been poured into this. And one of the questions that's very important to ask is, can you prevent infection as yeah, well as preventing disease? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. That That is a, a very important um, uh, measure to evaluate. And, and of course, sterilizing immunity is the, the gold standard of, of, of protection, but, but of course, not always achievable. Um, in our June 2020 guidance, uh, we did make a recommendation that uh, prevention of infection should be evaluated, um, if not as a primary endpoint, then as a secondary endpoint. And uh, that endpoint could be evaluated using either uh, serologic methods, uh, similar to what you described, not necessarily in the saliva, uh, but, but that would be an option, um, or through uh, periodic uh, sampling uh, using virologic methods, although those would have to be uh, frequent enough uh, so as you know not to to miss cases due to to only transient shedding. So we do we do agree with you that that evaluation of prevention of of in infection is important, and we have we have recommended that that studies do that. But I don't think that it would be very practical to do that with serology to get a lot of volunteers to take a lot of blood tests over time, whereas the the saliva test, which was just recently um, validated, I believe, would would perhaps be more accessible. And it would be wonderful if, I don't know if the companies would do this, but if data like that could be made accessible to investigators who would be able to use that data. And, and I don't know how that kind of information is shared in order to learn that amount of information about the virus itself. Thank you. OK, David Wentworth, uh, did you want to give me the chance again? Sure. I'll try to be brief. Um, thanks very much for staying on with us, Dr. Fink. Uh, I had a question related to this two-month uh, pre-market follow-up again. So I think you know some of your rationale, some of the rationale presented is, is quite strong. But here we're dealing with some, you know, kind of a generic recommendation in some very new platforms, such as mRNA uh, as a platform. And that's very different than most of the things that have been given to people at large, in large amounts, being mostly either just recombinant proteins or purified proteins from viruses, etc. And so I guess I wonder, did you consider a longer time frame depending on you know the platform itself. Here you're talking about a, a spike like a protein that interacts with a receptor that has physiologic you know con responses that it that it controls, and you don't exactly know where all these lipid nanoparticles are going to end up uh, in the host. So I, I guess I guess I was just wondering is is there any idea to do a longer pre market follow up for those kind of more unique platforms that we have less of an understanding of? Well, right. So first of all, just to, to clarify, when, when you talk about pre-market follow-up, uh, we're really talking about six months. Uh, the the two-month benchmark is uh, to support EUA, um, which, uh, you know, is a, is a somewhat different benefit-risk calculation, although not that different when you're talking about millions of people, admittedly. Um, so, you know, we, uh, we regulate vaccines of, of all different technologies. As Dr. Gruber uh, explained in her introductory comments, uh, we have the same uh, set of regulations that, that apply to all vaccines uh, independent of, uh, of what the, the platform technology is. Again, uh, we, we, we did consider um, uh, uh, novelty of a platform uh, among all of the variables in, in our considerations, but ultimately uh, came out with our, our guidance uh, as, as a way to strike a balance. If the, the committee um, has strong feelings or recommendations um, uh, about uh, how these considerations should be handled differently, then we would certainly want to hear that. Dr. Hill.
Dr. Hildreth, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Think... Yes, I'm here. Okay, now you please ask your question. Thank you, Dr. Monto. I just want to make two quick points uh, with Dr. Fink, if I may. Uh, the first is that uh, since severe disease and, and death occur primarily among minorities with this virus, if we put a vaccine out there that does not address that issue, it's just going to perpetuate the perception exists that that population or that segment of our population does not matter much in dealing with this, this, uh, this challenge. So I would just ask for consideration be given to making sure that whatever we do, we have a vaccine that does address severe disease. Um, and I'd like to make the other point that you said that you cannot mandate what the drug companies might set as their primary endpoints. If I'm not mistaken, the, the taxpayers of the United States of America are paying a, a, a tab for this. So maybe you have, might have more authority to mandate than you might think. I just want to put that out there. So just want to make that point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fink, for putting up with, with us for this long. I want to move the committee to the discussion items now. And uh, the I want you to think about our conclusions because we are being asked to summarize our conclusions. And I think we can lump together one and two and come up with a, a single set of conclusions for both. But let's look at number one first. Please discuss FDA's approach to safety and effectiveness data as outlined in the guidance documents, which means both EUA and full licensure. I see Dr. Meisner has a, his hand up. Dr. Miser, you can turn your camera on and unmute, I'll unmute you. I, I just wanted, I don't know if Dr. Fink um, is still on the line, but I, 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 I just wanted to clarify a point that I don't think um, is, is fully uh, understood, and that is that the FDA licenses a vaccine based on the data that are presented to the FDA. The FDA does not make recommendations as to how the vaccine should be used. That is the responsibility of the ACIP. Not, I don't know if Amanda's, Amanda Cohn is still here, but I, she might want to comment. But the I, I can comment. You're absolutely right. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I, but I, I, I think it's important for people to understand that. Yeah, th thank you very much for, for pointing that out. I, I tried to touch on that in, when I was responding to um, one of the questions, I think, about, um, about demographic representation and uh, what, an, an authorized, what population an authorized uh, use might include. And, and of course, I, I think it's also helpful to care uh, to, to clarify that, that FDA does not have the authority to, to mandate uh, demographic representation in, in clinical trials. We were required to report to Congress um, about demographic representation in, in clinical trials uh, that, that support licensure of, of products, but we can't mandate that. Um, what we can do is make sure that the product labeling uh, accurately reflects the available data um, so that recommending bodies such as ACIP and also individual healthcare providers and patients um, are are able to see whether the data applies to them and to make decisions uh, whether it's for use in an individual or use in a, a large population uh, uh, about whether the, the data uh, we would support that use. Thank you. Thank you. And you can we can you can only 
review and make make decisions about what is presented to you. And that's why we really need to have a discussion about the guidance documents, because that's what we have to go on. And we're being asked to look at them and to see if we agree with the approaches in the guidance document and uh, what we think about them in terms of their implementation. So let's get back to the guidance documents. Uh, and Dr. Notangelo, uh, you have your hand raised. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to echo what others have already mentioned. And I'm specifically now looking at the document. I have problems with the uh, standardization of efficacy. I, I First of all, I, I do appreciate that it's very important to standardize efficacy across multiple trials, multiple platforms. But the problem is that uh, these, um, uh, these efficacy measures that are included in the document, they have two problems. First of all, they really are biased, skewed towards mild disease. And that is a, that is a concern. I, I do share with Dr. Holmes, actually, her consideration that much more emphasis should have been put on, uh, um, on actual infection. Uh, and perhaps on severe disease at the same time. Mild disease uh, may not mean very much. The other problem with those um, efficacy measures is that most of them are really subjective. Uh, there are very, very few that can be uh, actually objective measures, and I think that's a major uh, concern. I mean, we're relying basically upon reporting from the subjects without any objective validation of what they're reporting. I'm, I'm really concerned about this, and this applies both to the UAE and to uh, licensure, in my mind. A um, few other comments. I, I agree completely with uh, Dr. Meissner. I think uh, at this point, based on what we've been presented, I am uh, very concerned about uh, extending um, uh, the, um, you know, immunobridging from adults to children. I think children at this point um, should not be uh, considered uh, for uh, use of this vaccine until there is sufficient evidence, and what we've been presenting today does not provide that. And finally, I think given that we are dealing with new platforms, uh, I don't really understand the reason why uh, the manufacturing facilities are not inspected. And this is something that could be done. It could be done even ahead of time. I think it would provide some additional, um, you know, trust into uh, the process. Finally, uh, you know, I understand that we, you know, the FDA cannot mandate uh, demographic breakdown. But I, I do agree um, with Dr. Ildref that if we do not have um, sufficient evidence that the minorities, and in particular, our black population are included uh, in uh, in this uh, in this uh, in a trial data. Uh, their trust will diminish even farther, and the net effect will be that perhaps the white population might be protected, and we will only see cases of severe COVID among the black, which would be a total disaster um, from a um, you know social uh, standpoint. So I, I I don't know what can be done, but it, something should be done to facilitate inclusion of a vulnerable population, in particular, uh, the black population in, uh, at this point. Thank you. Dr. Chatterjee. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, you know, as I've been listening to the discussion and the presentations today, this thought has occurred to me over and over again that what we're being asked to do is to build this plane as we fly it. And, uh, you know, in the face of a pandemic uh, that is killing hundreds of thousands of people uh, across the globe, while we would like to see some of the data and, and the rigor, in, in the scientific rigor in the studies, um, I, I do think that we have to weigh those two things. Um, as, as we deliberate on uh, what data are needed to ensure, first of all, safety. Um, I think from the um, open public hearing comments, uh, as well as uh, the, the comments that were pro provided by the uh, Reagan Udall um, Foundation folks, 
it's very clear that uh, the public has significant concerns about safety. And so I think, uh, for me at least, the most important thing is to make sure that whatever products are put on the market under whatever uh, mechanism, whether it's a BLA or, or an EUA, that first and foremost, these are safe. Um, and then you get to the effectiveness piece of it, which I think is also critically important, uh, not less so necessarily, but I prioritize those two things in my mind anyway in that fashion. And so um, the last thing I will say is with regard to the vulnerable populations around which there has been a fair amount of discussion as well, uh, I do believe that uh, it is, again, critically important uh, whether the agency has the ability to mandate it or not, it definitely has the ability to encourage the manufacturers and, and uh, ask them to include these populations that are at the highest risk of poor outcomes from this infection. So um, as we consider what's, what's going to happen um, with these products, I think it would be very important for us to keep um, that last piece in mind. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gantz. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to reiterate things that have already been said about the efficacy and certain um, study populations of all, which I agree with. My um, points are that um, in terms of number one, I really feel like they haven't gone far enough in terms of the safety outlines as people have indicated, efficacy as well. Um, we really need um, to be thinking about this differently, and we really need to be guiding what we do in terms of our safety and some of the points I brought up, which um, I didn't feel like were fully answered in terms of some of the ways in which we know this affects people and they're missing us in their safety data. So nobody's collecting, as far as I can tell, anything but immunogenicity data and they're waiting for people to get clinical outcomes that would bring them to presentation. We have no immune markers, no thrombotic markers, which again may actually be um, biomarkers that precede some of this and could prevent people from having to become ill before we actually um, see a adverse event from a biologic. So that is a safety outcome that I think should be part of this. The other part of this um, in terms of one, and we've already heard issues around the EUA and the time frame, and I think the public, as has been suggested, is probably not going to have an appetite for um, anything short of the rigorous process, which we're used to seeing, um, is that we really have to have, again, different approaches to the way in which we use our databases. It's not enough to do this kind of passive um, reporting that we have. Um, this is not going to be enough for this particular um, vaccine in the way in which we see the scrutiny. We don't have the time. We can't wait. And so we're really not utilizing our electronic capabilities at this point. This is going to feed into number three as well. And so I think those are really hugely missed opportunities that we're not going to be able to turn around and do. And the only last point I will bring up is that some of these vaccine platforms may be more um, effective in certain populations. And unless we have an adaptive way of looking at those and looking across, we don't want to bring, we should have the ability to look at these vaccines in a more real-time fashion in terms of what we approve for what populations, if one is better in the elderly versus some of our underrepresented um, individuals, we should have that ability, and we're not um, we're not situated to do that. And this needs to be done. We need to look at these differently than we have looked at other vaccines, since so many are being brought to the market. And the only last thing I did want to say, uh, I'm sorry. Only last thing I did want to say is I think we shouldn't disclude the immune bridging for children. I understand that um, there's real concerns about different safety issues. We should absolutely have those involved, but um, you know that is something that has been done for other vaccines, and it isn't something that we should completely, I feel, take off the table. Dr. Carilla, please try to 
make your points on question one. Yes, yes. So, uh, yeah, with regard to the 50 percent efficacy, I, to me, that's a, that's a minimum threshold. But I think the issue here is that it's not a threshold for, it shouldn't be the minimum for everything. And so I have some concerns about the utility of a 50 percent reduction in symptomatic disease when we don't really have any evidence that these vaccines are going to induce sterilizing immunity. And so the idea of for healthcare workers and other high-risk individuals, long-term care facility staff, that sort of thing, something that would reduce their risk of infection, for, that would take them nearly from a mild infection to potentially an asymptomatic infection where they still might be infectious doesn't seem like it's something worthy of an EUA. Now, on the other hand, a 50 percent reduction in the progression in high-risk groups to serious disease, um, you know, that is actually very quite significant. Uh, and so I, that is something that to me would be EUA-able. Uh, so, you know, for, 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 the, for the first responders and primary health care workers and, and LTCF staff, uh, the, 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 the minimum has to be much, much higher in terms of having a general overall public health, public health Im impact. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think it can't just be whatever group, whatever group hits the target, that's what gets EUA'd. Uh, Dr. Curla, how do you do that from a feasibility standpoint, having flexible outcomes for different uh, flexible efficacy for different outcomes. Well, no, no, no. I did, so, so they have their protocol. They have their, they have, they have their trial design. But when they do that, it's going to be these interim readouts, and you're going to get some assessment of efficacy. Now, if if they come out and say that that uh, you know normal healthy adults, we only saw a 55 percent reduction in 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 COVID. Uh, I, I, that just doesn't that just doesn't strike me as something that I would want to EUA because I don't think it's going to have that significant of a public health impact, uh, coupled with the fact that people get the vaccine and that they may in fact be unaware. So almost half the people would be not protected. They may not, and they may still get mild or asymptomatic disease anyway, regardless of whether they've been vaccinated or not. No idea, unaware of their infectious state. Now, a 50% reduction in a high-risk group that goes on to more serious disease, that I think is something that, is, that merits at least some consideration for, for an EUA. It would target those groups that are at a much higher risk. Dr. Krause. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Mondo. I just wanted to make a comment because it's very difficult when thinking about different possible endpoints to think about what they mean. And, and, of course, this also has to be thought about in terms of the frequency of each of these possible endpoints. So if the endpoint of the trials is severe disease, the trials may need to be almost 10 times as big. And uh, uh, those trials would be infeasible, and we would never get a vaccine. If the endpoints are infection, that can, with some additional work, be a feasible endpoint, but the science is not there to do that right now. So what, what we have looked at is the fact that a, uh, um, a, a vaccine that is in general effective against mild disease, there simply does not exist an example in vaccinology of vaccines that are effective against mild disease that are not more effective against severe disease. And so a 50% effective vaccine against mild disease is very likely to be greater than 50% effective against severe disease. And, and Except, Phil, Phil, many of the groups at risk for, for, for uh, severe uh, disease uh, don't respond uh, well to vaccines in the first place. Uh, I, I'm not we hearing you, Mike. a lot of people who want to make comments. Please. Um, and, 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 and so, 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 so that is the rationale. Now, the 30% lower bound is absolutely critical as well. And if you want to have a 30% lower bound for severe disease, that also makes the trial much, much bigger. But the trouble is, is that when you're dealing with many different vaccines, if you don't have stringent statistical criteria for success, uh, there's a very high risk that a vaccine that has 
marginal benefit or possibly even no benefit will meet the criteria just by chance because we're not talking about just evaluating a single vaccine, we're talking about evaluating multiple vaccines. So if you're going to do evaluations of vaccines, you have to look at what is feasible and what will give you the information that you need. And don't forget that these trials are intended to continue well beyond whatever the timing of these interim analyses would be, and will continue to gather information about impact on severe disease. And so they're designed to ultimately get the information that is needed. And so one of the questions that you are being asked, of course, as a committee member is, what, what is the level that makes you comfortable with an EUA? Or what is the com level that makes you comfortable with broader deployment of the vaccine? And, and so, so that, that is, uh, uh, of course, a balance between looking at people's right to take something where it's determined that the benefit might exceed the risk, while also making sure that we don't interfere with the public health good, the public good associated with of continuing to evaluate that vaccine and other vaccines, while also making sure that, that people are not taking vaccines that, uh, uh, that might actually harm them. And so, so it, it, it is a, a difficult balance to figure out exactly where that is. And, and it, it, it may be, uh, as you know, Marion did put forward the expanded access regulations as one approach that could be used. One could potentially contemplate an EUA for a rather limited population. But of course, one doesn't want, if there's a vaccine that appears to have high efficacy or appears to be capable of saving lives, one doesn't want to stop that vaccine if there's a significant chance that it will save lives, because that's part of the public health calculus as well. So I will stop there. Thank you, Dr. Krauss. I think we're going to have to move on. We've got a lot of people who want to uh, uh, make comments. I think what we have to do is keep focusing on EUAs versus BLA's formal licensure and not really try to talk about sterilizing immunity or other things which are not part of standard vaccine licensure. Most of our vaccines are licensed to prevent uh, laboratory confirmed disease. And uh, those diseases are different depending on uh, what, they, what they are. And we rarely get into looking at a de definition of serious disease. And uh, as Dr. Krause said, things that prevent infection and uh, laboratory confirmed infection typically prevent serious disease and maybe do, do a better job at that. Uh, Dr. Cohen. Hi, can you see me? Oh. Okay. Um, so yep. I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, first of all, I really appreciate the um, balance that FDA is trying to strike. I think they've captured the challenge between um, ensuring a safe and effective vaccine and um, and not withholding a potentially safe, a safe and effective vaccine from uh, from use. I want to make two points. One is that um, I am actually less concerned about, for example, adverse events um, in the 30,000 uh, participants in a clinical trial um, after the two-month follow-up as I am potentially about more uh, rare adverse events and. Anything in terms of uh, prolonging or thinking about waiting longer is it for from an EUA perspective won't change that. But this is why we have our safety surveillance post authorization needs to be so strong and effective so that we do identify potentially more rare adverse events than you would identify in a in a trial with 30,000 individuals. Um, the second point I want to make is that um, I do worry a little bit that the VE estimate for um, mild disease uh, may be over, um, overestimated when we're just looking at the first two months after vaccination, and that we may have a lower VE estimate, for example, if we uh, looked at the data after uh, four or six months, uh, just because of waning immunity. Um, very rarely do we look at VE 
so shortly uh, after um, after uh, after uh, completing the series, and so I do I don't think it's um, I don't think it's a factor that would uh, lean me towards um, not agreeing with the 50%, but I do think it could be a potential communication issue if it hovers on that 50% point estimate after two months and then it uh, falls much lower um, when we actually look at the data for BLA. Which is why we have to continue to keep the randomized design, right? Okay, is the next one that my, I've, I've gone off, yep. so. Uh, next one we have is, is, is Paul. Uh, uh, Dr. Paul Offit, on mute you. Hi, okay. so, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Paul oh, or Paul? Sorry, not me. Paul or Paul? Let me, let me feed my spot to you. Oh, it's, okay. It's actually, it's actually a song, isn't it? Um, wait, did I just lose that? Let me go back to this. Sorry. Uh, Dr. There yes, we go. I'll, I'll be quick. All I'll right, quick. there you are. <laughs> um, so just, uh, it, it is disappointing. I think that, that given that this is a vaccine is being paid for by the public, I mean, BARDA is public money, that, that, the, that the FDA can't direct this vaccine to be make sure we are testing it in groups like those who are at greatest risk of various racial or ethnic backgrounds, health problems, or, uh, or age. That said, I mean, I'm on the NIH active group, um, which was put together months ago by Dr. Collins, and, and on that group were members of, of the, uh, the industry, Pfizer, Moderna, Merck, and Ophi were, were all, are on that working group. And so when, we, when Larry Corey, who headed the clinical trial subcommittee, uh, was putting together how he wanted these trials to be done, um, this was key. I mean, we, we did not want this to be a study of, you know, healthy young white people. We wanted this to be a study that represented the American public at greatest risk. And my sense from those discussions is that is exactly what they're going to do. So I don't, I understand uh, Dr. Hildreth's concern, but I think when, when this is plays out that we're going to find that, uh, that these are represented uh, groups. And in fact, one of the companies actually slowed recruitment because they weren't getting enough in the way of minorities. So I, I don't think in the end this is going to be a problem, but we'll see. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Offit. And I've heard there are also lots of outcomes. Uh, Dr. Nunciato. OK. I just wanted to make a point that, you know, vaccine researchers and developers, manufacturers, public health um, entities, and so many others have really collaborated, collaborated in a very focused way in order to try to deliver safe and effective vaccines in this very short period of time after the emergence of this virus. And I think what I've heard today, at least, is that there's this broad concern that the speed of this response um, has been at the expense of careful scientific methods. And, and we need to continue to work to address this perception. But that being said, I, I myself find that the thoughtful consideration and the clear guidance that the agencies provided uh, in these two guidance documents um, on the regulatory requirements for full licensure as well as for EUA uh, will, in fact, help us as manufacturers and sponsors uh, develop COVID-19 vaccines um, that will be held to the highest standards, as, as we've heard today. Um, and, and so I, in fact, want to um, uh, commend, uh, you know, our colleagues that we've heard from today uh, from the FDA for their, you know, timely and, and careful consideration, understanding, um, as has been said, we're trying to fly and build this plane at the same time and that nothing will be perfect. I, I do think that, that these guidances have uh, struck a, a, a key balance. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and um, should be supported. Mr. Tobin. So I also appreciate the difficult balancing test that the balancing has to go on here and all the work that the folks at FDA put into this. I'm coming, obviously, from the consumer rep point of view, no technical background, so all I have really is you know, I've tried to uh, follow up on 
on what's been going on in common sense. But also, I'm very affected by the public perception because in this particular case, public trust equals success. Lack of trust means no success. That seems pretty clear. And where that leads me to is a conclusion that EUA probably should not be used here. And I say that because first start with the fact that EUA is, is almost always used, I think there's one exception, for uh, people who are sick. And you're, you're basically uh, putting something which is not fully tested, but they are ill, and so it makes sense you have to do something, and, and the balance changes there. Vaccines is a different story. But almost everybody who's going to be injected is going to be healthy at the time they get the injection. So I, I think that has to be factored in anyway. But on top of that, we have serious vaccine hesitancy. And, and now we have, as the speaker has made clear, and really I, I greatly, I think we all appreciated uh, the Reagan Udall uh, Foundation data and information because basically what we're hearing is that the perception is that this is the speed and uh, is a result of political pressure. And that's what this is really about. It's not about the science. It's not true. But that is the perception. And so anything that sounds like emergency use authorization, you know, it, it sounds like it's being done rushed and it's not the full review. So even if it were, even if EUA standards were similar to full life insurer, it doesn't sound good to the public. And again, what it sounds like matters. But here, there is a difference. And that, I mean, there are several differences. But one is, the primary one is duration. It's that it would be median two months and whereas as I understand it, full licensure is probably like six months. So they're really that duration makes a difference in terms of both safety and efficacy. And the other thing that's pointed out, right in the, the, the second question, I'm sorry jumping ahead, but the, the problem of people bailing from the test, if you go if EA, EUA is granted, what happens is people in the placebo, you know, they, they move forward um, getting the thing anyway. So those are a lot of problems with an EUA in this particular situation. And that's before we get to the problem of, of likely poor participation by people of color um, in, in some of the studies, although Moderna it sounds like they've done a great job there. Um, I think that what Corey said, it really sums it up for me, which is there's only one chance to, you know, to, to do this, to do it right. If we do it wrong, then we're done for. It'll be years. Um, because the there's already a serious problem of lack of trust. The trust will become so severe at that point that we won't be able to dig out of it. So given all of this and that public um, sorry, um, I was muted for a second there. Um, I, I would recommend that we, we not do EUA here. Um, but if we're going to do it, I would suggest the following, um, that it be done for a longer period, um, not two months, maybe three or four months. Um, and, and two other things. If we were told that the primary endpoint can't be, can't be determined, and I, I'm surprised by that. I agree with Dr. Hildreth. That looks worth looking at. If the taxpayers are paying, we maybe should be able to identify the, the primary endpoint. But in any event, it could be the basis for EUA. If you're going to get EUA, then the primary endpoint has to be something more serious in terms of serious disease. And lastly, Again, if we can't determine who are the demographics of who's actually in the study, we could say if it turns out that the demographics were not good, then we're not going to grant EUA because of the risk. Whereas a company like Moderna, I guess, has really good participation as representative, that might be a reason if we're going to prove EUA. But I would be very, very reluctant to do it under all these circumstances, and particularly the, the public's um, hesitancy over this particular project. Dr. Krauss, I see you have your hand raised. Uh, was that from before? Even if you, if it was from before, maybe you could uh, comment about the term EUA. Is there anything else it could be called, uh, thinking back to other issues? And uh, we also heard about longer than two months. Seems to me that uh, if we answer uh, positively, if we can figure out how to continue the randomization, it doesn't really matter that much whether it's two months or four months. Are you available? Uh, yes, here I am. So 
Um, I, I, my hand was up from before. I, I took it down now. But so, you know, we're obviously working within the framework of the regulations that we have. And so the emergency use authorization is one of the things that we can do. And expanded access is one of the things we can do. And uh, BLA is one of the things we can do. One of the problems with the emergency use authorization is that it's positioned in this way that is, on the one hand, close to BLA, where we would like to have fairly high standards for it. And yet, the EUA also does, in fact, represent um, uh, an investigational product. It hasn't yet met the standards for licensure. And you've heard some of the data differences, which include follow-up. But I don't want you to underestimate the importance of the FDA review that goes along with the BLA, too. Because under BLA, the FDA has actually carefully reviewed essentially every single person who's been in those trials and looked at what happened to them and has carefully looked at the manufacturing process and all the ways in which the manufacturing process is controlled to make sure that this product can be consistently made. And so uh, although if there were an EUA, the standards would be very high, as you've heard, uh, there is no way that they could be as high uh, uh, as they would be for a BLA. And it is possible that something which is a product which is given an EUA may not receive a BLA because they can't meet those standards. Well, well, the hope would be that uh, if it got an EUA, because uh, it had at least the clinical data that would make it likely to meet the BLA standards uh, initially, that uh, uh, that it would receive the BLA. But of course, it's conceivable with additional follow-up or with the active safety follow-up that FDA is also requesting during a period of an EUA, that something would be uncovered about that product which would make one not want to license right, it. Right, that's what I mean. And that's why the EUA product is investigational. It's not a guarantee of a BLA. And yet we would hope that products that are made available under EUA would subsequently qualify for BLA. And as you plan, any issuance of an EUA will uh, also have a committee review. That is absolutely correct, and that's in, in the guidance, and uh, we've heard uh, uh, both Dr. Hahn and Dr. Marks uh, commit to that as well. So that we will have a second chance to go over the specifics once we agree to the principles that have been put forward today in the guidance. Uh, that is indeed correct. Okay. One more hand raise, and that's Dr. Perlman. Oh, I'm up there. Yeah, I just want to add to the uh, idea that we should that we might want to prolong the two months to a few more months, uh, but for a few reasons. First, from what we know about uh, common coronaviruses and immune responses, we know that that two months is probably a good immune response and that it wanes between six and 12 months is plenty of illustrations of reinfection. Whether vaccine is going to be the same, of course, we don't know. But as you have waning vaccines, you might have more chances to have any adverse, not adverse effects, but rather vaccine uh, problems, vaccine-related uh, problems that uh, wouldn't be seen at the two-month mark. In a way, two months is would pick up a lot of the early adverse events, but I think it's a continuum. We certainly know the measles vaccine wasn't picked up as a problem until the killed one until two to three years, and we're not going to go that long. So there's a continuum, and it's kind of a, to me, in my mind, it's an arbitrary point of where you do things, weighing everything together. But if you do a few more months, and if this behaves like the uh, responses to the common cold uh, coronaviruses, we may have a chance to pick up some of these vaccine-related problems that uh, we might not see in two months. But that's going to be followed if we keep the randomized trials going. Yeah. Which is which the next, the, really the, big the next point. Yeah, yeah. So uh, before we go on to number two, which uh, again is related, uh, I just want to summarize what I've heard. And that is there is some concern about the period of two months as being somewhat arbitrary, but recognition that the uh, study will still be going on if uh, randomization can be continued, at least in a large 
subset of those that are being studied or receive, uh, receive the EUA, uh, that we want to be sure that minorities are represented. And then, and this is a little bit outside the scope, uh, concern about immunobridging to uh, children, that uh, there's only one trial that goes down to age 12 and because uh, of issues of uh, immune response, et cetera, and uh, MISC, uh, there is concern that uh, uh, it may be an inappropriate to use standard bridging guidelines. Saying that, let's go ahead and try to talk about the very thorny issue of continue blinding a phase three clinical trials if an EUA has been issued. I know that uh, in one of the letters we received uh, from one of the manufacturers, it said that uh, anybody who is eligible to receive uh, the uh, vaccine under EUA who has been in the clinical trial will for ethical reasons, be offered, uh, and in the placebo group, will be offered uh, vaccine, which breaks the blind. Uh, let's uh, have a more general discussion of this issue because one of the reasons why we would feel comfortable with uh, getting the EUA issued after two months is that there will be continued follow-up to see if there's waning of immunity, to see if there are side effects over a longer period of time. So uh, I'd like some contributions about clever ideas about how to continue observations uh, even though an EUA is issued, and I think there may be issues also about how much vaccine is available at the time of issuance of the EUA, and the fact that certain population groups might be included in the EUA, and other groups would still not be able to receive vaccine under the EUA, and therefore could be continued uh, in the uh, 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 in in the uh, the randomized trials. So uh, Cody Meisner is up next. Thank you. I, uh, if um, yes, thank you. Uh, I I just wanted to make one comment about why the two month interval I think was selected. And, and in terms of follow-up for the vaccine, it's a tie-on to the last discussion. But most adverse reactions occur within the first six weeks following administration of the vaccine. For example, Guillain-Barre syndrome, when that's followed an influenza vaccine, have occurred with, uh, within that uh, um, four to six week window. So I think that's the basis of selecting eight weeks. I agree it's short for vaccines with a new platform, but I don't think it's a completely random selection. So that was just a, a tie-on. Then in terms of the question, thank you. I'm sorry? I said thank you for that. I think, I, I, I think that's a very important observation and why the two months was chosen. So please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Monto. I, and then the question I have on, on, on unblinding is, was this addressed, this issue addressed in the informed consent that everyone must have signed? It, it, I can't imagine that the informed consent didn't address the issue of what would happen if uh, there was a conclusion. And so I think isn't, isn't, that should be stated. A very interesting point. Uh, most informed consent say that people can uh, withdraw at any time, anyway. So, uh, is there anybody who can uh, respond to that, Dr. Krause? 
Uh, yes, yeah, so, so in general in these trials, there is not built into the trial protocol crossover. And so there has not been any promise to the people in the trial that they will be eligible to receive a vaccine when it becomes available. And of course, if they were to become eligible, the question would be when. If the EUA came about as a result of an interim analysis, would that be the time at which one would do that, or would one wait until uh, the, the trial had actually finished? And the vaccine then might be, uh, one had more data, and the vaccine might be available for licensure. But uh, uh, to answer your question, there isn't a priori any promise to the people in the trial that they will, uh, uh, will receive that. And so presumably, that kind of a promise was not required to induce, uh, obviously, the volunteers who, I think, generally joined the trials out of, out of a sense of altruism and a desire to help. Um, uh, but uh, so it, it, to, to continue them on placebo wouldn't break a deal. I'll make one other point, and that is that vaccine recipients, placebo recipients, otherwise likely wouldn't be the first in line to get a vaccine. Normally, you would think about uh, the first in line, uh, even uh, uh, as a vaccine became available, would be those who uh, um, are at greatest risk, uh, or, or uh, uh, perhaps members of underrepresented minority groups and so forth. And if, if anything, the average trial re recipient might actually be at a lower priority than, than certain other people who might be in line to get a vaccine. And then, and then of course, third, um, not prioritizing placebo recipients to get vaccine once it becomes available, uh, uh, even if the vaccine is 100% effective, doesn't put them at enormous risk. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, everybody is at some risk, but uh, uh, everybody also has other ways to protect themselves. And even if these people are kept in the trial for some additional period of time, many of them will surely get the vaccine long before other people do, just because of the, the likely availability and the rollout of vaccine. And in fact, we heard this morning uh, in one of the presentations that many people will want to wait at least six months before a vaccine is made available before they would take it anyway. And so uh, uh, that sort of is an, an argument also that there may, may not be a, a clear obligation to people who are in the trial to, uh, uh, to give them uh, a vaccine, if, even if they were originally um, randomized to placebo once there was an EUA. So I, I'm sort of summarizing these. These are arguments that I've heard. I'm not myself an ethicist, but I have heard discussions of ethicists on this general topic. And these are some of the, the, the considerations that are brought forward uh, in, in thinking about this, uh, make the argument that there, that there wouldn't necessarily be a strong reason why one had to do it. So for those who say there's an ethical reason, uh, I, I think that that's uh, uh, perhaps overstating the case. I, I agree. While you are there, Dr. Krauss, can I ask you whether an EUA could be issued for uh, health care workers or first responders or uh, groups like that? That's usually something that's handled by ACIP. Uh, so I think we would have to figure that out. It's, it's difficult. One could contemplate a very limited EUA based on a perception of what the risk was, for instance, because the EUA is, is uh, uh, authorized based on a benefit-risk calculation. And so if one were to, were to say, well, we want to make this vaccine available to people who are in the highest risk group, one could try to cut it that way. Uh, I think it may, might be harder to, uh, uh, to do it based on on other factors than, than risk, uh, although uh, you know that's not something that we've in the past done. There's only been one vaccine EUA in history, uh, and 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 so uh, um, uh, exactly what we're able to do there is unclear. Of course, one one alternative might be to uh, uh, if uh, vaccines become available early to to, to use them under expanded app, not become available. Sorry, if an interim analysis suggest efficacy, one could start with an expanded access, and then as one gathered data, then perhaps move to an EUA. But of course, there's some complexities there also. Under expanded access, one surely would have very, very high degree of control over who could get the vaccine. Was that the anthrax vaccine that you're referring to in terms of the previous EUA? Yes. Yes, it was. Yes. And that was a little different, right, because it was outdated vaccine for first responders? Primarily for the military, actually. 
are at two. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pergen. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I want to just emphasize one of the points that you made, um, Arnold, is that um, I'm not actually sure how much vaccine is going to be available. And so this is really going to be part of the EUA thought process, is making an EUA available does not necessarily indicate that we're going to have a ton of vaccine that we're going to be able to give to people. And that sort of makes you wonder, again, what's our, what's our goal here? So I think we're going to have to specify what groups potentially. I'm not sure we can do that, as has been described, it may be an ACIP issue. But I, I, if healthcare workers are first you know, in line definitely to get vaccine, that would make sense. Um, what I'd really like to know and what we didn't get a chance to ask was the, the Reagan um, Girdle group um, a little bit more about they, they did these analysis of two different populations, the general public and healthcare workers. I'd be really curious to know how healthcare workers felt about getting an EUA vaccine versus one that has been fully addressed in a, in a phase three trial. Because I think they're necessarily going to be people that are more educated and may want to wait until it's been finalized. And I also have to say that healthcare workers in general, while they are a high risk group because of exposure, the data does not suggest that they're the ones with the most disease by any stretch, because they are the ones with the most PPE. And so I, I worry about the perception that might come across with that. Right. I think that's the problem with healthcare workers. If they have EUA, if they have PP, uh, 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 PPE, uh, the infection rates are very low. But uh, I just put them out as a group that's usually listed at, uh, as, as being at risk. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Mondrangelo. Not Angelo. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monto. Um, well, it seems to me that continuation of blinded phase clinical trials is absolutely critical. And so we should do all what we can uh, to make sure that they continue. Um, I think, you know, some of the ideas that have been proposed uh, by you and also uh, emphasized by Dr. Krauss are, I think, what we should be doing. So if we issue an UAE, if, you, if, you, if we agree on the issue of an UAE, uh, at that point, I think the next step would be uh, to have a prioritization of which groups would be entitled to receive the vaccine. And, you know, healthcare workers may not be the right population, but perhaps nursing homes uh, people who are in a nursing home might be a good population uh, for testing. Uh, that would allow basically us to gain time so that we uh, would have continuation of the blinded phase clinical three trials to, to accumulate all of the data that are required for full licensure. I wonder whether uh, we can uh, also, um, you know, invite uh, the FDA to initiate a conversation with ACIP. I mean, there was, I think, the, I think it was the infectious disease society representative that proposed a, a joint action with ACIP, and that might be something to consider. But along that line, I think, you know, a UAE issuance would not necessarily prevent continuation of blinded clinical, uh, blinded phase three clinical trials, and I think that would be important. Dr. Chatterjee. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, just a couple of points. One is a follow-up, which is with regard to who will get this vaccine and how quickly will they get it. Um, as best I understand it, uh, and I'm sure that the, the sponsors know this in terms of who is in their trials, uh, the likelihood that there are uh, a bunch of um, healthcare workers or first responders who are in their trials, I think is fairly small. So. Uh, you know, in terms of losing people from the trials because they're the, they're the ones who've been prioritized to receive the vaccine early on, I, I think is, is less likely to happen. The other thing goes back to a couple of people mentioned this already, which is how quickly do we get this vaccine out to people? You know, it may be actually, even with all the kitting and everything that's being done to position the vaccine to be pushed out as quickly as it's uh, authorized license, it's probably going to take several months before the vaccine gets into people's arms. And so there will be this lag, there will be this delay during which the data will continue to be accumulated. 
And so I just wanted to make that point. The second one is with regard to waning immunity and, and what happens uh, two months out versus six months out. So I wish I could quote you the, the data, but uh, as probably everyone on this call is aware, the ID week um, is going on right now. And I saw a presentation yesterday on um, zero uh, prevalence studies and, and you know what happens to, with natural infection, what happens to the immunity. And it seems like, yes, there is a waning, but then there's a plateau that goes on for several months. Uh, and of course, not having a serologic uh, correlate of protection, we don't know whether that's sufficient to protect people from infection or from disease. Um, but it certainly doesn't look like it sort of goes up and goes down and, and disappears. Yeah, that, uh, waning is something uh, which our group has been studying very uh, carefully with influenza vaccine. And you're absolutely right. The waning occurs uh, quickly right after vaccination and then sort of plateaus going out. And uh, we really do not understand uh, uh, with, uh, with coronaviruses what uh, what the, uh, what will be the case, and I think we just have to learn about that as we go forward. One of the questions that we can never ask answer about a uh, about a vaccine when it's licensed is how long it's going to last and whether we're going to need boosters. So uh, let's go on to uh, Amanda Cohen. Hi. Um, I want to go back to uh, the question about the unblinding, and it, it, it feels like I agree with everything Dr. Krauss said, but it feels like there's a difference between actively unblinding and offering study participants vaccine versus an EUA being um, available and in in somebody pot potentially being in a recommended group to get the vaccine and them making a choice to go get the vaccine, but maybe not knowing. Um, I, I, what I'm trying to say is that it, I wonder if all the study participants understand that they did potentially get a placebo, and if there's something that you could do to sort of um, make study participants aware that if they are in a recommended group, they could consider going to get vaccinated um, while not unblinding the results, if that makes sense. I, I, I do worry about um, telling a person that they should not go get vaccinated when they are in one of the prioritized groups, potentially. I also agree that there will be limited doses early, and um, there won't be that many participants in the study who will be recommended for vaccine early. Thank you. Mr. T Mr. Taubman? Um, I so, Dr. Bond, I have a question for you first, because I'm confused by something. You had said that one of the companies... I'm probably was, just as confused. Go ahead. <laughs> I believe you said that one of the sponsors had sent letters to all the participants saying that... To, the committee, to our committee. It was sent to our committee. It's in the oh, file, the box file that we got. And, and, and what did the letter say, since I'm not going to look it up right, right now? The letter says that for ethical reasons, they may have to tell the placebo recipients uh, that there is an EU, there is EUA available vaccine which they can receive. Okay, so here's the thing that occurs to me. Um, as pointed out by Dr. Krauss and others, there may not be enough vaccine anyway. So if, if, it, if it becomes a choice, it's not a real choice. But the problem, as I understand it, is if those people, even though they can't get it, now know that they're in the placebo group, their behavior may change. That's the whole reason for having a blind exactly. study. Exactly. Nobody knows if they're exactly. protected or not, so they all act, both sides act the same. And you basically destroy I, I that as you inform them. I probably shouldn't have brought that letter up. It was in our file. And uh, I had some questions raised by it uh, because of the uh, potential for unblinding, which uh, destroys the whole purpose of a randomized trial. But uh, I think we can worry about that when, if and when that uh, 
company's product comes before us. So uh, I apologize for bringing it up, but I just wanted to point out the complexity of this issue and that we should be uh, pretty firm about what we want and what we are, are unhappy with in terms of well, continuing the blinding. Right. And I mean, obviously, this goes back to the earlier question, but this is a problem. There's no question we, we've got a problem here if we do EUA under these circumstances, and that's where you know, we should be careful. And by the way, I did appreciate Dr. Uh, 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 Cody talking about why they picked two months, but that, that's the reason they chose two months, because in the past it's generally been six weeks, but with new platforms we don't know. So I'm just I'm confused why we're not being willing to be open to extending that period to what the WHO used. Save that for later, I guess. Okay, Dr. Nelson. Everybody's different. Mm -hmm. One of the, what's that? Uh, Dr. Nelson, uh, you're on, you're on mute, sir. That was fast. Dr. Nelson, can you say something? <laughs> it's so complicated, Barbara. I think we can hear you now. Ms. Go ahead, say something, Dr. Nelson. How about now? Oh, there we go. We got gotcha. you. Yeah. So I had to log back in, and apparently my phone number got disconnected from the video. <laughs> You're good. Uh, Dr. Monto, I did want to make a point regarding your concluding summary for question number one for the record. Uh, there was a lot of concern about the primary endpoint being in favor or at least enabling the potential for milder disease, and I hope you catch that as part of the conclusion of the discussion. With respect to this particular question number two, I think it is important to make the distinction between continued monitoring of placebo recipients versus ongoing enrollment in the potential for new placebo recipients to receive vaccines. Two very different scenarios in the presence of an EUA vaccine on the street. And I would highly recommend, since they're asking for recommendations for guidance to industry, that we would ask that those that continue to enroll once in EUAs on the street have a specific plan for when placebo recipients will at some point be enabled to receive a vaccine to protect them from this disease. Dr. Annunciato. Hi. Th thank you very much. I, I wanted to address some of the points and questions that Amanda Cohen and, and that Dr. Nelson had brought up. Uh, because we and I know others have, have, do have experience conducting placebo-controlled trials for um, approved and available vaccines. And, and there are a couple of critical considerations that you really need to keep in mind when you're doing uh, studies in, in this way. So, of course, the trial objectives need to address important clinical scientific questions, and uh, that's the situation we're talking about here. Um, and as part of the informed consent process, participants have to receive clear information about the availability of an approved vaccine for them um, and that they can receive the vaccine outside of the clinical trial that they're being asked to participate in, uh, that they may receive placebo or an unapproved vaccine if they join the study, and, and how long they're being asked not to be vaccinated with an approved vaccine that they're otherwise, you know, could access. And when I say the informed consent process, this is something that happens, as you all probably know, not just when a subject or a volunteer first joins the trial, but as um, the scientific knowledge and the availability of vaccines or treatments um, evolve during the conduct of the trial, um, the consent process needs to be, uh, you know, done again, so to say, 
uh, subjects are reconsented to make sure that they're aware of the most uh, current information. Um, so, you know, we think that these principles would apply if a vaccine were to be granted in EUA or full approval for COVID. Um, and, uh, but we really need to also think about the feasibility of conducting placebo-controlled studies if, in fact, there is a vaccine available to the general population or even to specific segments of the population by an EUA. And so this is really going to depend on the specific, I, I would say, indication, but perhaps it's really the recommendation, you know, how the EUA approved vaccine would be uh, administered, who, who would be able to access it, um, whether or not all the countries that you're part, uh, that are participating in your trial have approved vaccine provisioned as well, um, and the availability of the vaccine, you know, uh, 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 to the different um, uh, specific groups who are in your study. There are a couple other really unique aspects to this situation that have really struck me in in listening to people talk today. Um, that's going to create additional challenges for investigators and sponsor, sponsors of these studies. Um, and these might not be actually overcomable. We'll, we'll have to see and think carefully about it. But the great public attention that's being given to this vaccine, these vaccine development programs and the strong perceptions, you know, based on a variety of concerns um, may in fact uh, preclude continuation of, of, of some of these placebo controlled studies uh, we'll just have to monitor and watch this carefully. Uh, in fact, if vaccines uh, do become available to the entire U.S. population, I, I think we heard earlier today that the projections are that you know by by next summer that 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 may be in fact um, a reality. Uh, and so, as I said, you know this is something we'll have to monitor and and watch. Uh, but just in general, uh, you know, typically you are able to continue your studies. Um, under these cir circumstances. Thank you. I just wanted to remind us all that uh, we have been using observational data for a lot of uh, effectiveness studies. So what looks like logistically difficult, maintaining the blind for very long periods of time may not actually be nested, both not feasible and not necessary as we go forward. And that's why we're shortly going to get into question number three, which uh, really looks at uh, other kinds of observations. I see one more hand raised, uh, Dr. Carrillo. Thank you. Um, yeah, just wanted to make one comment, follow on a couple of other comments with regard to the to the unblinding. And it's my understanding, Dr. Krauss can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think FDA would be issuing an EUA for specific populations such as healthcare workers or something like that. I would assume that they would be issuing an EUA based on the data for the specific populations within the trial protocol upon which randomization was done. And I know, for example, having read one of the protocols, that the randomization was done on individuals under 65, under 65 with, with comorbid conditions, and there was a list of those specific ones that would put them in that, quote, high-risk category, and then over 65. So those would be, I would assume, the, the, the available data sets upon which an EUA would be based. Now, just because an EUA is issued for people under 65 doesn't necessarily mean that everybody under 65 gets it. Some, there isn't going to be enough vaccine in the first place, but that's where a group like ACIP or other entities are going to have to make a decision on what, what, high, what risk groups based on exposure as opposed to just based on uh, their particular characteristics um, from, from the trial design would, would specify. So I, I, I don't think that it's going to really be a major issue in terms of preventing the ongoing conduct of the, of the phase three trial. Especially if the vaccine is available in relatively short supply. Uh, Dr. Krauss, did you have anything further to 
say before I attempt to summarize, which is going to be rather difficult? Oh, that's fine. Thank you very much. Okay, so we all wish we could continue uh, unblinded uh, or blinded uh, collection of data, but we realize that there may be some problems. We've talked about various scenarios that might be used, and uh, this is something which we would like to see, but if we cannot, then we move into uh, follow-up studies uh, on uh, uh, in, in an observational setting, and uh, therefore we will go into uh, question number three. Please discuss studies following licensure and or issuance of an EUA for COVID-19 vaccines too, and firstly, safety, efficacy, and immune markers of protection. And I let's leave out immune markers of protection because that's a whole different issue. So let's just look at safety and effectiveness. All right, the first person we have in there is uh, Dr. Gans. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned when I was um, talking about one, which kind of overlaps because it's the same safety things, I did just want to put in a plug for in terms of safety. Um, um, there's a couple of things that I think are problematic. The first one is that the solicited um, safety profile is only through day seven. I think that's problematic um, and should probably extend longer than that. Um, but this is post-marketing anyway. Um, the post-marketing, I think, from what we heard earlier, is a little problematic in a, a couple of things. So the first line people who may be issued this, um, we heard about healthcare workers, we heard about certain populations, and a lot of them are not going to be included in the databases that are currently being used um, to monitor these um, safety events as we go through, particularly the non-passive ones. So VARES is obviously anybody. And so that's really problematic. The problematic issue is also going to be a lag in time. So the number of doses that have to be administered to actually get a signal on VSD or something like that is actually problematic. Again, given the people who are likely to get it first might not be within those systems. So I think we need to be more dynamic and more flexible in how we think about these. I also think we're not utilizing our new platforms. So there was some talk about um, uh, using the um, signal system and using BEST, but it wasn't clear from the presentations that they're actually looking at these and then using some kind of phone platform where people can um, also self-report. So I think all those have to be actually incorporated into what we would see in terms of the safety signals um, moving forward. So I think those are going to be very important. Um, I would say that in terms of safety, we also have to add some other kinds of markers. I'm not going to talk about the um, markers of protection because I think they're going to do all the B cell and T cell studies particular to SARS-CoV-2. I think that's fine um, and we'll learn something perhaps from that. But um, the markers that I am particularly interested in are in the pro-inflammatory and pro-thrombotic, which I think need to be part of an ongoing um, safety signal that would be part of that. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to add there. Dr. Chatterjee. Yes, thank you. Um, so just a couple of quick points to make. Uh, with regard to, to safety, I think, um, you know, <clears throat> particularly studying uh, subpopulations would be important. Um, and and making sure that uh, this whatever products get licensed or authorized are actually safe in the populations that they might be used in. So so that would be one. The other is the longer term uh, follow up uh, could be uh, maybe more months to years that that might be necessary uh, to identify. Um, 
safety signals that might not show up immediately. Uh, and with regard to effectiveness, uh, it's uh, similar kinds of things, um, particularly as we talked about, you know, the effectiveness against uh, severe disease uh, and in, in those populations that are disproportionately affected, as well as how long uh, the immunity actually lasts. Um, and then uh, with regard to the specific populations, we've talked about this already uh, for children. I think in terms of uh, immunobridging uh, for, for effectiveness, even though we don't have a serologic correlate of protection, but if it appears to be protective in adults, perhaps we could, we could look at that. But the safety issue is a very different animal, I think. And uh, I think the studies do need to be done in, in children to assure that, uh, that these products will actually be safe for youth and children. Thank you, Dr. Notangelo. Thank you. So Dr. Monta, first of all, I would like to endorse your proposal uh, not to talk about enhanced respiratory disease, but to comment on enhanced disease, and that would include also all of the vascular thrombotic events uh, that were mentioned before. My other comment is about children. As you heard from my previous comments, uh, at this point I'm not, um, I'm not particularly eager uh, to have children um, as uh, potential candidates for receiving vaccines. I don't think we have enough data there, uh, and I don't think we can use the argument of immunobridging uh, because I might say something that is very specific to SARS-CoV-2. We cannot uh, take lessons from other vaccines in that regard. But in any case, if children at some point are included in the absence of trials that are specifically uh, targeted to children, we would need to uh, have safety um, studies that are long enough in duration to include uh, the potential appearance of MIC, and they should be uh, large enough to, to take uh, in, uh, those into consideration. Thank you. Dr. Pergen. Um, so, um, one thing um, we'll definitely be curious when these EUA um, get presented to us as possibilities is certainly for a lot of these trials, the phase one and phase two data will have longer term um, follow up, I would hope. Although I haven't heard that from the company specifically to determine whether those that were in phase two and uh, phase one trials were followed um, for prolonged periods to see about um, waning immunity. Uh, because that could be really interesting information, even in a small population, that might help us to think about um, these EUAs. Even though it's a smaller group um, and different, um, you know, the differences in how the vaccine was given, I'd just be curious to see if that data is going to exist within most patient populations. And um, I'm still, um, I'm still unsure um, about um, the EUA um, that some of the, the correlates that they're going to be looking at um, in these patients. Uh, is there a possibility if an EUA is developed that there can be a requirement for um, monitoring in these patients similar to what they're doing? I think it was the phone-based app is the V-Safe app, that if they did do um, an EUA and we had some of these individuals um, vaccinated, one thing I think we are potentially losing is the ability to follow them closely for potential side effects. Well, I can't answer for phase three commitments. What I can tell you is that I know that CDC and other agencies are thinking, uh, designing studies to look at long-term effectiveness, which will give you answers about duration of immunity. Uh, I think the, there's also the issue of uh, uh, enhanced disease at uh, uh, if there is uh, breakthrough infection, and that could uh, be an infrequent uh, complication, which uh, you will need the larger numbers you get in observational studies to pick up. So the observational studies are going to be very important for safety as well. Uh, Dr. Meisner.
thank you, Dr. Mont. So I would just like to state the fact that I agree with uh, Dr. Montalangelo, uh, and I apologize if I didn't pronounce that properly. But in terms of studies in children, I think um, I think it's going to be so important to evaluate any vaccine um, in 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 children and adolescents before they're included in um, any sort of a recommendation. I think um, the the rates of disease are. Uh, nowhere near as high as they are in the high-risk groups, such as uh, individuals over 60 or 65 years of age. They're only a fraction. And we know that Miss C occurs at a rate, as I think I mentioned earlier, of two. So I would, if, if I were part of the uh, FDA, I would uh, certainly want to be very convinced about the safety of a vaccine um, before I um, recommended uh, or approved its use in children. Over. Thanks. And that's a message we've heard before. Dr. Gruber. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify the, for the committee that in regarding studies in children, that um, there is actually a law, the Pediatric Research Equity Act, that requires um, um, manufacturers of vaccines and, and other products to conduct studies in children. Of course, we can license a product if we have a if the safety and and um, efficacy is established in adults, and we would not have to hold up licensure. But the vaccine manufacturers really have a you know. Um, and, and that's mandatory. They need to submit an in pediatric study plan, and there they need to outline the studies that they plan to conduct in children. And so uh, we will be getting um, a data on on safety um, in 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 the sub subject population. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Gruber. I, I, as a pediatrician, completely concur on the importance of uh, including children um, in the clinical trials, but I think they need to be evaluated as a distinct group with phase, phased evaluations, just as is being uh, done in, in adults, because the pattern of disease is quite different in children, and I, I, lumping them in, in uh, with adults in this with this particular illness, I, I would cause me some discomfort. Over. Dr. Carilla. Thank you. Uh, yeah, a few comments regarding safety. I think we need to recognize that there's a lot of new platforms here that are being utilized. And so rather than our traditional let's do vaccine by vaccine, I think there needs to be a concerted effort to see whether or not there's some long-term effects or impacts overall on the health of people with regard to specific platforms or and or novel adjuvants that may be included. We need to try to we, we, we need to have a systematic way of not just looking at it at a vaccine by vaccine basis, but but that that's one aspect. Uh, you know, with regard to uh, children in particular, but I think in general. Um, you know, it's been mentioned before, we don't have a correlative protection. And I think it's also a rather interesting and rather paradoxical finding that individuals with low, with mild or even asymptomatic infections tend to have low serologic titers in response to the infection. The, 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 the degree of antibody titers seems to, seems to be positively correlated with the severity of infection, which suggests either that the asymptomatics are having a very rapid antibody response that goes away quickly, or they actually have an antibody independent response that is mediating the host defense. That may be going on in children more so than in, a, in adults. And I wonder if that we're, it's not that, it's not that introducing neutralizing IgG cannot work as a 
vaccination strategy, but I wonder the potential that we may be circumventing a more natural response to the infection may have some downstream impact. So I think we need to be a little cautious about that until we really start to understand the correlates of protection from natural infection so we can relate how that impacts what the vaccines are doing. Thank you. And the reason I said uh, I didn't want to talk about immune markers of protection is that I think that is a very complicated issue. And it's not only going to be, uh, we're, only, we're not going to learn only from uh, breakthrough infections and things like that in uh, the vaccinated, but also from natural infection. Uh, as we, since we're getting pretty late, uh, and we have point B. I want the uh, those who have their hands raised uh, to try to bring in also the issue of specific populations. I'm not sure that we haven't gone over this already, so it may not be necessary to uh, handle it separately. Uh, but I do think that we want to cover that as well. And uh, we do have, uh, we're coming up to, uh, uh, we're, we're getting close to our stop, our, our, we're beyond our, uh, our closing time already, and I really would like to stop before 7 o'clock. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Nelson. At 6 o'clock is time. I do think it's... I do think it's critically important uh, that we do extend the study of those populations that are currently encouraged to be in the current clinical trials, in particular the people of color and those disproportionately affected by infection itself. It's also to take heed from some of the advice we heard from public testimony and from our own experience of noting that there are gender differences in immune response as well as safety and efficacy from vaccines. Those two particular ones, but I think it's also important for us to remember who's not being involved in the current clinical trials. And all you have to do is to look at the exclusion criteria of several of these trials. Those with allergic diseases that might be or likely exacerbated by vaccination, the immunosuppressed we did hear about earlier, history of primary malignancy or ongoing malignancy, bleeding disorders. Uh, uni or really multi-organ disease that is severe. Uh, there are a lot of individuals out there who will be waiting for the licensure piece to have access to this vaccine and specific study of immune responses of those critical populations I think is needed as well as safety. And if you look at some of those disease states, it's also disproportionately affected by people of color and uh, opportunities for us to generate real data and improve the trust in the vaccination in the process if we specifically study efficacy in those individuals. Uh, one thing I haven't heard today is that we do need to generate specific data on vaccine co-administration. So it is critically important that we understand the interplay of this vaccination in the context of our routine schedule and frankly right now in the midst of catch-up for all those who have deferred their routine vaccinations as a part of uh, pandemic mitigations the last several months. Another point I'd like to bring up moving back to A is I agree with Dr. Carrillo, uh, there are new platforms, there are new opportunities for rare adverse events. As an allergist, I was particularly intrigued to understand that two of the vaccines are relying on T2 hypersensitivity immune responses. It may take several months for some of these exacerbations to come to fruition and show themselves through passive reporting systems. And, uh, as a fourth point, I think we need to be very explicit in that there needs to be some intentional study of duration of immunity as part of these post marketing surveillance studies. Thank you, Dr. Monto. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. I think we, uh, what I would like to do first is to, to attempt to summarize what we've heard about the uh, uh, post-marketing, uh, post-licensure uh, studies that these are absolutely necessary for duration of immunity, uh, for safety, particularly because we are new using new platforms, 
that we should look at this not only by product but also by platform because there may be commonalities to uh, any uh, untoward effects that are seen based on the platform uh, as well as uh, the product. Uh, we absolutely need to have uh, population specific data in terms of uh, minority groups, women, men, and the rest, and the beauty of observational studies as vaccines are rolled out is that your numbers increase and you don't have, if the vaccine uptake is there, you don't have the numbers problems that you do and the volunteerism problems that you do that you have in the clinical trials. So we are all in favor of these kinds of studies. Correlates of protection are going to be critical. Also correlates of natural disease. This is something which is novel to our populations, at least uh, SARS-CoV-2 is. Seasonal coronaviruses have been around for a while. We know a lot about them, but they, we do not see the kind of pathogenesis uh, that you do with uh, this, this infection. So everything is uh, on the table in terms of studies. Uh, so uh, I want to now, since we're uh, 10 minutes late, uh, as the evening progresses, I want to uh, try to uh, close the meeting. I want to first thank the participants and particularly the FDA staff who worked very hard. Virtual meetings are much harder to put together than, uh, than, than uh, uh, together meetings when we're all together and in, in uh, at FDA, and I see Dr. Gruber. Uh, before before I sign off, I want to thank particularly Mark Krasinski, who I who's done a yeoman job yeoman's job in trying to keep me on because I am the worst actor in terms of an unstable system, which you may not have noticed because he's been so. Va uh, valiance in getting me back on. Dr. Gruber. Yes, uh, thank you for giving me two minutes. Um, I just wanted, before you adjourn the meeting, and I know it is very late hours, but you know, I want to also thank the committee for their very thorough discussion here. We know this is a very difficult and complex issue, but if I can summarize real quick for what I've heard Arnold, and you shake your head or you nod, okay? But in terms of the guidance <laughs> document and the approaches for safety and effectiveness data as we outline them, I heard it, that the general principles and the principles and the standards that we are applying are right on the money and that there is really buy-in for that. I hear there were some um, concerns and suggestions made for some of the, the, the details, the, the importance of making sure that minorities are included in clinical studies. We had some discussions on endpoints. We can take this forward as we have, you know, new vaccines entering clinical studies. It may be a little bit difficult for those who are already in phase three. We hear you on the bridging issue with the peace population. What I want to know from you, the two months the median two months follow-up that we said under EOA, I've heard people expressing some concerns with that being maybe not short enough, but you know, if it then cannot be longer, by no means should it be shorter than two months of median follow-up. That's what I heard. And in terms of the blind, I think that was keeping the, the blinded um, and the placebo comparator arm, even though you have an EOA, you said, even though we all would like for this to continue, but we have to realize that at some point we can't really maintain the blind. But do I hear you saying, and do I hear the committee saying that the blind should be maintained for as long as feasible 
and there should not necessarily be an automatic crossover of the placebo recipients to active to, to, to getting the vaccine. I think that is very clearly what you heard. I don't think there's been any doubt about that one. I think there may be some questions about the two months and also some of the uh, outcomes that are being used. And uh, as somebody who's worked with flu vaccines for a long time, what you're using as the outcome is standard for most respiratory vaccines. And we learn about some of the other outcomes, either as secondary outcomes in the randomized trials or in observational studies. So I fully agree with your summary. Thank you so much, Donald, and thank you again for the committee. Thank you. OK, so we are adjourned. Thank you all. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And with that, this, meth this event has concluded. This meeting has concluded. Any additional questions can be sent to the FDA OMA at fda.hhs.gov uh, mailbox. Thank you much.